This is Audible. Dream Spinner Press presents Tigers and Devils by Sean Kennedy, read for you by Paul Morey. First Quarter Chapter 1 Mid-February, the city of Melbourne takes on a different smell. Now it is once again the home of AFL football, and it has the smell of hot chips and dagwood dogs, carefully maintained grass, of brand new leather footballs and footy boots. The city becomes noisier on weekends as the sounds of cheering crowds drift down from the Melbourne cricket ground, and if the wind is just right, they can be heard in the suburbs as far away as Northcote and Mooney Ponds. Melbourne is the hometown of Australian football, its birthplace. The two cannot be separated, even if the game has now spread to other states. The MCG is its mecca, and the faithful congregate there to watch modern gladiators fight in savage but beautiful ballet. My gladiators are Richmond. I have held a member's ticket for the Tigers ever since I was 11 years old. I still have my very first one when they were on paper rather than plastic. My name, Simon Murray, is scrawled across it in almost illegible childish script. My father had come to the realization pretty early on that I was never going to be an Essendon supporter like him and Mum. And in fact, I copped the blame when my younger brother Tim also turned against Essendon and took up the flag for Collingwood instead. It's every man's dream. Dad would tell me every now and again when the beers consumed throughout the game would start to take hold of him, to have their son support his team. You boys have crushed it. At least I didn't go for Collingwood, I would reply, as I always did. At least there's that, my father would sigh, and he would glare at both of us Murray boys before turning his attention back to the telly. Mum was far more forgiving. In her mind, the less people supporting Essendon, was the less she had to share them. There was nothing more shameful than being a Collingwood supporter in Patrick Murray's book. The bitter rivalry between Collingwood and Essingdon would flare up between father and youngest son whenever the two teams played against each other. Me? I'm much more lackadaisical. Team victories always ebb and flow, and if you're a Richmond supporter, it ebbs more often than not so you learn to become very zen about it all. I would shrug off my family's taunts during the footy season with ease, while laughing to myself as I watched them become more and more twisted about their own team's defeat whenever they occurred. It became easier for us all when the Brisbane Football Club formed and the whole family united in hatred. The Brisbane Lions had the distinction of causing the demise of the Fitzroy Lions, in order for them to get their own team in the AFL. The Victorian club combined with the Brisbane Bears, and our state hadn't taken it well at all. My best friend since childhood, Roger Dayton, had been a loyal member of Fitzroy. The day the news became official, he burnt his membership card. I remember the solemnity of us, at 13, holding a funeral service for the team in Roger's backyard. However, Roger hadn't been able to bring himself to burn his scarf, and to this day it hangs above his bed, much to the chagrin of his wife, Fran. It took Roger a while to settle upon another team to support. The codes instilled in every Victorian child since birth make swapping a team come with more emotional baggage than a Catholic guilt spree. I lobbied for Richmond to be adopted, of course, and was very pissed off when Roger was unable to control his laughter. In the end, he settled on Hawthorne. We still went to games together, sitting side by side in friendly rivalry, yellow and black by yellow and brown. We would give each other sly digs every now and again, but it never turned nasty between us. It would be what would help sustain our friendship when I got to share my greatest secret with him at the age of 19. It was our second year at uni. Roger was dating Fran 
never realizing at the time that she would one day be his wife. Roger never thought that far ahead. It was also a momentous year for me. It was the year that I had my first serious boyfriend. His name was Ian Bevinson, so of course everybody called him Bevo. I found him ridiculously hot, but failed to believe that anybody who went by the name of Bevo could be queer. At least, I believed that until one night at a uni party, I found myself shoved up against a wall with Bevo's tongue in my throat and his hand down my pants. There had been no questioning of sexuality, and once it began, I made no effort to pull away but responded just as eagerly. Alcohol helped the little courage I had. My first sexual experience with another guy was frenetic, bewildering, and over way too soon. Weak from the expelled energy, my knees could no longer support me and I slid down the wall, trying to pull my pants back up at the same time. Laughing, Bevo joined me on the floor and finally told me his name. I was sure this was it. I knew so little about the social etiquette of this world I was now entering. Strangely enough, once the euphoria ended, my first thought was of my parents and what they would think if they knew their son had just had his brain sucked out through his dick in a stranger's hallway. That thought faded as Bevo started kissing me again, and his strong lips, which when parted, gave way to a tongue that tasted of beer and, well, me. So it was only polite when I returned the favor. We quickly slipped into seeing each other on a regular basis and I was heartened by the fact that it wasn't just about sex, although it was great whenever we had it. It was just that I was extremely lucky, falling into a first-time relationship with someone who wanted the same thing I did. It was what helped me become the person I am today, that I wouldn't put up with anybody else's crap. Sure, you have to sometimes, but I really try not to. I knew what I wanted, and Bevo knew what he wanted, and neither of us was going to endure any sleeping around or drama queening. This would lead to Roger often accusing me of being too picky and Fran countering that just because she settled for less, it didn't mean I should. If it hadn't been for Fran, it might have taken Roger longer to accept the truth about me. It took me ages to work up to telling him. I didn't really believe he would turn on me, we had been friends for too long but you always have that fear in the back of your mind. Alcohol also helps in the spilling of secrets. And when you say it, it always sounds kind of lame. In the movies and in books, there's always some flowery speech and swelling music. For me, it was the sounds of crowded house playing in the background, beer and nausea fighting for the right to make me vomit, and me slurring, Hey, Roger, just so's you know, I like guys. And his reaction? Crap, you're in love with me, aren't you? I think my laughter at that topped even his disdain at the thought of supporting Richmond. Of course, that offended him. But once he got over it, he became a little quiet. And things were funny between us for a couple of weeks as he readjusted his perception of me and determined whether our friendship was really any different now than it had been five minutes before I opened my stupid mouth. Fran, of course, made the comment about how she had a man to shop with, but I was useless in that regard, although my formerly secret love for musicals meant she could leave Roger at home and have a date regardless whenever one rolled into town. But first loves never stay forever. So Bevo and I were doomed, although I never thought so at the time. There was no big reason for our breakup, just an eventual drifting apart, which probably wasn't helped by both of us being reluctant to tell either of our parents. You're probably wondering why all this is important. I'm trying to give you a little background information about myself before we get into the meat of this story, to know why I did some of the things I did or why I reacted in certain ways. I'm not hinting that there's some big secret tragedy ahead, just to let you know. But let me fast forward over the next few years. I came out to my parents about a year after Bevo and I split up. My parents had varying reactions, none of them too bad. I was pretty lucky. 
They still skirt around the issue at times, but I've learned to live with it. My brother Tim was fine. He'd always thought I'd been a bit of a freak anyway, and I just confirmed it for him. He said that having a gay brother made him seem even cooler to some of the girls he was interested in. I didn't even want to know if he played that fact up to them so he could get laid in the interest of proving his own sexuality. Best excuse ever. Roger and I continued going to our shared games and still met up on weekends to watch the televised matches. But where there had been our usual manly punches and spontaneous hugs when one team scored on the other, there was now an aloofness on both sides. To tell you the truth, I think I exuded the standoffishness more out of the two of us, as if, in desperation, I was showing Roger that I wasn't attracted to him by keeping my hands off him. It's funny how coming out makes you repress yourself in other, newer ways. When I finally asked him about it, in a fit of drunken self-pity, I was surprised to find out he felt my new coldness and reacted accordingly each time. So it took a while for us to return to our old selves. I don't think I could even hazard a guess as to when it started getting better. It was all so gradual and in baby steps. But you know your best friend has entered the stage of uber-acceptance when he tries setting you up with other gay guys he's met no matter how wildly inappropriate for you they are. After completing my totally cliched Bachelor of Arts degree, with the intentions of writing the greatest Australian screenplay that would revolutionize the entire industry, I soon became realistic and ended up taking a job with one of the various Melbourne film festivals, while pledging to write on the side. As of now, I've completed 20 pages, but had more success publishing film reviews and theoretical essays. A man can dream, though. Through luck and fortuitous circumstances, I ended up becoming the manager of the Triple F Film Festival after a few years. It's not a huge one, catering mainly to independent films. And when I mean independent, I mean really independent. You have to have nerves of steel to sit through some of them but it's amazing the amount of work you have to do all year just to produce a two-week festival in October. Roger says I'm lucky it falls where it does, or else it would seriously impede my enjoyment of the final AFL matches, and therefore impede his own as well. So there we all were. Roger and Fran had officially settled down. We had the photos of the wedding and everything to prove it. They despaired of me being fruitlessly single, although it wasn't really through any fault of my own. Okay, scratch that. It was my own fault. I tried telling myself that I was busy with work, too busy to have a love life. Deep down, I was really a little scared. Roger told me that I was well on my way to becoming the eccentric bachelor uncle who all the kids would think was cool until they became teenagers and discovered I was actually a little bit pathetic. As you can tell, Roger really knows how to put things in perspective. But I was happy, or at least I told myself I was happy. And I probably was really good at fooling myself with that, despite the little stab of jealousy rearing its ugly head occasionally, as I would see that look pass between Roger and Fran. You know, that look. I wanted someone to look at me that way, and I wanted to look at them in the same way but I would brush it off and bury it deep, deep within me. The best way to deal with things is to repress them. That's my motto. I likely would have continued on in that fashion if it hadn't been for one night and one party that I didn't want to go to, but Roger and Fran forced me to anyway. And here is where Declan Tyler enters the story. Chapter 2 You're coming whether you like it or not, Roger commanded. I ignored him and pretended to be shuffling through my messenger bag, looking for some important documents which, in actuality, didn't exist. I know you can hear me, Roger said unhappily. Of course he can. Without looking up, I knew Fran had just returned to the room. 
We were currently in their lounge, having just had dinner. I had come straight from work, stopping home only to feed the cat and get scratched thoroughly for daring to leave her alone again. I rubbed absent-mindedly at one of the wounds on my arm again, causing it to break open and seep a tiny rivulet of blood. Gross, Roger noted the obvious. Fran squeezed in between us, a new bottle of wine in her hands. I hadn't even realized we had finished the first, and knew that this next glass would have to be my last if I still wanted to drive home. I didn't want to have to catch a taxi home tonight, and be back there the next morning to pick up my car. And if I crashed here overnight, I would really be in the cat's bad book. I don't want to go either, Fran told me, but what can you do? I'm not the one sleeping with Roger, I said. I'm not beholden to his demands. Neither am I, and I am sleeping with him, Fran countered, giggling to herself. Hey, Roger protested. I am here, you know. Like I said, things have long been back to normal with us now. Enough that the casual mention of the thought of the two of us sleeping together no longer made him react like Dracula pulling open the curtains an hour early. Pour the wine, hun. Fran threw herself back against the couch and propped her feet on the table. Both Roger and I reached for the bottle at the same time. She meant me, Simon, Roger said, although I knew he wasn't being serious. No, I didn't, Fran said, a smirk suggesting otherwise. I'm man enough to back down. I held up my hands in mock surrender. Roger sighed, and I knew he was thinking for the millionth time that it was no fun when we ganged up against him. He passed us our glasses, and we fell into a peace that only broke when Roger murmured, You're coming, and that's it. I don't even know these people. That's the point of the party, to get to know new people. I don't want to know new people. I get to meet enough new people at work every day. That was true enough, and they more than exhausted my quota. There might be some cute guys, Roger said desperately. I looked at Fran. Did he just say cute guys? Fran raised an eyebrow, a trick I wished I could master. I'm as surprised as you are. Apparently I married a fourteen-year-old girl. Shut up, Roger sulked. You know, you could help me convince him to come. Oh, he's coming. Fran turned to me, and I could see the glint in her eyes telling you in no uncertain terms you shouldn't cross her. He knows he is. And that was that. I could hold out against Roger, but Fran got the best of both of us every single time. So, Roger said finally, as Fran drank from her glass. Friday, get here by eight. No sense in being the first to arrive. Fran and I looked at each other, unable to hold in our laughter. What? Roger demanded. I pushed my empty glass over to him. One more for the road, Miss Manners. Whose party is this, anyway? I grumbled, wrapping my scarf tighter around my throat to protect it from the winter winds everybody claimed blew straight up from Antarctica. I could see the fence of Melbourne Cemetery as we walked along, and truth be told, I would rather be spending the night in there than going to a shindig where the only people I would know were currently in step beside me. I don't know them, Fran replied, snuggling in closer to Roger for warmth. Roger knows them. I thought you knew them, Roger said. I groaned. You two have got to be shitting me. Aren't we a little old to be crashing a party? We're not crashing, Fran said. It's somebody's engagement party. I know that much. I thought it was a thirtieth birthday party. Roger murmured. Great, just great, I said in an even lower tone of voice, which they couldn't help but hear anyway. Is there even a party? Don't be Mr. Grumpy, Fran warned. We're saving you from a night of sitting at home and watching your complete box set of The X-Files for the twentieth time. Or telling kids on Twitter they need to spell properly, Roger laughed. 
I would have given them both a finger if my hand wasn't jammed so far into my pocket, and it was too cold to pull it out. That all sounds much better than going to a party where we apparently don't even know what it's for. Roger and Fran ignored me, and the only sounds on the street were our shoes scraping on the bitumen of road, and the clanking of beer bottles in the plastic bag Roger carried. Gradually, we could hear music from a distance away, guiding us in like a buoy on the ocean. Okay, here's the plan, Roger said. Sync up our watches. If we're all bored shitless after an hour, we sneak out. That sounded like a good plan to me. I agreed happily. I set my watch a little fast because I couldn't wait to make a break for it. Look at Simon. That's the first time he smiled all night. Fran sighed as she adjusted the clock on her mobile. I can't help it if you're the only two people I like associating with on a regular basis. Or maybe that you're the only two who will associate with me. Oh, boo-hoo, Fran said dismissively. Try to act a little suave at this party, and people might even talk to you this time. Suave isn't really me. I'm the doofus who normally will end up spilling drinks on somebody or inadvertently insulting the host's partner. Then it's time for a quick getaway and a renewal of vows to never go out again. Until, of course, the next time when Fran and Roger forget about whatever heinous social crime I committed before and force me out again. We paused before the front door. From the sounds of it, the party was in full swing. Do we knock? Fran asked. They wouldn't hear us, I said. Doorbell? Roger suggested. I sighed and took the initiative. The door was unlocked and I pushed it open. Enter, I told my friends. They took my lead. In the hallway, we unwrapped our scarves and shucked out of our jackets and threw them upon the bed we could see from our vantage point. It was obviously acting as a coat rack for the night. Fran and Roger were big, fat liars. They instantly found people they knew, mutual friends who I had met only vaguely. From what I could remember, we had all come away from the night still uninterested in one another's existences. I circled nervously around the lounge room, the main congregating area. I groaned when I saw the first person I knew properly, Jasper Brunswick. He had worked for the Triple F a couple of years before, and he was a royal pain in the arse. I hadn't been manager at the time, but I was being groomed for the eventual takeover. Jasper was one of those know-it-alls who thought he could manage everything better, but didn't really want to do the work. I had burned my bridges with him when he drunkenly tried to seduce me one night and my mouth had fired off before my brain had the opportunity to think of a kinder answer than, no way in hell. A cold war began between us and was exacerbated when I had to do some admin work and discovered that his name wasn't Jasper Brunswick at all, but John Brown. Yeah, I'm sure you've got him all figured out now. He was sitting in the center of the lounge on a red couch that had seen better days. He drew everybody into a circle around him, regaling them with tales about himself and various celebrities he had schmoozed with. Jasper had made a name for himself recently for penning a gossip column for the local gay rag. His ego certainly had recovered nicely since I last saw him. I immediately slunk into the shadows lining the walls and made a beeline for the kitchen. I needed that beer now, and I had to find out where Roger had put them. As I did so, I looked at my watch. We had only been there for ninety seconds, and I was ready to do a runner. That had to be a record, even for me. Sure enough, Roger was in the kitchen. Anywhere there's food and beer, that's where you're likely to find him. Roger, I hissed. Beer. Now. He grinned at me infuriatingly. Did you see your best mate in the lounge? Why do you think I need a beer so badly? He took pity on me and handed me a bottle. I twisted the cap off savagely and downed half the beer in a few huge mouthfuls. 
Pace yourself, Roger warned. We're only going to be here an hour, right? I pleaded. But it looked as if I may have lost this battle. Roger wore an expression signifying he might be ready to settle in, and Fran could be seen lounging comfortably against the wall, her posture relaxed and her attitude sparkling as she chatted with a woman who had called me a communist at one of Fran's work dues. I began to calculate whether I had enough money in my wallet for a taxi should the need arise. But the beer had started to have an almost immediate effect on me. I'm a true Cadbury kid, needing only a glass and a half to get me going. In fact, even the Cadbury kid could drink me under the table. Maybe you should sleep with him, Roger said out of the blue, as if he had pondered this for the past four minutes. My spit-take would have put most comedians to shame. Are you high? He giggled like he had already downed a six-pack and it was affecting him. I don't know. Maybe you should just get laid. Does your wife know you talk like this? I polished off my beer and resolved to take the second more slowly. I gestured for Roger to hand me another. When single you are, Roger said, imitating Yoda dispensing advice to Luke. Get laid you can. When married you get, make love you do. Oh, one of the magical gifts afforded to people who can actually get married, I said, never one to dismiss the opportunity to climb up my soapbox. Well, if I had my way, you could, Roger said, draping a casual arm over my shoulder. But you'd also have to find someone first. I snorted as I opened my beer. It's not going to be Jasper Bloody Brunswick, that's for sure. Roger peered behind us to take in the decadent form of Mr. Brunswick draped over the couch with his small crowd of neophytes sitting before him, desperate for some tenuous connection to celebrity. Yeah, I wouldn't wish John Brown on anybody. Shut up, I hissed. He'll hear you. The last thing I needed was Jasper Brunswick hunting me down throughout this party because he heard his true name being spoken. Do you think if you say it three times in front of a mirror, he appears and slits your throat? Roger was obviously very amused with himself this evening. Are you talking about John Brown? It was Fran, suddenly appearing behind us and, as usual, up to speed on everything, even though she hadn't been part of our earlier conversation. Fran? I protested weakly. She took Roger's beer away from him and drank the remains. Yes, please, babe, I'd love a drink. As Roger dutifully trotted away to fetch her one, she leaned in teasingly to me and murmured, John Brown, John Brown, John Brown. Simon Murray. I knew it was Jasper Brunswick from Fran's expression. Three times and he appears. Watch your throat. She grinned wickedly and slunk off to find her husband. I took a deep breath to contain myself and turned to face him. Jasper Brunswick. His face was flushed, and his pupils were dilated from whatever drugs he had consumed, either before or at the party. He leered at me, and I grew uncomfortable under his gaze. Been a while, Simon. Really? It had seemed far too short to me. Mind you, I've done very well for myself since leaving Triple F. Triple F's full name was actually the Furtive Film Festival, but I found it a bit too twee and horrifically earnest, changing it as soon as I took over. Plus, it made the logo look less cluttered. Why, what are you doing? I asked innocently. Don't pretend to be thick, Jasper Brunswick said, his eyes narrowing as he tried to ready his best insult. Although it is one of your most endearing traits, I'm sure you've seen my column. Column. Thankfully, at that moment, Roger passed by and clandestinely pressed another beer into my hand. Three in about fifteen minutes. They would be peeling me off the floor soon enough. In the reach out. I don't read it. I find that hard to believe, Simon. Yeah, well, it's hard enough to keep up with the publications I have to read for work. Can I give you a piece of advice? 
Oh, this would be good. I remained silent. Jasper Brunswick leaned into me and rested his fingers upon my arm. I could feel them searing my flesh, leaving the permanent mark of the devil behind. You might want to remain in good terms with the local press, especially when you want to get coverage of your little festival. We already get plenty of coverage, I said firmly, opening my beer so his grip on my arm was shaken off. In fact, we got a four-page spread and reach out last year. My column could be very important to helping spread the word further, he insinuated, his breath hot and fetid upon my face. A few pictures of the distinguished guests and the director of the festival. You can't buy publicity like that. I winced. I'm sure you could think of a price. He faltered slightly and crossed his arms defensively. Still as cynical as ever, aren't you? I'm surprised you've gotten where you are. No people skills, that's your problem. I have people skills, I countered. Just not the kind of people skills you use to get where you are. He grew even redder. I have no idea if he slept his way to the top, which is what it certainly sounded like I was implying. But to tell you the truth, I was talking more about his snaky schmooziness and brown nosing. And to my relief, Jasper Brunswick turned on his heel and stalked back over to the lounge room, where he would no doubt find people who would fall at his feet to worship and restore his comfortable sense of superiority. Roger and Fran appeared from where they had hidden in the pantry. So he's gone? Roger asked, looking around like the man in question had the abilities of a chameleon, and actually blended in with the 70s-era tiling on the wall behind us. Yeah, he's gone. Thanks for the support, I said dryly. I got you another beer, didn't I? Roger asked, affronted, as if it were equivalent to unsheathing his sword and standing beside me in battle. Reading my mind, Fran said, That was Lancelot's main role on the battlefield for Arthur, wasn't it? No, I replied. It was screwing his wife while his back was turned. By the way, speaking of inappropriate trysts, do you know Roger tried to convince me to sleep with that dickhead? Lancelot? Fran asked. Funny. I took it back straight away, Roger mumbled. Fran rubbed his back affectionately. Idiot, please try to find better conquests for your mates. I'm not looking for a conquest, I pointed out shepherding them out to the backyard, where a small fire burned in an old oil drum. Last I heard, you weren't looking for anything, Fran shrugged. Is that a crime? It's certainly not normal. And what's normal, you guys? Shut up, Fran said, without heat. You love us. Roger always got cheesy when he was drunk. I mumbled incoherently into my feet an admission of returned love which they could understand without knowing exactly what I said. Fran hugged me and then pushed me off her. Now go away, I want to make out with my husband. I laughed, not taking any offense, and went to find a corner where I could hide. Luck scored me a garden swing in a dark corner that no couple had yet appropriated to mac upon. I settled in and slowly pushed myself my beer nestled snugly in my hands. There was a small group standing off to my right, talking loudly, so it wasn't like I was eavesdropping. I wish I knew who they were, because, really, I have to thank them for this whole story. Well, unless you want to give Fran and Roger credit for dragging me to this party in the first place. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Again. I might as well go all the way back to thanking my parents for having a late-night snuggle one cold winter's night almost twenty-eight years ago. The devils are going to have another shit year, I'm telling you. The voices were a garbled mess. Beside the gender of each voice, I couldn't really separate them into distinct entities. Nah, it's about time for them to start crawling up the ladder again. You said that last year. There's no way they'll finish in the top eight. Yep, no hope of finals at all. They're wasted. They should never have allowed them to merge. 
That had been the biggest controversy in the recent history of AFL. To truly make the game Australia-wide, although conveniently neglecting the Northern Territory, but as my father liked to argue, it was a territory, not a state. My reaction? It's a bloody big block of land at the top of Australia with people living in it. They deserve some sort of team. The AFL had created a Tasmanian team. But in order to keep the number of teams even, so there wouldn't be any hassle in arranging games, they had to sacrifice one of the Victorian teams so they could merge into one. Roger. It's like bloody Fitzroy all over again. We had to say goodbye to the Melbourne Demons, who moved down south and across Bass Strait to become the Tasmanian Devils. At the time, I remember being horrified at the possibility they might make Richmond merge so they could be the Tasmanian Tigers. After one of the most famous extinct, supposedly, animals in the world. But we were safe. So the Devils weren't exactly popular in Victoria, like the Brisbane Lions before them, because they had committed the cardinal sin of taking one of our teams away from us. Problems besieged the Devils from the very start, two of their key players being injured in their very first season. And although one had gone on to recover, Declan Tyler seemed plagued with injury ever since. It was a favorite source of discussion on both sides of the Bass Strait. We thought of it as an act of the gods, showing us that the merge should never have happened, while the Tasmanians bemoaned the fact that one of the best players in the league was doing nothing for them but to sit on the bench and occasionally run out to get injured. I knew Tyler would come up sooner or later, and it was sooner. They've taken Tyler away from us, and look what they did to him. I don't think it was their fault. What are you, a devil supporter? Howls of derision floated over to where I was sitting. No, I'm not. I just don't think they're going to take someone like Tyler and then intentionally injure them so they can't use him at all. They should do something with him. All he does is sit on that bench and gather dust. And lard. He does not. He's hot. He was, actually, but that's not important. Typical bloody woman. Just watching the game to pervert the guys in their shorts. There was another frenzied protest at such an accusation. I sighed to myself as well. Women and gay guys always got stuck with that image, that they couldn't possibly be interested in the game itself. It had to be the guys. I mean, sure, it's a fringe benefit. But when the game is on, the last thing you're thinking about is the bodies of the men. You're concentrating on that red leather oval ball, and if it will make it between the triad of poles, signifying either glory or failure. Not to mention, some of the women I've met over the years at games or supporter functions have been the most vocal and knowledgeable proponents of the game. Those very points were being raised between the arguers. I laughed to myself and swore I wasn't going to get involved. But then someone made a comment so wrong I had to butt in. It's not like he was even that great a player to begin with anyway. Not a great player? I made some of them jump when I emerged from the shadows. I could now make out three men and two women arguing over the oil drum. You are talking about Declan Tyler, right? Winner of the best and fairest for the Devils two years consecutively, a Brownlow medalist, and winner of the Norm Smith medal and the Lee Matthews trophy? Yeah, he really sucks as a football player. How many Devils fans are there at this party? One of the men asked. I'm not a devil supporter, I said, the disgust plain on my face. I go for Richmond. All five of them burst out laughing. Hey, I protested. We're about due for a final. You've been due for about fifty years, mate, the woman closest to me said. I could feel someone approaching us from behind me and just assumed it was someone else interested in the conversation or a friend of one of the group. Look, I know Tyler comes across like a bit of an arrogant prick, but you can't say he's not a great player. When he's not injured, of course. For some reason, everybody's eyes went wide at this point. Puzzled, 
I raised my hands for any kind of response. There was the sound of somebody clearing their throat behind me. Well, thanks for defending my honor. No way. No way was this possibly happening. I turned, hoping it was just Roger being a dickhead, although I could already tell from the expressions of the rest of the group that it wasn't. Although I had never heard the voice in person, I had heard it often enough on television, usually in the news bites or post-game interviews. Behind me was the man himself, Declan Tyler. And you know how supposedly people are shocked when they see a celebrity in real life? and they think they're tiny. Declan Tyler was even taller than I had imagined, and he had at least a head on me, and I don't think I'm short either. At that moment, I wished I had accompanied Roger to his martial arts classes when he went through his obsession with Wuxia movies. I wasn't any good at any violence, or even defending myself against violence, should the occasion arise. Declan Tyler? I heard one of the other men breathe in wonder. Well, great conversation, I said hurriedly. Very nice to meet you all. I managed to escape while the footballer in question was surrounded by the group, of which every member was now starstruck, of course. Most of all, the man who previously had been bagging him. I searched through the garden and the house for Roger and Fran, who were nowhere to be found. Jasper Brunswick was still in his own self-created shrine, and I couldn't help but think that at least Declan Tyler deserved the adoration he was currently receiving, because he actually did something, even if it was just kicking a ball around. Just kicking a ball around? What was I thinking? I must have been more agitated than I thought. I was hopeless at confrontations. I burst through the front door. The yard was empty. They surely wouldn't have left without me. I checked my mobile to make sure they hadn't tried calling or left a text. They hadn't. I beat the phone in frustration against my forehead, as if I could absorb the information I needed through osmosis. Hey. I turned around. It was Declan Tyler coming to punch my lights out. Crap. I know Krav Maga, I said stupidly. Good for you? he said, a confused expression on his face. It wasn't one I was used to seeing on him. On the field, he was always in control and stoic. In fact, it seemed to be his default expression. It was like he knew how good he was and he wasn't going to deny it, which is where I guess my presumption of him being an arrogant prick had come from. Not only was he a head taller than me, I now saw the span of his shoulders was practically a third wider than mine. He could easily fell me with one king hit. Looking confused gave him more character. It made his boy-next-door looks become even more appealing. He had to lose that gross bit of fluff above his chin, though. What do you want? I asked, still ready to run, although it would have been akin to a meerkat trying to escape a lion. He jammed his hands in his pockets. Was he trying to show me that he came in peace? I wasn't sure whether to thank you for defending my record or yell at you for calling me... what was it again? Arrogant prick, I said helpfully, before I could even think to stop myself. He grinned. I had walked into his trap. Most people think I'm either one or the other. It's rare to find someone who thinks both. Really? I asked. You sound surprised. Well, most footballers are... I trailed off. He kept his grin carefully plastered on his face. Uh Uh-huh. Really nice guys? I finished. Stereotypes are a killer, he said. I mean, if I was to go on what you look like, I would say you're a typical arty wanker what with your cargo pants, your Doc Martens, and your all-black wardrobe. Ah, but I am an arty wanker, I replied. Rule one to survival. Always be self-depreciating, and get in with insults about yourself before the other party can. Where's your beret? That's just for Sundays. At that moment, 
Bran and Roger stumbled through the front gate. Where have you guys been? I demanded, glad that the cavalry had arrived. In the cemetery, Roger replied. I don't even want to know. Not what you are thinking, Bran giggled. Get your mind out of the gutter. It was hard to tell who was propping the other up. I think they were really just sagging against each other, and gravity was being their friend. Some cavalry. Roger's eyes widened when he realized I wasn't alone. Are you chatting up a guy? I flushed. Roger had just committed a major faux pas. You never outed somebody on their behalf. I mean, it's not like I hit it, but you should always be the one to say it yourself. It's just common sense, as it also gives you the opportunity to protect yourself if the situation warrants it. No, I muttered. Roger now looked like an anime character. Hey, you're... Declan shifted uncomfortably and seemed to grow even taller. Declan Tyler, he mumbled. Oh my god, I don't believe it. Who's Declan Tyler? Fran asked. Declan looked at her gratefully. Roger began a spiel, listing all of Tyler's statistics, medals, and other achievements. Fran's eyes got that glazed-over look they usually did where football was concerned. And meanwhile, for some unknown reason, Declan stood there and listened to it, although he seemed somewhat mortified. Okay, I interrupted Roger halfway through. I gotta go. Nice meeting you, I said hurriedly, to the very tall and very imposing footballer. I turned to Roger and Fran. I'll call you tomorrow. I was out the gate and a couple of houses down the street when I heard Fran yell, Hey, what about your jacket? Fuck. There was no way I was going back. I would rather freeze to death. They would have to give it to me at a later stage. I shivered in the cold night air, my visible breath leading me down Ligon Street, where I knew I would stand more of a chance of catching a taxi. Hey! I kept walking. I like to pretend that if you don't acknowledge a general yell in your direction, the yeller will just go away. Who's to say they were yelling for me, anyway? Simon! Even though I had only heard a few sentences from him tonight, I knew it was Declan Tyler again. I steeled myself to the inevitable fist in the face and wished I hadn't left the relative security of my friends. And, I mean, relative security, because I don't think they were capable of doing much on my behalf at the moment except serving as an interested, if not terribly accurate, witnesses. I turned and saw Declan jogging toward me with my jacket and scarf over his arm. You need these, you idiot. It's fucking freezing. To say I was surprised was an understatement. Uh, thanks, I said, although it didn't come out very graciously, perhaps more bewildered than anything else. How did you know? Your friend Fran pointed them out to me when I said I would run them down to you. They looked a bit too drunk to be able to catch up. Yeah, they were a bit. I took my jacket from him. I zipped myself into it and then took my scarf and wrapped it around my neck. So... So... This was awkward and strange. Very strange. So, Declan said again, you're gay. Oh, here we go. Yes, there are gay footballer supporters, you know. I bet there are even gay players. He began to laugh. I shook my head, trying not to let my temper rise. Yeah, well, I'm sure that's funny to you, anyway. I turned again, eager to go. But I felt an arm clamp onto my elbow, and I was turned back to face him. Declan was definitely in my personal space now, and he had that look on his face. The look of someone who was about to lean in and kiss. I yelped slightly as his mouth closed over mine. I don't mind admitting that I was in total shock. 
the night had definitely taken on a surreal trend. Declan's body pressed against mine, and we shifted backward until I felt the rough bark of a tree against my back. His mouth was firm, and his tongue pressed between my lips until they parted. I was surprised that he tasted like beer, but at the good point, before it becomes stale and a little rank. I know, I'm not exactly selling the romanticism here, but I was pleasantly thrilled by it at the time. This was not the kiss of a man who was trying it on. There was no hesitation. His hand curled around the back of my neck to deepen the kiss. His other hand slipped down my back to hold me in. I'm not sure how long we stood there for, kissing all the while. But my mind certainly raced through a thousand thoughts. I considered texting my father and brother, but I knew they probably wouldn't be impressed with me bragging that I was making out with one of the biggest players in the league. In fact, they would probably be horrified that said player was my way inclined, and it would probably somewhat diminish Declan's abilities in their eyes. We finally pulled away from each other, panting slightly. Stop looking so shocked, he said, grinning at what was obviously a saucer-eyed expression on my face. See, I know there are gay footy players. I still couldn't formulate words. But this time, I went on the attack, and he submitted willingly. We were sheltered by the low-hanging branches, which is probably why he had been brazen enough to take on such a public display of affection in the first place. There was still a rational part of my mind that knew this was stupid for him, as he certainly wasn't out to the public at large. I knew nothing about this guy other than what was published in the AFL record. I was starting to think I was being stupid as well, but with him squashing me against a tree and claiming my mouth as part of his own, I was too weak-willed to put up any protest. Car lights flashed in our direction, and Declan jumped away from me. I was disappointed and slightly offended, yet understanding. Quite frankly, schizophrenic. I could see the look on his face clearly illuminated by the approaching headlights. He was shocked by his own brazenness, by his recklessness at outing himself. After all, he had a lot more to lose than I did. He had no idea of who I was or what kind of person I could be. In his mind, I was already planning to sell the story to the Herald Sun. I opened my mouth to speak, possibly to reassure him when we realized that the car was actually slowing down. It was a taxi, and Roger was hanging out the back window. There you are. He noticed that Declan was with me, and that there was a palpable tension in the air. Is everything okay? Fine, I said. I take it we're going? But Roger was fixated. Is he hassling you? He asked, indicating Declan. No. I scoffed. Hey, mate, Roger addressed Declan, fumbling with the door of the taxi to get out and confront him. I could hear Fran protesting and see her arm try to yank him back in. I threw Declan an apologetic look and recognized that I better defuse the situation. Sadly, the best way to do that was just to go and get the hell out of there, taking Roger with me. Nothing like a friend ready to drunkenly defend your honor, thinking you were about to be beaten up, when you were really having one of the best and strangest passions in your life. Definitely a story to gross out the grandkids. Stay, Roger, I growled. Neither Declan nor I said a word to each other. He watched me get into the taxi. As I belted myself into the front seat, Fran made some sort of apologetic sound but I was still staring at the man outside my window. Then the taxi moved forward, and I couldn't see him any more. Chapter 3 On the way home, Roger was still making threats about showing Declan Tyler that he couldn't pick on any of his friends. Fran was berating him, telling him he was acting like a six-year-old. 
I was in a state of weirded-out bliss and confused as all fuck. Declan was obviously in Melbourne for the weekend because the Devils had just played the Saints at the MCG. He must have known somebody at the party for him to have been there at all. But why, out of all the possible, available snogs at the party, had he chosen me? Come to think of it, why had he been so stupid? He couldn't go around kissing strange men all the time, or else his cover would have been blown by now. And I sure hadn't seen him on the cover of Reach Out or The Southern Star recently. I kept thinking of him the next day. There were two lines devoted to him in the back pages of the Sunday Age about how he was benched in the Saints game yet again and nothing at all in the Herald Sun. That night, that night on the news, there was the vision of the devils getting on the plane back to Tasmania. And although I practically knocked over the television in order to see if I could make him out, all I could see was an indiscriminate mass of male blobs at a luggage carousel. Roger tried calling my mobile and home phones, and I let the answering machines take his profuse apologies, which quickly turned into intense curiosity to discover what I had been talking to Declan Tyler about. I wasn't trying to punish Roger. I just didn't know what to say. I had never kept anything from him before, barring the obvious, of course. But seeing as I was so bloodied baffled about it myself, I wasn't sure if I could make any sense to him about it. Which was stupid. It wasn't like I was going to run into Declan again. Last night had been pure chance. It was just a drunken pash at a party, and would soon become for me a source of either nostalgia or shame if I ever told anyone. I went into work the next morning with the after-effects of the party finally starting to wear off. My second-in-command, Nysa, came to meet me at the door as I entered. Your phone hasn't stopped ringing, she informed me, handing me a pile of messages scrawled on any piece of paper she had at hand, including a receipt informing me she had eaten spicy Moroccan soup at the Fitz on the weekend. Two messages from Roger, one from Fran, one from my mother, two from film dealers, and another from a tortured artiste who needed to have her hand held through some crisis. I sighed. Don't they know we punch on at nine? We never punch off, Nysa grumbled. Why aren't they calling your mobile? Because I had forgotten to switch it back on. I winced and made it my first task when I finally made it into the sanctuary of my office. No sooner had I hung up my jacket than my office phone began ringing again. Hello, I answered, wishing I had time to grab a coffee. I desperately needed one. Why the hell didn't you call me back yesterday? It was Roger. The man was nothing but persistent. Sorry, Roger, I meant to call you back. I was calling to apologize to you, but now I'm thinking you should be apologizing to me. I said I was sorry, dickhead. It was so easy to resort back to sounding like a fourteen-year-old, one of the pros of a long-term friendship. Well, I'm sorry too, arsehole. I sat down in my chair, grateful for his laughter in response. You don't have anything to apologize for. I was drunk. What's new? Shut up. Look, did I just imagine it? Or did Declan Tyler try to beat you up? I shook my head and was glad he couldn't see my huge, shit-eating grin. No, he didn't beat me up. So he was there. Fran was trying to convince me I was hallucinating. He was there. And I escaped without a scratch although there was a very small patch of beard rash on the left side of my chin where he must have pressed too hard while... I stopped thinking about that, no matter how pleasurable it was. I'm so embarrassed. If it's any consolation, he probably gets drunken idiots accosting him all the time in public. Thanks, Simon. Thanks a lot. You sure know how to be comforting. You're welcome. So we're okay, then? I laughed. Yes, I will extend our friendship contract for another year. Good. Speak to you later. I hung up, determined to get my coffee. But the phone rang again, and I knew who it would be. Hello, Fran. 
Hi, hon, she said warmly. Have you spoken to Roger yet? I just got off the phone with him. Everything good? Of course. Stupid boys, she murmured affectionately. Meet you for lunch? Sure. Our offices were only a block apart, and we had lunches together a few times a week. One at the usual. Yep, till then. Coffee. Now. I closed my eyes and followed the fumes of a freshly brewed pot to the small closet that served as our kitchen. I filled my cup and said a silent blessing for Nysa's superior coffee-making skills. Nysa appeared in my peripheral vision. Agnes King called again. She wanted to move her appointment up to today. I sighed. The tortured artiste herself. Well, one of many. Fine, better get it over and done with. Nysa laughed. I'm glad you have to deal with her and not me. If her daco wasn't so good, neither of us would. It's good, and it will be popular. Nysa leaned in to whisper the next, even though we were the only people in our office. We need the sales. Just maybe make the coffee for the afternoon Irish, I continued. Irish and Zoloft it up, just for you. A phone started ringing down the hallway. We both looked at each other, and Nysa grinned. That's your phone, boss. Can't we just pretend I'm running late? Nope, you are definitely on the clock now. Nysa took her coffee and disappeared back into her own office. Whoever was on the phone was pretty insistent. It was still ringing, even though I had given them plenty of time to reconsider and hang up. I took a desperate gulp of coffee, and my greeting was somewhat garbled when I finally picked up the receiver. Simon Murray! Hello? I swallowed properly and repeated myself. Uh, hi. The strange voice replied. Wrong number, or another soulful artiste? Can I help you, or do you want me to call in the office psychic? A slight pause. Oh, it is you then you have me at an advantage, as I have no idea who you are. The man on the other end of the line chuckled. I would have hoped that I made more of an impression on you. It couldn't be. Uh, Declan Tyler? I said hesitantly. Do you always have to say my surname? You can just use the first, especially when talking to me. I know my own last name. Oh. It could be. Hi, I said, in an attempt to sound suave. We've already said that bit, he pointed out. A thousand jumbled questions were causing the shorted fuse between my brain and my mouth as I struggled to say something, anything. All I could think was, how, why, what, and, huh? I don't think I said hello, I murmured. I think I only said my name. Then say it. Uh, hello. That's it. He was definitely amused by me. If I had been actively seeking to impress him as part of the first stage of seduction, I was failing miserably. Best just to be me, then, and get it over with. How did you find out where I worked? I googled you. Coming out of his mouth, it sounded dirty. Nicely dirty. Simon Murray is a common name. I stared out the window to the street below. I could see the Flinders Street station just to the left of me, its gold leafing glittering a bit too brightly in the winter sun. Well, when I added the search term Artie Wanker to it, you popped up. I could hear the smile in his tone. I couldn't help smiling to myself, and I bit savagely upon my lip, as if he could see it from across the Bass Strait. Seriously, though, your name was linked to the Triple F Film Festival. That's a rhetorical tautology, like an ATM machine. Whatever, he dismissed me. And then I found another article with your picture in it, taken with the premiere. He only stayed for ten minutes, I told him. It was a good photo op or something. Still. Any publicity is good, right? 
It all depends. Anyway, are you going to let me finish? You should know. I tend to wrap it on a lot. Why would I need to know that? Damn it. He was trying to play it cool. Well, I don't think it was listed under Google, but you're the one calling me. Finish your damn story. He laughed again. So then I found the festival website, and there was your office number and a mobile conveniently listed. And your mobile was switched off, so here I am on this number. Uh-huh, I said, noncommittally. That's it, he said, trying to hook me in. I guess. Come on, he moaned. Give me a break. I'd be looking for a different phrase if I were you, seeing you broke your arm last year and was out for half a season. He fell silent, and I got my first stab of fear of thinking that I had gone too far. Uh, yeah, you're probably right. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. Sorry, that was bad. Stupid mouth. I said that, right? No, I don't know. I think it's a cute one. I could feel the blood coursing into my cheeks. Thanks, I said inanely. Do I return the compliment now? Only if you want to. I don't know. You're a footballer. Do you really need your ego stroked any further? The press and fans haven't been very nice to me lately, so maybe I do. Maybe later. So why are you calling, then? He paused again. And to tell you the truth, when he spoke, he sounded a little nervous. Look, I'm coming to Melbourne again on Thursday for the game against Essendon. I'll have training on Friday, the game's on Saturday. But you want to go out for coffee on Thursday night? He had me gobsmacked and speechless again. Are you there? Yeah, I croaked. I thought the line had cut out for a minute. No, I'm, I'm here. So how about it? Coffee, I mean. And Simon Murray the very same Simon Murray who only two days before had been celebrating his single status and crowing about it, and swearing he wasn't looking for anybody, said before the moment could pass, I like coffee. So that's a yes. You're being cryptic. Come on. I promise I'll use cutlery if you leave your beret at home. I didn't think you needed cutlery for coffee, I teased starting to feel a little more in control of my senses again. A spoon isn't cutlery? What, do you stir your coffee with your finger? Well, when you promised to use cutlery... Well, when you promised you'd use cutlery, I was starting to think you did. Okay, so you're not interested. Interested? Of course I'm interested. Yes, I'm interested, I said, maybe a little too quickly. Good and he did sound pleased. I've got your mobile number. I'll call you. Hey, how do I call you? Send up the bat signal, he said, chuckling. Looking forward to seeing you again, Simon. Before I could answer, he hung up. Like a cliched scene in a romantic comedy, I sat in a daze for a little while, with the receiver still pressed against my ear and the disconnect tone providing a soundtrack for my state of mind. The sound of a text message coming through on my mobile a few moments later jolted me out of my zombie ways, and I placed the receiver back in the cradle. It was from an unknown number. I opened it, and it read, Here's the bat signal. I saved Declan's number and laughed to myself. I crossed over to the window and watched the people moving on the street below. I wanted to crack the window open and tell everybody what had just happened. But nobody would believe me. I wouldn't believe me if I wasn't me. I wondered if Roger would. Chapter 4 The rest of the day passed in a blur. My mind was definitely not focused on what I was being paid for. Nysa remarked on my distraction a few times, but I barely heard her. I ended up calling Fran and canceling lunch, because I knew she would ferret whatever she thought I was concealing out of me. Roger would then kill me if she knew before he did, 
because she would crow about it endlessly to him, and start another of his long-winded rants about how friends are supposed to hate their friend's spouse, not become their other best friend. And Fran knew something was up. I had that certain tone of dorkiness in my voice. She said I sounded too happy. I had to do laps of Federation Square at lunchtime to burn off the excess energy. Nysa said she watched me do the circumference of the building three times before she got dizzy and actually had to go back to work to recover. On the tram ride home, I smiled to myself like a loon and got the usual wide berth that the other passengers afforded to public transport crazies. I fed Maggie before her yowling threatened a visit by the RSPCA, showered, changed, and drove over to Roger and Fran's house. It's not Wednesday, Roger said when he opened the door and saw me. No shit, I said, and I pushed past him into the warmth beyond. Fran walked in from the kitchen and her eyes widened. Ha, I knew it. Didn't I tell you something was up with him, Raj? Yes, honey, Roger said patiently. Fran ushered me into the lounge and sat me down as if I were her child that needed to be lulled into a false sense of security to let slip what I had done wrong at school that day. I took a deep breath and began talking. Declan Tyler, Roger repeated, the shocked look of all shocked looks upon his face. I nodded. Declan Tyler? I exaggerated my nod. The Declan Tyler. I did tell you I was nodding, right? Fran remained impassive, but her eyes were going to and fro between us like she was watching a game at the Melbourne Open. Declan Tyler, the winner of the Brownlow and Norm Smith Medal. And the Lee Matthews Trophy, I reminded him. Roger stared at me, dumbfounded. And he's going out with you? Hey! Fran and I protested in unison. Roger seemed to collect himself for a moment, but then was back to the dumbfounded and semi-offensive. No offense, but I mean, you have seen the girls they can get. Fran frowned, probably envisioning the need to cut off his access to the next telecast of the Brownlow. He doesn't like girls, I said snottily. I know, but he could be going out with a gay supermodel. We get the point, I yelled, my snottiness turning into extreme prejudice with a license to kill. I think you're pretty, Fran said soothingly, leaning across and patting my hand. Thanks, I replied, because pretty is what I go for, you know. So they sat there, my two best friends in the world and I could have quite cheerfully wrapped them both up in a burlap sack at that point in time, weighted it down with some good heavy stones, and thrown them into the Yarra River to drown. Declan Tyler, Roger whispered to himself. Is it so hard to believe? I asked him. What, that he's gay, or that he would date you? Roger asked. You are such a prick, I muttered. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it, that's all. Well, send me a telegram when you do. I stood, but Fran pulled me back down. Simon, you know Roger's an idiot. Don't get pissed. I tried to stare down Roger, but he wouldn't look at me. He knew he was in the wrong, but he was still in shock and incapable of social niceties. Then a thought crossed his mind. You think he'll take you to the Brownlows? I wanted to burst out laughing. Ever since we were kids, it had been our dream to go to the Brownlow nights. We had gone a couple of times and stood in the audience for the blue carpet, trying to get autographs, but we longed for the chance to get inside the actual ceremony and hobnob with the elite of the football world. We're going for coffee, that's it. I mean, it's not like he's out. This made Roger look up. He isn't? Well, do you see him on the cover of DNA? Those dickheads on the footy show trying to cover up their arses whenever he comes near them on the panel? Like I subscribe to DNA, 
He scoffed. But what does that mean? I mean, for you. I tried to ignore his question, as I had been avoiding the nagging little voice inside my head asking the exact same thing. What do you mean, what does it mean? You know what I mean, Roger said. I don't know what either of you mean, Fran said, although of course she did. Well, if he's not out, that means a lot of sneaking around. What's in it for you? It's just coffee, Rog. I'm not thinking any further than that. Well, maybe you should. This was getting too soap opera for me, like home and away levels of bad. I thought you guys were the ones who wanted me to see someone, and now that I have a date, you're acting all pissy. Fran hesitated and then mustered up the courage to say, we just want you to be careful. You have a look, Roger said. A look? Now I was the one who was dumbfounded. Yeah, a look. Describe this look. I don't know, look in a mirror. Lately, you haven't cared about dating. Fran was trying to choose her words carefully. And now, all of a sudden, you look Excited, but trying hard to hide it. You really want to do it. And there's something wrong with that. It's just, he's a celebrity. Well, as much of a celebrity as a sports player can be. Spoken like someone who didn't know one end of the field from the other. It's not going to be easy. You got that right, Roger mumbled. I stared them down. It's just coffee. But I knew, and they knew, that I was lying. I was looking forward to it. Too much. I had no more idea than they did about what would happen. All I knew was that I wanted to go and see how it went. I couldn't really imagine any consequences. It was all too abstract. I didn't hear from either Roger or Declan for the next couple of days. My good mood had all but vanished when I met Fran for lunch on Wednesday. He cares about you, you doofus, she said over her chicken roll. It's just you two are guys, so you have stupid ways of showing it. It's my life, I said childishly. And as your friend, he will always butt into it, awkwardly to be sure, and then back off instantly, she replied. Do you think I shouldn't go out on this date? I asked, half scared of what her answer would be. Of course you should. She fished a bit of scraggly-looking shaved carrot out of her lunch and inspected it with disgust. Just go into it with your eyes open. I think no matter which answer she had given, I would have been half scared regardless. So what are you going to wear? I looked at her wondering if she thought I had suddenly grown a vagina in the past five minutes. Clothes? She sighed. Men. That night I could barely sleep, and I cursed myself for being so stupid. I was awake at 4.30 in the morning, and pictured myself trying to be cool and debonair over coffee with Declan, and then falling comatose into my latte and drowning before him. He was a footballer. He had quick reflexes. Hopefully, his resuscitation skills would be just as good. I giggled dreamily while I remembered what his lips tasted like, and thought that I had to stop such thoughts immediately, or else I would never get through the day. Even the unwashed denizens of the public transport system couldn't stop me from beaming like Pollyanna as I rode the light rail into the city. Nysa handed me my first coffee of the morning suspiciously. Well, hello, Cherry McCheer. Morning, Nysa. She watched me closely. Why are you so happy? No reason. There's a reason. You're never this happy. You're surly even when you're happy. I saw a light cross over her eyes as realization dawned upon her. I took a step back thinking she had cottoned on to me and my hypocritical ways. You've got another job. Okay, that stumped me. What? 
She was now going into full hysterical mode, practically wringing her hands. I knew it was too good to be true that you'd stay here forever. You've been headhunted by some larger festival, or maybe even a studio. I'm going to get a new boss who will be feral and probably make me sign up on a workplace contract, and there'll be no more bog off to the pub Fridays. Did you add a Red Bull to your coffee again? I couldn't help but be amused. No. I haven't been headhunted. You know me. I'm too lazy. I would rather be the big fish in the small pond rather than the tiny fish that drowns or is eaten by sharks in the vast deep. Nysa collected herself almost immediately, embarrassed at the display she had put on. You promise? I held up my hand and spread my fingers. Scout's honor. That's the Vulcan salute. I stared at my fingers. Oh, right. I always get those two confused. She leaned in and glared at me. Anyway, you're not going anywhere without me, right? I gave her a quick kiss on the forehead. I have it written in my contract. As I made my way to my office, she yelled after me. You doing that just makes me know something's up. I could barely see out my window because of the sheeting rain outside, but I wasn't going to let anything affect my mood. Besides, outside always looked better in layers, which was one of the many reasons why I hate it when summer comes around. As I was on my second cup of coffee, my mobile buzzed with an incoming message. My plane arrives midday. I have an afternoon training session, but I hope to be done by four. See you at six? I bit my lip and texted back. Where? Reply was almost instantaneous. I'll pick you up. That could prove difficult. How do you know where I live? I could almost see him shaking his head as he replied. White pages online, idiot. Oh, well then. See you at six. His final message made me smile and I looked up quickly to make sure Nysa wasn't spying on me. Looking forward to it. But I didn't text back. I had to get revenge somehow for the whole idiot thing. I only managed to make Nysa even more paranoid when I left the office at 4.30 and told her I was calling it a day so she could as well. You're going to an interview, aren't you? She called after me as I ran out the door. She was kind of right, but I left her hanging in anticipation. Even leaving early was cutting it fine. I would probably only have forty-five minutes before Declan arrived, if he was punctual. I rushed through my front door, made sure to feed the cat, and jumped quickly into the shower. I only managed to choose my boxer shorts and wriggle into them before I was stumped. Crap, Fran was right. I should have been thinking about what clothes to wear long before this. I stood before my mirror and eyed myself critically. Daniel Craig emerging from the ocean in Casino Royale, I wasn't. I was too pale. I had skinny arms, but a slightly flabby and hairy tummy. My legs were even paler than my chest. I sat down, although fell down might be more honest, on the end of my bed wondering if I was going to have a panic attack. Who the hell was I kidding? What made me think I could go out with somebody like Declan Tyler, a physical Adonis who was one of the favorites of the annual shirtless AFL stud farm calendars? Oh, crap. I was going to go to coffee with someone who was in a stud calendar. I clutched my head with both hands. If it ever got to the point that we would take off our clothes in front of one another, I didn't know if I could be naked in front of someone like him. I mean, with what he was used to seeing in the locker room, at least. My self-pity party was interrupted by my front doorbell being pushed impatiently. I shot to my feet, the panic attack in no way abated. I threw on a pair of trackies and my faded Tori Amos t-shirt that read with all irony, I don't mind a dirty girl. My uniform for at-home slouching and ran into the lounge room. This wasn't punctuality. This was early, with extreme prejudice. 
I threw open the door, only to find Roger and Fran standing on the stoop. What are you doing here? I asked, not meaning to be rude, but sounding so anyway. You are not going out dressed like that, Fran said, her face rigid with complete horror. Roger sized me up. He rang up and canceled, didn't he? No, and no, I said emphatically. Well, what are you wearing? Fran asked. Before I could answer, Roger said, Are you going to let us in? With as little grace as I could muster, I opened the door wider and they slipped through. After your lack of detail over lunch yesterday, I figured you would need help getting dressed. Fran said blithely as she headed straight from my bedroom. I can dress myself, I protested weakly. You're as hopeless as Roger. I can dress myself, Roger said snottily, sounding exactly like me only five seconds before. Oh, hon, you didn't used to be able to, Fran replied sorrowfully as she stood before my open wardrobe and peered hopefully within. Simon, for a gay man, your wardrobe sucks. I glowered. We're not all fashionistas or gym bunnies. You should be at least one of them, Roger shrugged. I stared at him. You know her statement about you and dressing? She's right about that. Is that your best comeback? Roger asked, obviously pitying my lameness on the subject. Well, maybe your man will start choosing your outfits for you. He's not my man, Roger. He's my coffee companion. Roger and Fran could not subdue their fits of laughter. In fact, Fran almost fell head first into the wardrobe. She steadied herself and began pawing through my belongings. Christ, Simon, do you have anything that wasn't bought from an op shop? It's my style, was my weak defense. Your style says you're cheap, Roger told me. And not in the good way, Fran added, sounding muffled from her head being buried as she moved further into the wardrobe. Will there be any action with this coffee companion? Roger asked, trying not to sound interested. I'm not a first date slut. Roger raised an eyebrow, a quirk I always wished I could master. Shut up. I hissed. Not all the time. Not all the time, because there's not many a time, Roger said maddeningly. You can talk, you and Fran, and if you ever tell our kids that, Fran said menacingly. I crossed my arms defensively over my chest. Yeah, I'll be sure not to tell your non-existent children for fear of death. Fran poked her head out of the wardrobe to stare at me. And tell me again, why does this guy want to date you? I've been asking myself that all week, I said grumpily. I don't need your help doubting myself. Someone wants their ego pumped. Fran moved back out of sight. I'm just being honest, I said, even though I knew it sounded like I was begging to get my ego pampered. I don't get it either. Roger rolled his eyes, but said nothing. Fran continued rattling coat hangers. I sighed to myself, now really sounding self-pitying. Fran crawled out of the wardrobe, which was pretty awkward, as the bottom was filled with crap I was forever chucking in there with an out-of-sight, out-of-mind mentality. She clutched in her hands some items of clothing that I didn't even know I had. None of us know why we like the people we do she said, laying out the clothes on my bed. I'm sure people look at Roger and wonder how he managed to snag me, but I love the doofus. So obviously this Declan guy sees something in you. This Declan guy? Roger mimicked, giving a derisive snort. Fran glared at him. So what if he can kick a bloody ball? He's not a god, Roger. I tried to avoid their latest spat by examining what Fran had picked out for me. A pair of slightly above-average black pants, sadly the best I owned, a black button-down shirt, and a casual jacket. Jesus, Fran, he's not going to a funeral. 
When have you ever seen him wear color? Fran berated him and then turned on me. Like it or not, we're going shopping one day. You need some colors. She had also picked out a leather wrist cuff that I didn't even know I'd owned. I held it up questioningly. It's just to give you that funky edge. Or maybe he'll think you're into S&M, Roger laughed. I must have had a look on my face because Fran ushered me into the bathroom. Don't listen to him. As the door shut behind me, I could hear them arguing again. I laughed softly to myself and changed as quickly as possible. When I walked out again, Fran had arranged three pairs of shoes in front of my bed. You look good, she said approvingly. Doesn't he look good, Roger? I can't believe I'm not dating him myself, Roger said obediently. His wife rolled her eyes and gestured at the shoes. You only own cons or docks. You need a pair of plain black shoes. I'll add them to the must-have list when we go shopping. Great. Looking forward to it. Well, you're not wearing the green cons. They're too ratty. The red ones look too new, I protested. He'll think I've bought them especially or something. Roger gave me the once-over. I don't think so. Simon, I love you. Fran said, but I have to agree with Roger on this one. Nobody would think that. I self-consciously picked at what was beginning to be a hole in the sleeve of my jacket. Docs it is, then, Fran said, having made her decision and pushing the boots toward me. As I struggled to pull them on, she looked at her watch. It's almost six. We should go. I opened my mouth to agree, but was cut off by Roger's protestations. I wanted to see him. Why, so you can give him the father's speech about looking after his little girl and having him back by midnight? Uh, I'm not a girl, thanks, I interjected. Fran's eyes narrowed. You just want to spy on the footballer, she accused her husband. Roger shifted uncomfortably on the bed. Well, I was drunk the last time I met him. And you threatened him. Maybe I want to apologize. Or get his autograph? Fran said suspiciously. No, I cried. No autographs. See? Fran asked Roger. No autographs. Roger grumbled to himself. If you were really my friend, get him out of here, I told Fran. Roger stood up and shuffled past me. Is this all the thanks we get? I leaned in to kiss Fran goodbye. Thanks for the help. Shopping this weekend, she instructed. Already desperate to get out of it, I made noises that were meant to pass for non-committal, but she wasn't having any of it. We have a game on Saturday, Roger reminded her. We can shop beforehand, Fran shrugged. They were still bickering with each other as I shut the front door. I ran back into the bathroom and sprayed some cologne on. Hopefully not too much. I'm never good at judging the right amount. I could smell it on myself and wondered if I should slap some water on to dilute the effect. The doorbell rang, and I assumed it was Fran and Roger, having come back because they had forgotten something. I took my time, lacing my boots, and the buzzer became more impatient. I'm coming, shithead, I yelled. Yes, I should have known better. For, of course, it was not Roger or Fran. I threw open the door to find Declan Tyler standing there, looking half insulted and half amused. Got a pet name for me already? he asked. I could only stare at him blankly. I thought you were someone else. He looked puzzled. You were expecting someone besides me. Wow, his eyes were really blue. You didn't notice how blue until you were close to him. Huh? He leaned in, and I caught a whiff of freshly washed skin and a faint layer of cologne that smelled far more expensive than my own. You going to let me in? I nodded, my foot still firmly planted in my mouth and feeling heavy. He kicked his boots clean against the welcome mat and stepped into the house.
Chapter 5 Fuck, he was hot. But something occurred to me in the short space that it took him to cross from my front step to the couch in my living room. What I had mistaken for arrogance before was a carefulness. He moved stealthily and silently, but his every move was guarded. I found it strange, but I didn't comment upon it. My mother's voice sounded in my head, and like a Pavlovian dog, I snapped to attention and took the role of a gracious host. Would you like a drink? He grinned at me as he made himself pretty damn comfortable on my couch. I thought we were going out for coffee. Uh, yeah, sure. I could feel him looking me over, and I squirmed. You look good, he said, finally. Yeah, you too. As if he never looked good. I sucked at reciprocal complimenting, apparently. I decided to move on to familiar territory. How was training? That was comfortable territory for him as well. Good. It's nice to be back on the turf at the G. It feels like home. There was a wistful note in his voice that I liked to hear. It must be hard having to set up base in Tasmania. He scratched absentmindedly at his knee, and the slight padding under his trousers there reminded me that it was currently bandaged up because of his injury. Well, it's hard being away from home, even though it's not really that far away, but I miss living here, you know. He looked up at me and I nodded, still feeling a little tongue-tied. Are you going to stand there all night? I think he meant was I going to sit next to him on the couch, and stupidly enough, although we had already kissed, the thought of being in that close proximity to him made me startle like a jackrabbit on the savannah. Shall we get going? He got to his feet a little awkwardly because of his knee. I didn't know whether to offer to help him up. I hate being such an indecisive bastard. Of course, he caught me looking at him. Just a bit stiff. Was that ever the wrong thing to say on the first date? He instantly flushed a little, and I had to bite my lip so I wouldn't burst out laughing. Just say it, he pleaded. I know you want to get it out of your system. Say what? I asked innocently. He shook his head and moved past me toward the door. I think I took him by surprise when I grabbed his arm and pulled him back to me. My arm slipped round his waist and I kissed him. Before the party last Saturday, it had been a long time between kisses, let me tell you, so I wasn't going to waste any more. Declan responded eagerly and he shuffled me backward until he had me pinned up against my wall. Tree, wall, I guess he had a thing for pinning. I broke away when my air supply ran out. I patted him against the chest, thanking him for a job well done, and I could feel the heat from his body beneath my palm. Believe me when I say that if it were a long time between kisses, it was a long time between other things as well. To feel that warmth of human contact again with someone who wasn't a relative or a friend. Before Declan could say anything, I kissed him again, except this time I swung him around and pinned him against the wall. He laughed into my mouth, and that was even sexier than his tongue touching mine, and that gust of warm air passing from him to me, as if he was breathing for me. I maneuvered slightly so he couldn't tell just how much I was enjoying it, but I felt his fingers slide into the belt loops of my pants and draw me in. The kisses were messy, our breathing was frantic, and our hands were beginning to stray. When the will to live forced us apart again, Declan smoothed down his shirt, which had ridden up, slightly pulling out of his jeans, revealing a tuft of dark hair before hiding it away again. A mad impulse made me want to yank the shirt back up again and tug the silky hair gently. So, Declan said slowly, how about that coffee? I nodded waiting for him to turn his back so I could wipe my mouth discreetly. From the movement of his shoulders as he jogged down my front steps, I think he was doing the same thing. 
While he couldn't see me, I let the huge smile that wanted to erupt do so, and then composed myself as he fiddled with his car keys to activate the locking mechanism. That's the funny thing about dating guys. We don't get hung up on the etiquette thing of door opening and seat holding. I mean, sure, we might do it once in a while, but it's really no big deal. Whoever drives, that's up to them. And I was happy to let Declan drive tonight, just in case I needed a drink to fortify my spirits at some point. I knew it had to be a rental car, since his own would be in Tassie, but he could sense the smirk I concealed. What? he asked. I just take what I'm given. I bet you like the SUV, though. It's a man's 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 car. I opened my door and jumped in. He jogged around the side and got in behind the wheel. You're making fun of me for the car I drive. Ha! You do have an SUV back home, then. Declan slammed his door shut and looked at me. Do I have to answer that? Hey, it would be hypocritical of me to slag you off if you do, since I gratefully took a nice sum of money in sponsorship from them last year. You did? Yep. He looked appeased. Would it make you happy if I told you it was a hybrid? What makes you think that would make me happy? A small smirk tugged at his lips. You look like you vote green. He could tell by my expression that he was right, and he laughed at having caught me out. You're not a liberal supporter, are you? I asked worriedly. Because if you are, I have to call it a night. He looked truly offended. Christ, my family would kill me if I voted anything but labor. But we're not going to discuss politics all night, are we? We're going to discuss a lot of things, I told him. I was perfectly serious about the liberal thing. As Liz Lemon, a personal hero of mine, would say, that's a deal-breaker. Declan shut me up by kissing me. It was a good tactic, and I think I had surpassed my own record for the most pash sessions on a first date before leaving the driveway. I was sure that this was either some very nice, very surreal dream, or an elaborate hoax, that would result in some lame breakfast show DJ jumping out from behind a bush and telling me I had been scammed, with Roger and Fran pissing themselves as they were revealed to be the people who set it all up. But nothing like that happened. Not yet, anyway. Declan started the car, and we pulled out of the drive and into the night beyond. Now that he was used to the Tasmanian Arctic winds, Melbourne's gave Declan nothing to fear. I was like a dog whenever I was in a car. I always had to have my face exposed to the gale without. I was feeling an ongoing, uninterrupted sensation of happiness. I wondered if this was what Prozac was meant to feel like. So where are you taking me? I asked, realizing that we had never discussed our destination. My favorite cafe he said with a grin. Does it have a name? You'll see. We headed toward the city itself, passing under the iconic cheese stick and ribcage architecture that served as the gateway to the city from the northern suburbs and out past the Docklands. As the streets became more populated, my natural happiness diminished somewhat. I suddenly felt more exposed. Until now, whatever Declan and I did was under the cover of trees, within my house, or sheltered in driveways. Now, here we were, driving along Flinders Street, where anybody could peer into the car and recognize the celebrity in their midst. Then we would be going to a cafe. A public cafe. I was being stupid. Guys hung out all the time. It didn't mean they were gay. But when you are gay, you automatically think everybody knows and wonder if you're safe. It's not a fun way to pass the time. Mostly, you forget about it. But on a first date, boundaries haven't been set. You don't know what the other person is comfortable with yet. And it doesn't help when the other party is a well-known, extremely closeted sports star. What's up? Huh? Well, I haven't known you that long. 
he said, flicking the indicator light on as he took us off the main road. But you don't seem like the type to stay quiet for very long. Then you don't know me very well, I sniped, harsher than I meant. Come on, what's up with you? Nothing, seriously nothing. He chose to accept that obvious lie for the time being, and I didn't want to be the one getting all deep and meaningful before caffeine had even been served. I could see the ocean come into view before us. We weren't far from the pier where the spirit of Tasmanian birthed. It seemed odd, especially as I didn't think Declan would use the ferry that much, if at all, because he would have flights for all away games paid for him by the club. Better only to spend an hour on the plane than a full night by ferry. The ferry terminal wasn't such a rocking place at night. I wondered where the hell he was taking me. He pulled into a car space in front of the pier. This is it? I asked. Declan unbuckled his seatbelt. Yep. Puzzled, I jumped down from the cab and waited for him to come around from his side. He pointed out a coffee cart in the foreshore, which looked lonely and abandoned this time of night, seeing most of the business people and tourists who would be the main source of custom for the day were long gone by now. Riley, I said, Wow, it's a good thing you're not going out of your way to impress me on a first date and all. A date? He said maddeningly. Is that what this is? I should bloody well hope so, seeing as I've made out with you three times. I thought to myself, but to keep up the nonchalance, I said, well, then I'm definitely not putting out. He flushed again. For a footballer, who was probably used to the bodiness of a locker room, he seemed way too easy to embarrass. But I wished I hadn't said it. My mouth, and my propensity to put my foot in it, was one of my less endearing traits. I don't know why I had this need to prove I was tougher than I actually was. It probably made me look just as dumb as the guys he had to work with, all that posturing. But I guess we all do it day to day, to some extent. We could go somewhere else, he suggested amiably. No, I said quickly, this is cool. And it was. I had to admit that I felt more comfortable in the darkness by the water than I would have been in a crowded cafe on Brunswick or Ligon Street. As we reached the cart, the owner came out from behind it and treated Declan like an old friend. Mr. Tyler, you're back. Two away games in a row, Declan said. Must be a hassle. Declan shrugged. It means I get to come home more often. Who'd want to leave this city? The man asked, looking at me, maybe wanting my input. I was still wondering if it was a rhetorical question when Declan gestured to me. Arnie, this is my friend Simon. Pleased to meet you. Arnie pumped my hand enthusiastically, like he was about to be my new best friend. So what do you guys want, your usual? I'll have my usual. Simon here will take a latte. I frowned at his take-charge attitude. As Arnie moved back behind his cart, I muttered to Declan. How did you know I would take a latte? Declan shot me that million-dollar smile again. You look like a latte drinker, aren't you? Yeah, but... I shrugged it off. He stared at me for a moment and then moved closer to the cart to pay for the coffee. Arnie tried to give it to him gratis, but Declan wouldn't hear of it, and I could see he left Arnie a sizable tip. Not only had the smug bastard picked my drink, he had rightly guessed that I would want the largest size available. He handed me the container, which was roughly the size of a laundry bucket. I was grateful because I take as much coffee as I can, and it would also serve as a convenient hand warmer against the cold wind coming off from the ocean. We exchanged goodbyes with Arnie, and I saw Declan's face drop for a brief second when he was wished luck for the weekend's game but he covered it up pretty quickly. Arnie began packing a cart up, and we walked out onto the pier, moving out into the darkness. You're not playing again this weekend, are you? I asked to break the silence. 
He looked stonily ahead. Maybe he wished I had kept quiet. Nope. They were saying on the news there's a possibility you would. You keeping track of me? I couldn't tell whether it was an accusation or a tease. His tone was neutral. It's hard not to, I said evenly. You watch the news, you get a commentary on all the big player injuries. He stopped walking and leaned against the wooden railing, cupping his coffee in both of his hands. Well, the media doesn't know about everything. I sipped at my latte. Okay, so you don't want to talk about it. He looked at me. It's not that. You don't trust me? You think I'm going to run and tell your story to the new idea? There was a faint indication of his smile returning. No, I don't think you'd do that. Besides, the new idea wouldn't care. You'd be better off going to the footy record. How do you know? I was definitely pushing it, but I was intrigued. Not the new idea, I mean. But you don't know me at all. It's a big risk, and it's hard enough dating a guy. But when you take into account how much harder it must be for you... Like I said, I didn't think you'd be like that. But it was just a feeling, okay? No, I don't normally do this, but I just... He trailed off. Just, you're one of the few people I've met lately who didn't fall at my feet. Sometimes it's hard to know a person's intentions. I was gobsmacked. So it was my natural surliness that won you over? He chuckled. I guess you could say that. Wow. Normally it drives people away, not the other way around. I took a huge gulp of coffee to reward myself. Maybe you want it to. His tone remained neutral, and he continued to stare out at the waves whipped up by the constant wind. It was a little too early for him to start psychoanalyzing me. Really? Uh-oh, you sound pissed. Slightly. Why? You're making a lot of assumptions about me. Like what? He sounded genuinely perplexed. That I look like a green supporter? That I'll drink a latte? Was I wrong? Bugger. No. You're a bit of a type, that's all. I was starting to get really pissed now. Why the hell was I here when I could be at home waiting for the late night repeat of forensic investigators to come on? And what type is that? You know, the arty wanker type. Are you trying to be insulting? He straightened up. No. You want to analyze types? Declan grinned, a surprising move. You're going to say I'm a typical meathead jock. He wasn't, and I had to admit that. Not really, but you do have the natural arrogance. That was the first thing I ever heard you say about me. It sounded oddly nostalgic coming from him. You're fucking weird. So are you. That's why I like you. I was glad it was dark, so he couldn't see me flush. So, you like Artie Wankers, then? I'm not sure as a whole, but I like you. Definitely flushing now. I took refuge in my bucket o' coffee again. Doesn't take compliments well, Declan remarked, noted. I sighed. Look, it's just... I'll forget it. Yeah, that always works when somebody says that. Spit it out. I was embarrassed, and I didn't want to show it. Why me? My friend Roger says you could date anybody you wanted. And he's your friend saying things like that. He was being honest. It's true. You could date a gay supermodel. Declan had to lean against the railing to support himself as he burst out laughing. Why would I want to do that? Why wouldn't you? You go date a gay supermodel if you think they're so great. I couldn't get near a gay supermodel. Maybe you're not trying hard enough. Okay, he got me. We both roared with laughter, and I felt the return of that good feeling I had lost once we hit the city. His pinky finger stretched out and stroked it over the back of my hand. I stood there and let him do it. 
I wondered briefly if it made me slightly pathetic to find it extremely sexy, but I decided to go with it. I let my other hand wander over and linked my pinky with his. We stood there in silence, but both grinning, watching the fishing boats out on the sea for the night run. I could see why this was one of his favorite places, and I figured he probably came out here a lot by himself. And it would only have been at night, when he felt it was his and his alone. So I was touched, rather than offended, that he'd brought me here. Someone had to say something sometime. So you really think I'm an arty wanker? He shook his head and laughed softly. Simon, I'm surprised you're not wearing a beret. That's what I wear on second dates. I thought you said berets were for Sundays. I couldn't believe he remembered that. Sundays and second dates. I felt his pinky leave mine, and I was shocked at how empty mine felt without his curled around it. This was getting too fast, too quick. I look forward to seeing it then. Confirmation. But it was a confirmation I wanted to hear. Although I couldn't resist a little dig. Who said there would be a second date? He was mocking himself as much as me. What? You could resist this? I was slightly worried that I couldn't but my brain didn't want me to think too much about it at that moment. When would you be next back in town? Not for another fortnight. That was too far away. I was already feeling that flush of a new relationship where you want to hold yourself up with that person, discovering everything about them both emotionally and physically, leaving your friends to send out search parties while you were reveling in your newfound bliss. I guess there's no possibility of you transferring to another team before then. I wish. There was a hint of bitterness in his voice. I remembered vaguely how he had been drafted out to the Devils as part of their first-year sweetener deal. He had done all the requisite PR, but everybody who followed footy on any level could tell he wasn't happy about it. What, you don't like Tassie? I love Tassie. It's a beautiful state, but it's not my home. I tried to imagine leaving Melbourne, but I couldn't. As Arnie had said before, who would want to? There were a multitude of reasons why it was the city with the largest pattern of migration in Australia, not the other way around. Sometimes you really had to search to find a person born and bred in Melbourne, because it seemed like every new person you met was a refugee from another state. You miss your family? Yeah, of course I do. Do they know? Coded speak once again. About me? He paused to toss his coffee cup into a nearby bin. It seemed he could have been a basketballer if his football career had not taken off. He indicated my cup, silently asking if I had finished with mine. I shook my head. I think my mum does, but I'm not sure. Nothing's ever been said anyway, but that's it. What about you? I thought of my family, and how they didn't really talk about it, but seemed to accept it as best they could. They know. They okay about it. In their own way. We'll see what happens if I ever bring a guy over to meet them. You haven't ever done that. He sounded surprised. Oh, fuck no. I don't know who would be more freaked, them or me. Why would you be freaked? I sipped at the dregs of my coffee. Maybe I'm not as out and proud as I like to think I am. Declan stared at his own feet. At least you're out. I felt sorry for him. I wasn't comfortable with the feeling, but the thing was, I could understand him. Hey, I'm an arty wanker in an arty wanker industry. I think the only thing gayer would be working at a fashion magazine. It's harder doing what you do. I'm not looking for justification, he mumbled. I know you're not. I shrugged, turned, and aimed for the bin. A gust of wind caught the coffee cup and it rattled it into the wooden slats of the jetty. Declan dived after it like he was on the field, scooping it up deftly and handballing it into the bin. Show off? I laughed. 
but he looked happier again. Let's go for a drive, he suggested. So, what do you do when you can't play? I asked as we drove through the back streets of the city. Declan kept his eyes on the road ahead, trying to avoid a near collision with the 86 tram. What do you mean, what do I do? Well, they always make you fly over even though you can't play. Why? For one thing, I like it, because I get to come back here. Secondly, it's meant to be for team morale. You know, keep the whole team together. So that I can help the assistant coach. Sounds like they're training you up to become captain. He sounded distant. Nah, I don't want to be captain. Why not? Too much attention. And that was the crux of it, I guess. What he wasn't saying was that it would bring him even more public scrutiny. At the moment, everyone thought of him as a great footballer who happened to be shy. If he were captain, he would be interviewed almost every day. The media would probe more into his life. I wondered, not for the umpteenth time, where this was going and how we could manage to keep seeing each other, if indeed that was what we both wanted, which it looked like we did. You're being quiet again, Declan said. You're not exactly talking my ear off yourself. What are you thinking about? Coffee, I lied. Shit, you must have an addiction. Better that it's caffeine than crack. Once the words were out of my mouth, I realized that joking about drugs in sport probably wasn't the best thing. Change the subject, quick. So, what suburb did you grow up in? Glenroy. Are your parents still there? Yeah, they like it there. I bet you they've kept your room like a shrine. He didn't say anything, but his eye twitched. They have. Well, it's not like I'm ever going back to it. My mom has a shrine dedicated to Essenton, I said. It's very sad. So says the Richmond supporter. Hey! He laughed, pleased with himself. Come on, Richmond? We have history behind us, matey, unlike your team, which was only created through the dregs and pity of another. Ouch! He whistled cheerfully. Got me there. I began to sing the Richmond theme softly to myself. Oh, we're from Tigerland, bom, 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 bom. Stop it, Declan growled. A fighting fury, we're from Tigerland. I'm warning you. And what was he going to do? If we're behind, then never mind. We'll fight and fight and win. Keep dreaming, and maybe it will happen one day. He laughed, looking back in the rearview mirror. We never weaken until the final scores. Like the tigers of old, we're strong and we're bold. Don't do it, he pleaded. That was like waving a red flag at a bull. Yes, we're from Tiger. If he hadn't been driving, he would have blocked his ears at the anticipated bellow that always came at this point in the song. Yellow and black! That's it. Yes, we're from Tiger... Ah! My final word became a strangled yelp as he swerved to the side and deftly swooped into a parallel parking spot. This'll shut you up, he said menacingly. In one fluid motion so quick I could barely even make it out, his seat belt was unbuckled and flung over his shoulder, where the metal lock almost smashed the driver's window. He was half on top of me, pinning me uncomfortably against the door, the armrest digging into my back. I laughed, and he did shut me up by plastering his mouth hungrily over mine. I managed to pull my right arm out from where it was wedged between the seats and ran it up his back, bringing him in closer to me. My other arm was stuck between the dashboard and his neck, and there wasn't anything I could do about it. He was pretty bloody strong. But you should never underestimate someone who has the adrenaline of passion inside them. I surprised him by pushing against him, and this time he was pressed against his door with me squirming around on top of him. 
His arm was now in the position mine had been in before, but the other one was free to travel down and cup one of the cheeks of my arse. Roger was right. I was a first-date slut, and I proved it by pulling away and grinning. While he was trapped under me, I ran a finger along his side and then across the front of his jeans, scraping beneath the fold that connected with the zipper. Declan stared at me, looking slightly dumbfounded, but he sprang into action when I started pulling his zipper down. Wait a minute. Disheveled, he pulled away from me, retreating as far into his corner as he could go. I slumped back down into my own. What? We're just going a bit too fast. Wow. I had never heard that from a guy before. Uh, okay, I said. I sat up and tugged at my clothes to straighten them. You're pissed. No, I said, and I wasn't really, just confused. He sat up and straightened himself. I'll take you home. What, home already? Something was wrong now, but I heard myself saying robotically, Sure. Declan threw the car back into gear and we pulled out of the space just as easily as we had swung into it. When we got back to my house, I didn't invite him in. I don't think he was expecting me to, and I don't think he really wanted me to either. I was already trying to figure out in my head what had gone wrong, but I couldn't come up with an answer that seemed logical. Thanks for the coffee, I said, pulling on the handle to open the door. Listen. Declan said urgently, and he leaned across to me, putting his hand over mine. Don't go away mad. I meant what I said. I do want to see you again. I couldn't think of what to say. Cool. Cool as in cool, or cool as in whatever? Cool as in cool, I replied. Coolly, no doubt. Declan sighed and gave me a brief kiss. Good night, I said. I jumped out of the cab. He watched me from the driveway as I unlocked my front door and entered my dark house. I didn't turn the lights on, but closed the door behind me and crossed to the window to look out into the yard. Declan sat there for a few moments, the engine running. I was hoping that I would hear the engine switch off and that he would come and knock on my door. But he stared stonily ahead at the house. Maybe he was waiting to see if I would come out again. Then he drove off, and I made my way to my bedroom in the dark. Chapter 6 To think that I had been stupid enough to entertain the thought that I might have woken up in the morning with Declan Tyler beside me? Instead, what I got was the cat staring at me waiting for me to open my eyes so she could begin her wailing for her breakfast. Morning, Maggie, I mumbled. Her plaintive cry was a shock to the system. I stumbled out into the kitchen and got tripped by her three times before we reached her bowl. She was silenced by the food produced for her. If only people could be so easily pleased. At least it was Friday. I would only have to stumble through one more day before the promise of the weekend would arrive. A game with Roger on Saturday, which reminded me I had to try to get out of shopping with Fran. I wondered if she would accept the fact that this relationship was over before it began and that I was too depressed to go shopping for clothes I would now never wear. I had a vision of myself, a male, modern Miss Havisham, sitting in my lounge room in my moldering second-date clothes. I kind of liked that image. When I got into the office, Nysa immediately jumped on me. How was the interview? I wasn't with it that morning. Interview? Don't play dumb for the new job. I sighed. There's no new job, Nysa. You say that now? Uh-huh, I'll say that later as well. I hold up in my office. I would like to say that I distracted myself by working like a demon, but mainly I stared out the window a lot and took the occasional phone call. 
I got messages from both Roger and Fran, asking how the date went, and I ignored them. I couldn't talk to either of them about it yet, not when I didn't even know what had happened. I should have known I couldn't escape them at work, though. At ten, my phone rang, and when I picked it up, Fran was on the other end. Oh, so you haven't been murdered, and we don't have to call the police. Morning, Fran. You could return a person's call. Technically, it was an SMS. Same thing. Not really. Why didn't you text me back then? I hesitated, and it made a long enough pause for her to jump back in. Simon, what's wrong? Didn't you have a good time? I began to bite at my thumbnail. At the start, yeah. What happened? I can't talk about it now. I ripped the free edge off and winced as part of the cuticle came with it. Can you make lunch? I can at one if you don't mind a late lunch. Yeah, I can do lunch at one. Her voice entered super serious mode. Simon, are you okay? Yeah, of course, yeah. I'll see you at one. Fran didn't sound like she believed me, but at least she hung up. Probably to ring Roger to tell him something was up and she was going to sort it all out. So he was not to call me because he'd stuff it all up. For that, I was grateful, because I didn't want to have to talk about this twice, one of the benefits of being friends with Fran. It was hard enough having to do it once. Fran kissed me on the cheek before she sat down. Okay, tell me everything. I sipped at my Coke and wished it was wine. But I couldn't go back to the office with alcohol on my breath, or Nysa would assume it was to drink to celebrate my new job, or whatever she thought it could be at this moment. Reluctantly, I started giving her the details as we ordered. Fran had the linguine, I had a calzone. While waiting for the food to arrive, I got to the point where contact occurred in the car. I grew a little red as I tried to get away with the barest detail. Anyway, I was kissing him, and I reached down. Down where? Fran asked innocently. Down. Oh, down. I hated her right then. It's not like I managed to get it out. My hand was on his zipper but he kind of freaked out and said he would take me home. Huh, Fran said thoughtfully, but not helpfully. I looked to her for elaboration. Did you ask him why? I leaned back as the waiter arrived with our food. Once he was gone, I leaned back in. No, not really. No, or not really. Stop being vague. I cut into my calzone savagely. No. And I suppose he didn't volunteer any further information. Just that it was too fast. Men, Fran sighed, not for the last time in her life. It's hard enough being a woman and dating a guy. I can't imagine how much worse it could be when there are two guys in the equation not communicating with each other. I mumbled an incoherent reply. Maybe he's more traditional than you, and by that I mean less slutty. I almost choked on my food. I gulped at my coke and tried to gain back some of my dignity. I am not a man-ho. I didn't know where this reputation came from, seeing I had fewer relationships and hookup than either Fran or Roger before they found each other and settled into coupled bliss. Maybe to him you are. He's a footballer. They're supposedly all sluts. Fran grinned. Apparently not all of them. Can you think of any other reason he would fob me off like that? You said you had kissed him a few times, right? The room seemed to grow warmer as memories of us in my lounge, against the tree at the party, and in the cab of his SUV swamped me. Yeah, a couple. Why? Fran seemed lost in thought, and then it occurred to me. Oh, he was lying, wasn't he? Maybe he just doesn't find me attractive. 
Bran hastily hid behind her hand and giggled. He just gave me a mercy pash, thinking that would be enough. Still smiling, Fran began to dig into her fruit again. Oh, Simon. What? She paused, with a forkful of pasta in midair. Wasn't it just the other day that you said you hadn't suddenly grown a vagina? I realized I was starting to sound like a maudlin chick flick character. Fran nodded to emphasize her point and swallowed her pasta. I stared miserably at the cliched checker tablecloth under my plate. Did he kiss you goodnight? Fran asked. A very brief one. On the lips? I nodded. Yeah, it was on the lips. That's a good sign. I tried not to hope too much. Is it? If he didn't kiss you but said he'd call you, then you'd be in trouble. Yeah, but I got a brief kiss and a promise of a call later. But yours was on the lips. That makes a difference, Simon. Unless he was just trying really hard to fool me so I wouldn't ask any awkward questions. Bran wiped her hands on her napkin and stared at me. It was the stare she sent right through you that made you squirm and made you know you couldn't lie because she would catch you out and make you pay. It sounds like you almost want it to be a kiss-off. I shrugged. That only threw her into persistency mode. Do you like him? I met her gaze and knew that resistance was futile. Yeah. That one little word came out against my will. What I know of him at the moment, anyway. That's a start. So what do I do? She patted my hand and let hers rest above mine. You just take it as it comes, hon. It sounds like it's going to be a hard road with him being in the limelight. You can't make it more difficult for yourself by second-guessing everything. So what you mean is, I'm going to have to talk to him. I know that's a hard concept for you, the whole opening up thing. I'm doing it right now, aren't I? Fran laughed. Yeah, to the wrong person. She asked me to share a sticky date pudding with her, feeling somewhat cheered. I had no trouble being convinced. I considered catching the tram to the two stops back to the office. I felt so bloated with food. But I walked it off and was in a much better mood when I walked back in the door. Long lunch, Nysa commented. Lots of things to talk about, I said vaguely. I noticed the horrified look on her face but decided not to reassure her again. Girl is too paranoid. I wondered if Roger was going to call me regardless. I knew Fran would have called him as soon as she got back to work so they could swap notes. She probably would have told him to lay off me for the moment. Roger, if he did what he always did, would listen to her for a day, so I was expecting him to grill me once he had me cornered at the footy tomorrow like I really wanted to discuss my love life when watching Richmond get thrashed once again. That's just letting salt be poured into your open wound. As I settled back into my chair, Declan crossed my mind again. To try to get him off it, a futile attempt I know, I busied myself by starting to go through some DVDs delivered that morning. They were potential entries for the festival, and there was a reek of desperation and hope about them. The desperate ones always got to me the most. I knew how they felt. Halfway through a heartfelt and achingly amateur documentary about schizophrenic teams forming a garage band, which managed to check every box for guaranteeing a hit among the liberal-minded audience that always attended our festival, my mobile buzzed with a message. Far from being the cool, calm, and dispassionate person I hoped I would be, I almost did the Snoopy dance of suppertime joy when the screen informed me that it was from Declan. Hope things are okay between us. Okay, so a flutter of hope sounded in my heart. Shut up. I pondered over what to write back. This was the best I could do. They're fine. Good luck with the game tonight. I tapped the mobile against my lower lip, 
staring out the window and watching the crowd scurry in and out of Flinders Street Station as I waited for his message. A few moments later it came. I'm glad, and thanks. I couldn't help but be me, though. I'm only wishing you luck because you're not playing us. His response was quick. I wouldn't have expected anything else from you. I laughed. Wise move. While waiting for his response, I entertained the possibilities that could arise from the first time our teams met each other on the field. When we couldn't even figure out the sex thing, how would we tackle actual combat? Football was even more sacred than fucking. Declan became serious in his next one. I really want to talk to you. If I could, I would come and see you before I leave, but our flight is immediately after the game. I replied that I would definitely see him next time he was in town. His next message managed to make me feel more confident. I'd like to talk to you before then. I thought I would give him a glimmer of hope. You know my number. There was no hesitation. I do. Talk soon. So he wasn't dumping me, but I still had no idea what was going on with him. I wondered where he was exactly at this point in time. At the locker room at the MCG? Sitting on the field, watching his teammates train without him? Maybe they were noticing him texting a lot and teasing him about finally finding a girlfriend. Even just the thought of that, and him playing along with it as a natural cover, made an irrepressible bitterness well up inside me. I pushed it down as much as I could, and tried to focus on the good, but came up empty-handed and had to distract myself with work instead. Nysa eventually returned to haunt my doorway at about four in the afternoon. She looked at me expectantly, half fearful as always for some reason that this would be the Friday that I would expect us to work all the way through to normal quitting time, and that divine light in her eyes would go out, possibly forever. Yes, Nysa? I asked as if the boss never thought of quitting early to go to the pub and must be reminded of these things, even though he can think of nothing else. So it's bog off to the pub day, Simon. I closed my diary with a resounding thump. So it is. Get your coat. Nysa clapped her hands excitedly like she was six years old again. Slightly disturbing to think of her as a six-year-old getting excited over the prospect of beer. I checked my mobile for the fifth time that hour to see if Declan had texted me. He hadn't. That was fair enough. I mean, it was getting closer and closer to kickoff time. Already, crowds were starting to make their way down to the G, last-minute ticket sales would be going fast, and beer and chips would be selling like, well, beer and chips. We hopped the tram to take the short ride into Fitzroy and headed for the Napier. Fran was already there, Roger on his way, and the usual crowd was assembling. We pushed tables together out into the mosaic-tiled back room and ordered the first round of drinks. As the patrons got rowdier and the music got louder, Fran leaned into me. I can tell something's happened, she said, her voice low and warm in my ear. He texted me, I muttered back. In a good way? I think so, I replied. Fran leaned back into her seat, studying me. You have that look again. I'm not getting my hopes up, I assured her. I don't think she believed me. I'm not sure I believed me. Luckily, Nysa blundered into the conversation as she sat back down, with roughly eight packets of chips crushed against her chest. Are you talking about his interview? Not again, nice, I groaned. Interview? Fran asked, immediately beginning to open the chips. Nice as paranoid, I said quickly. I am not, Nysa objected, shoving the salt and vinegar chip into her mouth. Just because I suspect things doesn't make me paranoid. You're not seriously leaving the Triple F? Fran asked. No, I yelled. 
partly because I was frustrated and partly because the music had gotten louder. Bit defensive, Fran said. I told you, Nysa replied. He's being secretive about something. He's a smitten kitten, Fran teased. And then she screamed when I kicked her under the table. What are you, five? What are you, the town crier? I shot back. Nysa stared me down. That's it, she said slowly. I thought you were planning to leave, but the phone calls, the lunch rendezvouses. That isn't a word, I interrupted her. What is the plural of rendezvous? Fran asked. I'm sure she was really interested. Rendezvous is both singular and plural, I said, trying not to sound like grammar boy. Those French are so smart, Fran mused, rubbing her ankle. Two for the price of one. Anyway, Nysa, those calls and rendezvous are mainly with her. I pointed at Fran. You're fooling around with my wife. Roger had finally appeared. He whacked me over the head as he maneuvered around the table to sit with the woman in question. Only on Thursdays, hon, Fran said, kissing him hello. And Mondays, Nysa said. Oh, and Wednesdays as well. I told you, you were a man whore. Roger said to me. Ha, ha, I frowned, trying to shake it off. After all, it's not like he knew what had happened yet. Roger yelped when Fran kicked him under the table. What was that for? he cried. Because it's your shout, she said grimly. All right, all right. He knew when he was beaten, even though he wasn't sure why his shin was suddenly bruising. Come and help me, homewrecker. I got to my feet and followed him back out to the main bar. You know, Roger said, leaning against the counter, waiting to be served. I wish for once you would tell me something before you tell Fran. You've known me longer, remember? I can't help it if you don't work in the city a few offices away from me, I said, placating him. It's really easy to catch up with her. Yeah, and I live so far away from you, he pointed out. I do want to tell you things. She just gets to you in the meantime. Besides, you're not a fag hag. The word rankled on my tongue. I had never liked it. Female companion, gossip girl, something. Whatever. Roger was approached by the barman, and he placed his order. Do you really want me to tell you everything? I asked, leaning in closer to him and lowering my voice. You want all the details of how I tried to blow him and how he wouldn't let me? Roger jumped as if he'd been scalded. You couldn't be a little less vulgar, he said primly. He was acting like he had just escaped from a BBC classic drama, with Elizabeth Bennet waiting beneath a weeping willow for his return. See, you can't hack it. I can so, he said petulantly. Just try me. I hadn't wanted to be vulgar. It's really not me. But it was fun to test Roger. Like most guys, he's easy to gross out when you describe any guy-on-guy -guy action to them. It's my opinion they usually act so grossed out because they're too scared to think about if it actually happened to them, they might enjoy it. I'm not saying everyone's a latent queer, but when the juices start flowing, sometimes you might not care about who's on the other end of your dick. But I wasn't even sure I truly believed that either. Okay, to put it simply, I tried to go down on him. He acted like you are at the moment, and he drove me home. Roger frowned. Maybe he's not really gay. Oh, come on. Maybe he's confused. Bloody Roger. Now he was helping to plant seeds of doubt in me, something I could do very well on my own. Maybe it was true. This kind of thing happened all the time although usually to kids in first-year Bachelor of Arts courses. They turned bisexual for a few months and then quite happily slid back into heteronormativity when selection for second-year units came around and thus causing true bisexuals to be lumped in the same category with unicorns and other mythical creatures. Or maybe he's just never done it with a guy, Roger suggested helpfully. I think that was even more unbelievable. 
Declan Tyler, one of the current gods of the AFL, unable to get a date. You're making me feel worse, I told him. Sorry, he said cheerfully. This is why I like talking to Fran. Roger scratched at the end of his nose. What kind of a guy turns down a blowjob? He asked, just as the barman returned with our drinks. Not realizing it was a rhetorical question, the barman answered, No guy would. You got to have standards, though. You wouldn't just take one from anyone, right? Roger asked him, completely forgetting he was discussing sex with a total stranger. Dude, I would take a blowjob from Mr. Squiggle if it was going free. I shook my head. That's just sick. Call it as I see it. As we made our way back to the table, Roger giggled like a schoolgirl. Even I thought that was going a bit too far. I could only shake my head, too dumbfounded and too grossed out to even formulate words. You took your sweet time, Fran frowned as we sat with them again. We just found out the barman would take a blowjob from Mr. Squiggle if he could. That's disgusting, Fran and Nysa said in unison. But would he take it from the blackboard? Nysa asked thoughtfully, chewing on the lemon from her gin and tonic. Fran just shook her head and found solace in her beer. Roger nudged me and pointed at the television up in the corner. It was hard to hear what was being said above the music and the general hubbub of the pub, but it displayed a familiar face. Declan, in the locker room at the MCG. He was sitting in a blue suit with a tassie devil's tie knotted closely at his throat. He didn't look too happy. Fran had now noticed as well, and was showing interest that had nothing to do with the game. Tyler, I could hear the reporter say. Once again benched due to injury, but supporting his team in the best way he can. So, Declan, when do you think we'll see you on the field again? I'm not sure, Declan said evenly, not really looking at either camera or the reporter. We're really just taking it one week at a time and hoping that I won't have to go in for another surgery. Because that just means more time out of the game, right? The reporter asked. Exactly, Declan replied. The camera swung away from him again to focus on the reporter. Fran, Roger, and I exchanged looks. Luckily, Nysa had been distracted by someone she knew coming over and asking her if she wanted to play pool. The man looks good in a suit, Fran said finally. He did, but I kept my mouth shut. I look good in a suit, Roger huffed. Anybody could look good in a suit, even I could. Biggest fucking waste of money, came a voice not far from us. We turned around. One of the local oldies was leaning up against the wall, his stubby in his hand. He drank from it in disgust, although apparently it was what was on the television rather than the taste of his beer. What's a waste of money? Fran asked politely. Fran, Roger hissed, don't engage the crazy man. Too late. That Declan Tyler, the man said, as viciously as if he was invoking the name of Beelzebub himself. What's wrong with him? I asked defensively finding myself now brought into the fray. All the money they forked out from him to get released into the draft, so the devils could pick him up, and he's been benched ever since. I opened my mouth to speak, but Fran got in there before me. Are you a devil supporter? The old man laughed derisively. No way. I haven't forgiven the AFL for selling Fitzroy up the river. Me too, Roger declared happy to find a like-minded individual and totally forgetting that he had earlier dismissed him as crazy. Is that why you went to Hawthorne so quickly afterwards? I asked him. Shut up, he snapped back. The man was still staring at the telly. That Tyler's a sham. Makes me think that all his awards are just a fluke. Maybe he did himself in deliberately so he wouldn't eventually be found out. Best thing for his career. Hey. I said. 
Anyone who wins all the awards he did, plus the respect of the players and umpires alike, is no sham. He's just been cursed by injury, and given time, he'll probably be back to form soon enough. Fran and Roger stared at me, open-mouthed, surprised by my impassioned delivery. The old man sized me up. You as manager? No, I said coolly. I just believe in credit where credit is due. Everyone bitches about Tyler, but they all wish he was on their team. That made Fran and Roger lose it, and I shook my head slightly for my unheralded double entendre. The only team I want him on is Fitzroy, the man said. He leaned into Roger. You're a disgrace to the memory of your team. Roger sat up fully. Hey, wait a minute. But the man disappeared into the main bar. They've been gone almost twenty years, Roger called out. You have to let go sometime. Fran dug at me with her finger. And you, what was that all about? What? Flying your flag for Declan Tyler. Credit where credit's due, remember? I'm not a traitor, Roger mumbled to himself. Fran grinned smugly at me. You are a smitten kitten. Shut up, I said. It's your shout. Chapter 7 The Devils lost that night, and the next morning it was all over the papers that Declan Tyre should have been playing, as if he was single-handedly the savior of his team, and they were dying without him. They didn't care about his injuries. And I thought, for what was really the first time, how hard it must be to be him. The old man's words from the Napier kept coming back to me. It was like Declan could never win. What would happen when he returned from the field and his injury was too bad for him to start over again? His previous record would be tarnished. People would feel justified in saying he was like a beginner in poker with a run of good luck that never had the test of time to show his true worth as a player. If he did come back and the devil started winning again, it would only set him up for a greater fall when they would inevitably come down again. It seemed like too much pressure to me. I wondered how Declan felt. Maybe he didn't even read the papers anymore because he didn't want to read what they said about him. I tried calling him on his mobile, but it was switched off, and I didn't know his landline as it was a silent number and he hadn't given it to me yet. Luckily, Fran had imbibed a bit too much at the Napier and called off our shopping date, so I was still in relatively good spirits when I met Roger in town for the game, despite not being able to reach Declan. Roger was in a mood. He wasn't wearing his Hawthorne scarf and I could tell he was still dwelling on the whole traitor thing. Of course, my Richmond scarf was wrapped securely around my throat in preparation for the cold winter wind that always blew through the MCG and seemed to make a beeline straight for you. You look a bit naked for a football game, I said lightly as I approached him under the clocks of the Flinders Street station. Roger stared at me grumpily and we began to walk, melting into the crowds as we headed for the G. We cut through Fenderson Square and down like we were heading for Parliament Gardens, to where the new gates were for the plebes like us that didn't have gold passes or corporate boxes. So, seriously, Rog, where's your scarf? He gave me that look which, to his mind, meant I should shut up. But, always contrary, I took it as a please, press the issue glance. Did you do something to piss Fran off so she's punishing you? I just didn't think it was cold enough to wear a scarf today, okay? We edged into the queue for our gate, the clouds awash in divided loyalties of yellow and black and yellow and brown. Are you kidding? Even the penguins are wearing mittens. Drop it, he warned. You never tell me to drop it. It's impossible for me, and Roger knew that. Are you taking to heart what that crazy old man said? No. Bullshit. Well, didn't you take what he said to heart? You went riding up on your big white horse to defend Declan Bloody Tyler. What, are you pissed that you didn't do the same for Fitzroy? 
He glared at me. You don't understand. Fitzroy's dead, Rog. Just because some old man in a pub can't accept it doesn't mean you have to go the same way. You want to be without a team for the rest of your life, yelling at younger footy fans across a bar? No, he mumbled. Our cue remained at a standstill. Funnily enough, the cues for the rich were non-existent. Hold my spot, I said, like he wouldn't. Hey, where are you going? He yelled after me, but I ignored him. I found one of those family business stands, like you see at weekend markets, where some bored fifteen-year-old was manning it, obviously forced into child labor in order to earn his pocket money for the week. I picked up a hawthorn scarf and handed it over with the money. He snapped his gum and looked at the Richmond scarf around my neck. Trying to hedge your bets? he asked. No, I'm trying to be nice to a friend. The kid looked unimpressed. I refused the bag he tried to stuff it in, and then jogged back to where Roger had barely progressed in the queue. What are you doing? he asked. Don't say I'm never nice to you, I muttered, throwing the scarf at him. He looked down at it as it lay coiled in his hands, like a dormant snake, almost as if he thought it might bite. What's this for? I jammed my hands into my pockets. For you to wear your colors with pride. But I already have a scarf. Yeah, but you're not wearing it today, idiot. Now put it on. Seriously, even just touching it seemed to burn my hands. So you can't make me suffer for nothing. Roger grinned. Do I have to hug you? No, a simple thanks will suffice. Thanks, mate. He punched me on the arm affectionately. You're welcome. I shook my head and rubbed my arm as he wrapped the scarf around his neck and threw the tails over his shoulder. There, that looks more like my football buddy. Now I have two. Does that make me a super special fan? Only if you get your wife to sew them together into a super special scarf. We both chuckled at the thought of Fran actually sewing. Well, maybe her mum can do it for you, I suggested. She can't sew for shit either, but her dad can. What? Yeah, from when he was in the Navy. They had to know how to sew and repair their own uniforms. Fran said back when she used to go to school, it was her father that always did their mending. Wow, I can't picture that. And seriously, if you had ever met Fran's dad, you wouldn't be able to either. The man had the hand grip of a steel jaw trap. A needle would get lost in his meaty paws. Our queue finally started to move, and we made our way into Mecca. As usual, we were in the nosebleed section. The one where you get vertigo just from looking down and seeing the building drop away from you into the faraway oval. I think these seats are even worse than the last ones we had, Roger said, if that's possible. I grunted my agreement, and he suddenly perked up. Hey, do you think if you know what continues happening with you-know-who, you might be able to score us better tickets? Roger, I hissed, shut up. He looked hurt. I didn't mention any names. Yeah, well, you're still no Matahari. Who? I considered strangling him with his new scarf, but decided against it. One of the teams from Oskik was playing on the field, and the crowd was suitably ooing and eyeing for the little kids as they were able to do what very little of us could, that is, touch the hallowed ground of the G. Do you think we'll ever see one of your kids down there one day? I asked Roger. He looked horrified at the thought of there being a kid in his future but I saw the little smile he tried to hide as he stared at his knees and then looked back at me. Maybe we'll see yours before mine. I scoffed at that for many reasons. Logic was never part of Roger's repertoire. Hey, he said instantly, there are plenty of ways it could be possible. Thankfully, my mobile rang. Hold that thought. My smile could not be hid when I saw Declan's name pop up on the screen. Hello? That voice, starting to become so familiar to me, came through loud and clear. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? No, 
I said honestly. Perfect timing, actually. Roger's eyes narrowed. I just rang to wish you luck for today. Really? He laughed. Only because you're not playing us, of course. Of course. I still want to have that talk with you, you know. Yikes. You know, normally when someone says something like that, I dread it. Not in this case? Okay, a little bit. But looking forward to it more than any other time. You're so quick with the compliments. Don't strain yourself. Declan snorted. I was thinking we should make a bet for when the Tigers play the Devils. Oh, really? A thousand and eight possibilities ran through my mind. And I bet Roger could tell just what I was thinking by the way he was looking at me. A carton of beer. Good beer. Not the cheap shit. Fuck. That wasn't one of my thousand and eight possibilities. Of course, Declan said slyly. I think the loser should help the winner drink it. Aha. That was more like it. Sounds good. Anyway, I'll let you get back to the game. I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, good. You know how to reach me. I felt like slapping myself in the head as soon as I said it. Declan chuckled. You're on speed dial. Cheesy, but I liked it. And I had a sneaking suspicion that he knew that I did. See you, doofus, I said, letting him go. Roger's mouth was hanging open. See you, doofus? What? No wonder you're always fucking single. I couldn't believe Roger was critiquing me on my romantic etiquette. Seriously, Roger said, you need help. This from the man who once called his wife Frangipandia Squilliabop? Hey, I was drunk and it was cute. It was from Strictly Ballroom. Yeah, it was used as an insult against that character. Roger opened his mouth to try to defend himself once again. But luckily at that moment, I was saved from certain death by a roar from the crowd as Hawthorne ran out onto the field. I couldn't believe he still really thought that Fran thought that was cute. But, as he said, he was drunk at the time, and he didn't know her well enough back then to properly interpret the expression on her face. Although, one would think that now that they had been together for almost six years, he would have cottoned on to what bad impressions he may have given on their first meeting. From where we were sitting, the players appeared as very small yellow and brown specks on the green mass. But that didn't matter to Roger, as he was out of his seat and jumping up and down like a man possessed. Of course, I did the same a minute later, when black and yellow blobs appeared on the opposite side of the green. All thoughts of romantic rules and regulations were quickly forgotten about in the face of the game. Richmond lost, of course. Because they were playing Hawthorne, it wasn't by much. Not that that really means a thing. Despite my loss, I was still strangely happy, and Roger couldn't help but miss it as we made our way back to the tram stop to take us home. So, aren't you going to tell us? Tell you what? You know what. I did know what, not that I was going to admit it. Declan Tyler called you at the game, didn't he? Roger asked. We paused at the curb while waiting for the little man to turn green, and raced across the road to see our tram coming in the distance. Yes, he did, I admitted. And? And what? This is like pulling fucking teeth, Roger hissed. How did he seem? Fine. Just fine? Uh-huh. No mention of why no-no on the blow. I stared at him, trying to make sense of what he had just said. It finally hit me a moment later. No, gross, Roger. Roger shrugged. The tram rumbled up beside us, and we clambered on, opting for seats at the back. I stared out the window while Roger continued to press for details. So why did he call you for, then? We passed under the lights at the French end of Collins Street, and the tram seemed to glow from within before it fell back into shadow under the edifice of Parliament House. To wish me luck for the game. 
Roger looked appalled. That's dangerous, that is. Why? I did the same for him when he played on Friday. You never wish another team luck. Roger leaned forward, his earnest expression becoming intense. It's like betting against your own team in the office pool. You never do it. There was really no way I could refute that. I mean, I never bet against Richmond in the office pool, but it didn't seem like I would be adding to their woes if I wished another team luck in a game the Tigers weren't involved in. You must really like him, Roger said solemnly. He's okay, I said flatly. Roger chuckled to himself. Ha! You really, really like him. Watching my best friend morphing into Sally Field was disturbing, to say the least. Just admit it, he provoked me. It's way too early to say one way or the other, I shrugged. He knew I was lying. I knew he knew I was lying but the bonds of friendship meant that he couldn't question me about it too much at this point. But all gloves would probably be off after the second date, and he would come in at me with a right hook. I hadn't been home for very long when another game of message tag began. Guess we're both losers this week, then. I managed to multitask by responding while feeding Maggie and pulling a beer out of the fridge. As long as we're losers together. He must text like a demon. But what happens when one of us wins? That looked pretty doubtful at the moment, for either the Tigers or the Devils. Then we'll try not to lord it too badly over the other one. I grinned to myself as my fingers flew over the keys. Maybe some comforting will be involved. This time, he took a little longer to respond. I like the sound of that, even better than the beer. Bloody mixed singles in light of the incident on our first date. It was probably why he hesitated. Just have to make sure our differences don't tear us apart like any other doomed romance. Declan obviously had no shame in acting like a sap or a geek. To quote in excess, they can never tear us apart. I wished I was at that stage, but it always took me a while. Like it took me a while to reply to the last message. Yeah, well, to quote Amy Mann, you're with stupid now. I could almost hear his laugh through the tips of his fingers. Stuck with stupid, more like. I couldn't help but laugh myself. For a while, at least. His reply was brief. Slightly insulting, but also sweet. Good night, stupid. And with what seemed to be my regular sign-off now. Good night, doofus. And as I closed up my phone again, I could hear Roger's indignant words replaying for me. No wonder you're always fucking single. Maybe I was getting ahead of myself, especially as some things with Declan were still obfuscated by his actions but perhaps I wasn't going to be for much longer. Chapter 8 So we need to have that talk. And that was how it started. It was Tuesday, and I had just gotten in from work. Monday night, I had come home from having to endure a meal with the family to find Declan had left me a message on my answering machine. I was disappointed he hadn't tried to reach me on my mobile, but it wouldn't have been easy trying to field his call at my folks' house either. I had thought it too late to call him back, as he would probably be training the next morning, and he must have been because he didn't call me at work. Hello to you too, I said, and that sounds really ominous. You might want to tone it down a little. Sorry, Declan replied. I just wanted to clear up this this thing between us, and, uh, hi. I nestled the phone between my ear and shoulder awkwardly as I spooned Fancy Feast into Maggie's bowl. So you've noticed the thing? How could I not notice the thing? Well, you were doing a good job of avoiding it. 
I threw the can back into the fridge and made my way to the lounge room. So were you. I was the injured party. Of course I had to wait for you to bring it up. I collapsed on the couch and used the arm as a shoe lever to prise the sneakers off my feet. They fell noisily upon the carpet. Declan was silent. I sighed. So talk to me, Deck. Somehow, all it took was this affectionate shortening of his name. I just couldn't do it right then. I hated myself for letting that part of me sneak through, but I guess like any human being, I needed that reassurance. Was it me? He laughed, and I felt like he had just skewered me with a meat fork. Wait, he said quickly. I wasn't laughing at you. It's just, I was going to say it's me when I realized how cliched it sounded. Relieved, I agreed with him. Yeah, it would have been. But it is me. It's stupid, and I'm embarrassed to tell you. Is that why you wouldn't tell me on the night? Declan paused. It's just that you want everything to go right on the first date. I shouldn't have been so stupid to... No, shut up for a minute. We had a great night, and believe me, I wanted things to go further. I wanted to scream, then why didn't they? But I bit my tongue. He stopped again, and I waited for him to continue. He didn't. Deck, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Well, I'm listening. I still feel bloody stupid. Well, I said, trying to sound wise. We're not going to get past that if you don't tell me, are we? It was the night before a match, he said finally, as if that explained everything. I waited for him to elaborate, but he didn't. And? I prodded him. Oh, come on. Surely you've heard about pregame superstitions. It finally dawned on me, and I burst out laughing. Now it was his turn to be butthurt. Hey, he protested weakly. It is a bit stupid, I told him. You don't get it. I tried to be fair. Hey, I'm that kind of guy. Sometimes. No, I don't. But it's all a bit arbitrary, isn't it? I mean, just because your coach tells you it probably builds up your stamina or something. I mean, I'm sure I recently read somewhere they did a study, and they proved that sex before a game has no effect on your ability to play it. Oh my god, will you stop? Cowed, I fell silent. Let me get a word in, huh? Declan asked. Shoot, I said, and couldn't resist adding, after all, you're not playing tomorrow. He sighed. Are you always like this? Please don't ever ask Roger or Fran that. They lie a lot. That elicited a chuckle out of him. So the answer is yes. You're impossible, you know that? I thought you were about to defend yourself. Back to serious mode. I wondered how he was sitting. Was he lying down like me, or was he upright, perfectly postured, conditioned into being so after years of rigid sportsmanship? I wished I could see him right now. Talking over the phone was fun but I would rather have been needling him in person. I know it's got nothing to do with how you'll play the game, he said hesitantly. It's just that the very first coach I had told me that, and it became a superstition for me. Like the guys who wear the same socks every game and don't wash them until the end of the season. I winced. At least yours is more hygienic. Yeah, believe me, you don't want to be around when they pull those fuckers off after a game. Can I ask you something? I picked at a stray bit of fabric on the couch arm nervously. Without you hating me? That doesn't sound good. You're not playing at the moment, so why does the superstition still stand? There was a long pause before he answered. It seemed like days that we sat there in silence with me beginning to sweat thinking that once again I had crossed the line. I'm still part of the team, aren't I? I nodded and remembered he couldn't see me. Of course you are. Then it still stands. Then I apologize for jumping you. 
The warmth was evident in his voice. If I remember rightly, I jumped you. That's right, you did. You know, maybe I should come up a day earlier than usual next time. I squirmed with anticipation at the thought, my dick starting to feel heavy. That could be good. I'll see what I can arrange. I couldn't believe it was still almost two weeks away. That's when it hit me. I was entering into long-distance relationship territory. And if it weren't hard enough maintaining a relationship with someone in the same city, I had decided to throw in the towel and see someone who had an entire sea between us. We said our goodbyes and promised to speak again soon. I should have been happy that everything had been sorted and things were right between us. But truth be told, I was now feeling a little sad. When I had been to dinner at my parents' house on Monday night, Mum, for some strange reason, had decided to ask, while serving the mashed potatoes, whether I happened to be seeing anybody at the moment. My dad's fork clattered against the plate as he dropped it, and Tim leaned in wolfishly to take delight in what might happen next. Even though my normal world was pretty much upside down and all over the place at that point in time, I played it safe. No. Dad picked up his fork again. Tim leaned back into his chair with a disappointed expression on his face. I thought that would be the last mention of my love life for the evening, but for some reason, Mum had a bee in her bonnet about the issue. But why not? She asked as she sat herself back down. I'm too busy at the moment, Mum, I said, using the same old excuse as always. I can hardly fit in everything I have to do for work to do anything else. Got enough time to hang out with Roger and Fran 24-7, Tim grumbled, obviously hoping he could goad me into making this family time a controversial one. Got enough time to go see Richmond play? I glared at his obvious attempt to remind Dad of the other reason I was a thorn in his side. Yeah, doofus, they're my best friends. I have to see them occasionally. Are we going to eat? Dad said uncomfortably. So you have enough time to see friends, but not a boyfriend? Tim asked deliberately. I wondered how many beers he'd had before I turned up. I used my peripheral vision to see how Dad was taking this. His knuckles were kind of white as he clenched his fork and used it to shovel peas into his mouth. Why are you so interested? I asked Tim. It's what families do. They ask shit, Tim replied. Timothy, Mum cried, whacking him over the hand with her fork. He winced and waved his fingers. I laughed. Boys, Dad said, act like adults. Tim has a new girlfriend, Mum said, desperate to keep the conversation flowing. Another one? I asked. What happened to the last one? Got bored, was his laconic reply. And they think my kind is promiscuous. We're going to have her over for a barbecue in a couple of weeks, Mum continued. Uh-huh, I said, already trying to come up with an excuse for why I couldn't attend. I just thought if you were seeing someone, you could, you know, bring them. It's funny how she resisted saying the word him, like his gender could be mistaken for the other one by any listener. Still, you had to give her an A for effort at least. Sorry to disappoint you, I said, really hoping this would just be the end of it. I'm not disappointed, Mum said kindly. Just it would be nice if you did, like your brother. It was nice that she meant it. Or apparently meant to mean it or hoped to mean it, which was at least practicing. Okay, that was a lot of oars. But if my brother was meant to be the epitome of coupled bliss, I was glad I was whatever I was at that point of time. No one will have him, Tim sniggered over his meal. I rolled my eyes but kept silent. There was no use in fighting it. I'm sure somebody will. Pass the gravy, please, was Dad's response. 
I did so and tried to imagine Declan being exposed to this situation, having Mom's earnest pawing at him to see if he was suitable husband material, coupled with Dad's steadfastly trying to ignore his gender and Tim trying to provoke any kind of reaction he could get out of him. Of course, it could be totally different as it would be Declan Tyler. Maybe they would just sit in open-mouthed awe and express shock at his inclination to like Dick, because that just wasn't meant to be possible with people like him. I couldn't even begin to imagine Declan meeting my folks, or me meeting his. It seemed even more impossible than me going out with Declan in the first place. So, really, stranger things had happened. After dinner, Tim sidled up next to me. So, you're really not seeing anyone? This amount of interest in my love life was really unnerving me. I said so, didn't I? Jesus, you're the most boring gay guy I know. Aren't I the only gay guy you know? I asked. He started reciting a list, and I zoned out. I came back to the real world just in time to hear him say, I mean, you should be getting some action. It's unnatural. You must have carpal tunnel just from jerking off. I went back to my happy place in which my brother refused to be so... so himself. And not long after that, I begged off coffee and dessert, citing work that needed to be done before morning. As I drove home, I wondered if I was being too hard on them. After all, I guess they were trying in their own way, although Dad could afford to be a trifle more accommodating. But in the end, they were what they were, and I was what I was. Somehow we would meet in the middle. I've never done the long-distance relationship thing. I mean, I found it hard enough doing the three suburbs away thing. But it really hit me hard over the next couple of weeks that was what I was doing. Declan and I spoke every day, getting to know one another. But somehow it still didn't seem real enough because we weren't actually together. You can find out a hell of a lot about a person by speaking to them for hours on end. But without the added intimacy of being able to see their expression or touch them, all the subtle intricacies of contact and closeness were non-existent. We may have well as been pen pals, and I wondered how it was that people could fall in love over the Internet. Maybe I just didn't get it. All I wanted to do was see him. But their next two games weren't in Melbourne. One was a home match, and one was in Darwin to try and popularize the game in the far north. It felt like I was in a relationship, but with none of the advantages. And yet, I was happy. I would have been happier if I could see him, but that's what you get for falling for an interstater. Luckily, work was busy. Nysa seemed to calm down when she saw that I wasn't going anywhere especially when I commissioned a local documentary maker to film the events of the festival. Her name was Alice Provotna, and she took her work very seriously. She had started trailing us around with a camera to get some behind-the-scenes footage. I became more adept at hiding around corners and behind stacks of film and tape canisters, while Nysa treated it as if it were her audition reel for Neighbors. I was only too happy to push her in front of the camera and let her take the limelight, as I occasionally berated myself for thinking that this was a good idea. Fran had already become an on-air victim when she wandered overboard one day and found herself having to reenact a scene with Nysa where we discovered one of our major sponsors had fallen through. Wow, that's really bad, she said flatly, staring right at the camera. Bad? Nysa gasped like a Victorian heroine finding some ghostly nun upon the bell tower of her gothic mansion. It's an abomination. It could well be the end of our festival. She turned her back on Fran, now becoming a modern-day soap star, about to begin a lengthy monologue while not at all facing the person she was speaking to. Fran looked at me, bewildered. I said, Oh, don't worry. We will find someone else. Honestly, I don't know who sounded more robotic. 
That's going to be one exciting documentary, Fran said as we fled into the safety of my office. I'm wondering if it's too late to pull the plug. It would be an abomination to do so, she teased. Luckily, Alice wasn't around all the time. We couldn't afford to keep her on call, for one thing. We arranged a series of important dates for her, and the office returned to some sense of normalcy, for a little while at least. Nysa and I ran all over town in a series of endless meetings to pick up more sponsors. I don't think there was one building on either Queen or Elizabeth Streets that we weren't in at some point, and we still had Collins and Bork to cover. At least it meant the fortnight began to pass quickly, and Declan and I were soon making plans to meet in person once again. So, the devils are in town this weekend? Roger said nonchalantly as we drank beer on his back porch, waiting for Fran to come home from work. Yeah, I think so, I replied, just as nonchalantly. Roger's eyes narrowed over the neck of his bottle. So you're not seeing Declan, then? Maybe. Depends if he has time. I am such a liar. You fucking liar. He knows me too well. Well, his schedule is pretty tight, I said defensively. Roger smothered his laugh. Oh, grow up, I glared at him, to no avail. Seriously, are you going to see him? Roger asked, trying to contain himself. Yes. Aha! Uh -huh. And when are we going to see him? That was almost enough to make me panic. You see him? Why would you be seeing him? Well, you're going to have to do the meeting the friends thing sooner or later. I hesitated. We haven't discussed that. At all? I shrugged. It hasn't come up. No repressed laughter at that line. Roger was in serious mode. Really? That's what I said. The thing was, we talked every day. But there were certain topics we navigated around. Like what we were going to do if this became really serious. How aspects of his life would affect what we could do together as a couple. Why we hadn't gotten to do the fun things new couples did. Like spend days in bed, with the only interruption being the delivery of pizza. Okay, so I had a bit of a one-track mind at the moment, but how could I think any further about the heavy stuff? You don't think you'll ever introduce us to him properly. Roger actually sounded a little hurt. Of course I will, I tried to assuage him. But will he do the same with his friends? I frowned and couldn't disguise it before Roger noticed. He won't? I shrugged. I don't know yet. But, Raj, I said calmly, drop it for now. But, please. My tone was firm. He wasn't happy, but he nodded. I wondered how long it would be until he brought up this potentially painful subject again. Somehow, I didn't think it was that far away. Fran emerged from behind us with a quiet tread that she often used to her own advantage. Okay, who died? Roger accepted her kiss and rubbed the small of her back. What? You two are being very quiet. What's going on? Nothing, we replied in unison. Fran shook her head. Fucking liars, I hate it when you do that. I need a beer. Make that too? I said, shaking my bottle at her. I could see the concern in her eyes but I smiled slightly and tried to alleviate it. It didn't work, of course, but Roger stuck to his word for the rest of the evening, and as a consequence, the subject of Declan Tyler was not referred to at all. Good news, Declan said. He was talking to me on his Bluetooth as he drove himself to the Hobart airport for his flight to Melbourne. I could use some, I said gloomily remembering the strained atmosphere at Roger and Fran's the night before. Why, what's wrong? Nothing, I said quickly. Come on. Just work, so tell me the good news. 
I've arranged to go back later than the rest of the team, so I have a couple extra days in Melbourne. That was good news. If I was involved, of course. But I had to play it cool. Do you have a party or something? Or something, he replied. I could hear the gentle prodding in his voice. I thought you might have liked to see me a bit more. Yeah, it'd be cool. You're a cold bastard, you know that? He asked, although once again there was laughter hidden behind his angst. You know I want to see you, so don't play dumb. Why not? Aren't footballers dumb? Only to wanky arseholes. There was a pause as I heard his indicator activate and then switch off. Look, I'm almost at the airport. I have training, but should be done by six again. Mind if I come over about seven? Sounds good. Do you have any food in the house? No, I don't eat. Of course I have food in my house. Well, I could bring food, save you from cooking. Who said I was cooking? That's why I said... I laughed. I could try subjecting you to what passes for cooking from me. Shall I bring takeaway just in case? He asked. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Gotta go, Simon. I look forward to both you and your attempt at cooking. I grinned as I closed my mobile. Then I immediately rang Fran at work to gain ideas of what would both be palatable and easy enough to make so that I couldn't possibly fuck it up. Fran had suggested pesto. I didn't want to admit I was uncomfortable with the idea of garlicky morning breath just in case something happened. And Fran, being extremely smart and prescient, guessed it without me having to try and arse about bringing it up indirectly and moved on to Indian. Then she discounted Indian in case of unwanted effects upon the gastric system. And not once did she tease me for my attention to every detail and possible scenario. You know once you've gone out a while, you stop caring about all this stuff, right? She asked me. Yeah, but in my defense, I remind you of how much Roger tried to hide all his faults from you when he first started going out with you. He didn't hide them well, she snorted. Hey, Simon, you going to let me in on what you two were fighting about before I came home yesterday? We weren't fighting. Well, something happened. He didn't tell you? No, and he was remarkably resilient at refusing to let me get it out of him. I wondered if he was actually worried that she might have told him off for trying to pierce my temporary shield of obliviousness. It was nothing, really. One of you will crack sooner or later and tell me. She was right about that. In the end, it was decided I would make stir-fried veggies and tofu with rice. It's nice and simple, Fran said, and you've made it before, so you can't possibly screw it up. Plus, it probably fits with whatever crazy football diet the coach makes them stick to during the season. I hadn't even thought of that. It was a good point. It's just going to add to him thinking that I'm a crazy, wanky, greeny, hybrid-driving hippie, I complained. Has he seen your bomb of a car? Fran asked in disbelief. Greenpeace arranges a protest every time it leaves your driveway. She had a point. I would have to make sure Declan took a drive in it soon enough. I left work early again. It's good to be the boss sometimes. Nysa was past suspecting me of going for interviews, although she tried to grill me for details once more about what I was up to. I told her to be grateful she was also leaving early, and she wisely collected her coat in silence and followed me out the door at a quarter to four. Fran said something about you were besotted with someone, she unwisely said as we were waiting for the lift. Who is it? I counted a three in my head before saying nonchalantly, You know, I think there's a pile of filing that you could probably be doing. She was probably teasing. After all, you don't go out, Nysa said quickly, punching the elevator button once again, in the hope that it would arrive immediately. I think so, I agreed. We got into the lift without any further incident. On the way home, I stopped off at a Safeway to pick up the ingredients for dinner. 
a bit of wishful thinking perhaps, but I also picked up a pack of condoms. Better to be prepared than unsafe or sorry. I lugged everything back onto the tram. I suppose I could have gone home and picked up the car and backtracked, but really, it was just as easy to do it this way. It was just past five when I got home. Declan would still be a practice, so I had plenty of time to start chopping the veggies, put the rice in the cooker, and get a quick shower before starting to piece everything together. I had never been so organized and time-efficient before. He sent me a text telling me he was on his way just as I was finishing dressing. I ran into the kitchen and began heating the walk. Now the nervousness began settling in. It had been two weeks since we had last seen each other, and I was filled with both anticipation and fear of the moment he would cross back over my threshold. But I didn't really have time to think about that at the moment, thankfully. Between Maggie wanting to be fed, timing when the tofu should be added to the veggies so it wouldn't fall apart, and then having to scoop some shit out of the kitty litter tray because she knew company was coming and wanted to mark her territory before their arrival, I was running around and starting to work up a sweat. Flustered was not a good look on me. I had just mixed vegetable stock and cornstarch together when my doorbell rang. Fuck, I whispered. I looked down at myself and realized I was covered in cornstarch. I dusted myself quickly and tried to walk calmly to the door. How bloody domestic. Maggie jumped on the couch arm, an expectant glare on her face as she was cognizant of the fact that the normal peace of the house was about to be disrupted. I peered through the burglar hole. It was Declan, and he looked as good as he always did. There was no bag hanging on his shoulder. Maybe I had been too presumptuous in buying condoms. I shook that thought out of my head and opened the door. Hey, you, Declan said, grinning at the sight of me. Hi, I said, as concise as usual with him. I moved aside to let him in, and he closed the door behind him. I found myself suddenly enveloped by him as he drew me in. Hey, he said again. You already said that. What the hell are you covered in? Cornstarch? You trying to be Jamie Oliver? I was going to make some crack about Nigella and filleting cucumbers, but couldn't because he was kissing me. And I suddenly became a hell of a lot more relaxed. I leaned further into him. I could almost feel the muscles of his stomach through the layers of clothes between us. This time it was me who stupidly said, Hey, when we pulled apart. He didn't say anything. He just gave me another kiss. I thought you were bringing food, I asked, pointing out his hands, that although now full with me, had been empty before he entered. I didn't want to insult your culinary skills, he said, still holding me close. I thought if we needed to, we could order pizza. Good call, I approved. Whatever you're making, it smells good. Stir-fry. Hey, wouldn't pizza be on the band during the season list? He winked at me. What the coach doesn't know doesn't hurt him. I guess that could cover a lot of things, such as knowing that his star player was currently pashing his sort of boyfriend at the moment. Declan had become distracted by Maggie, who instead of treating him like an invading enemy, had suddenly become wildly enamored of him and desperate for his attention. I knew how she felt. I don't think you formally introduced us, Declan said, and I liked how he bent down to pet her while still keeping one arm around me. Maggie, meet Declan, I said, although Maggie was now too enraptured with her new find to care anything about me and what I might have been saying. Hey, Maggie. Declan cooed. He instantly found her weak spot, scratching behind her left ear. She was now his for life, although he was momentarily in her bad books for letting her go and turning his attention back to me. So, do you call her that because it was so close to Moogie? I bit the inside of my lip, knowing he was about to give me shit. 
No, she's actually named after a character from George Eliot's The Mill on the Floss. Declan smothered his laughter. Oh, go on, give it to me. You know what my family's cat is called and why? No idea. Socks, because it looks like it has socks on its feet. So I named my cat after a literary character. Is that so bad? Nope, just something I like about you. Pretension? I asked rumpily. That's not how I would have put it. Stop being so defensive. There was nothing negative in his tone of voice, so for once in my life I listened to somebody else. It's a good book, all about how we try to make our own free will, but sometimes catastrophes are thrown in front of us and our lives become determined by them. It sounds heavy. Is there at least a happy ending? I winced. Maggie drowns, along with the brother she only recently reconciled with. Oh, for fuck's sake! Declan laughed. Let's eat. We moved into the kitchen, and Maggie followed, winding herself around Declan's legs. He tripped and fell against me, and I grabbed him. So much for the reflexes of a professional footballer. He gave me a playful shove and bent down to scoop the cat up out of harm's way. I added the stock mixture to the walk, and a satisfying cloud of steam erupted from it. Do you always cook? Declan asked. I shrugged. I try to get out of it as much as I can. Living by myself, it's mainly a diet of takeaway and toasted cheese sandwiches. You want a drink? I brought beer, Declan announced. He grinned when I looked at his empty hands again. I left them in the car. Stupid place for them, I told him. I'll be right back. He jogged back to the front door and disappeared outside. Maggie watched him go fretfully and looked back at me. You too, huh? I asked her. She replied in the affirmative by jumping from the stool Declan had placed her on and hovering over by the door, watching for his return. Yep, you too, I murmured, now throwing the tofu into the walk. Declan moved like a cat in more ways than one. I didn't even hear his tread when he returned and placed a cold bottle of beer against my hand. I ran my thumb along the raised glass of the neck that formed the familiar image. Beer from your home state, huh? He twisted the cap off his bottle and lobbed it perfectly into the bin. Yup, is it okay? I like Cascade, although probably more for the Tasmania Tiger than anything else. Declan grinned. Why aren't I surprised? Come on, you can tell me. Have you ever seen one while driving around late at night? I twisted the cap and threw it towards the bin, and was pleased that I made it. It turned out that, like Roger, he could raise one eyebrow. Have I seen an extinct animal in the suburbs of Hobart while driving around in the dark? Supposedly extinct, I told him before taking a swig of the crisp, malty goodness. No, I haven't. But if you throw a stone in Hobart, you'll more than likely hit someone who will claim they've seen one. I reached behind me into the cupboard and pulled out two plates. I think it's possible they could still be out there. Aren't there areas of wilderness that no human has stepped in? Not around where I live, Declan said dryly. You might have to venture out a little further. You've never wanted to do it. I take it you would. I nodded and set down my beer so I could start serving up dinner. Sure, trekking into the hills, going further than most people have ever gone into the wilderness, and then being rewarded with one undeniable look at a thylacine in its natural habitat? Declan grinned knowingly. And you would never tell. You would keep it a secret because you know if you didn't, even though it would bring you fame and fortune, especially if you had the photographic evidence. Letting the world know would mean their refuge would be destroyed by people wanting to see them. It would be best for you just to let that tiger fade back into the forest and remain a myth as it continues to survive and build its numbers. Damn, he had me pegged. And he could be poetic when he wanted to be. It would be the right thing to do. 
I was now becoming uncomfortably aware that this conversation could be serving as an allegory for something else altogether. Declan put his beer down and moved behind him. I was half expecting a cuddle, but he took the plates of food off me and delivered them to the table. I fumbled in the cutlery drawer and produced two pairs of chopsticks. I grabbed our beers and joined him. What would you do? I asked him. He took a deep breath and sat down. He looked up at me and smiled. Seeing as the last time we had anything to do with them, we wiped them out. I wouldn't want to be responsible for anything like what happened with the new lot. He reached for his beer. I clinked my bottle against his and smiled stupidly at him. What are we drinking to? he asked. Whatever. That's specific. How about wherever this takes us? We clinked our bottles together again and picked up the chopsticks to start eating. Declan handled his deftly, sending them out across his plate as if they were warriors seeking prey. Despite years of use, I still occasionally used mine as a spear rather than a utensil. This is really good, Declan said appreciatively. It's not that good, I said. You don't have to butter me up. He winked suggestively at me, and I quickly downed another mouthful of beer, which was thankfully beginning to work its magic upon me. This is exactly what I needed after training, he continued. They're testing me out to see whether I can return to the field this week. Do you think you will? I think I can, but of course I've been thinking that for the last month and they still haven't put me on. I stabbed at a piece of tofu. Well, they don't want to damage the goods after getting you back. Declan shrugged. I guess that's always a problem, that line between what a player needs and what the coaches decide is best. I thought it was interesting, his use of the word need. In the normal world, a worker wishes to be put out of commission for a little while in order to enjoy a holiday away from the strain of the office. But to somebody like Declan, where work also happened to be his passion, he must have felt, and continued to feel, pretty close to bereft for being kept away from it for so long. His easygoing expression slipped a little as he drank his beer, thinking about the possibility that he might not get what he wanted, needed, next week. Then it was gone again, so fast I wondered if I had imagined it. Are you still in any pain? I asked. He shook his head. It's a bit sore sometimes, but not painful. I think it's rusting from inactivity more than anything. I doubt it's inactive. I've seen you on the sports report. Have you really? He grinned at me. Hey, I can't help it if your ugly mug pops up every time I'm trying to find out the lineup for Richmond's next game. Declan laughed. And here I was thinking you kind of liked my mug. I shrugged. It's okay, as mugs go. Then I laughed and stared down at my plate. There was the sound of movement underneath the table, and I felt his foot pressing up against mine. It was a comfortable weight. So's yours. Declan began eating again. Wow. I was beginning to like hearing these sly compliments. I froze as Declan's foot crept up underneath the cuff of my right leg pants. He had kicked off his sneaker, and I could feel the warmth of his stocking foot against the hairs of my leg. He continued eating with an innocent expression on his face as his foot began rubbing toward my knee. I tried to collect some vegetables between my chopsticks, but my aim was unsteady, and a small pile of onions flew across the table to land close to Declan's beer. He grinned, but kept his momentum. I swallowed a mouthful of beer to steady my nerves and was disappointed when Declan's foot withdrew. I tried to think of something to say to fill the sudden silence when his foot was back against my skin. Except this time there was a difference. It was skin against skin. He had shucked his sock off, and I was now feeling the direct heat from his body transferring to mine. 
It was also having effects upon other areas of my body. He kept the foot in place, maybe just enjoying the simple contact. So, I said, trying not to let my voice crack. Declan put his chopsticks down and looked at me expectantly. It's Wednesday, I said weakly. He nodded, not giving anything away. You're not playing until Friday. Yup. Funny how that one little word sounded so full of promise. So your superstition won't be in effect until tomorrow? No, I guess not. There was a small smile playing about his lips. I wanted to kiss it off him. My curiosity got in the way of passion. How does that work exactly? I mean, does the superstition kick in at midnight, or is it just the general time frame of the night before? He looked adorably confused at my sudden change of tone. Uh, I don't know. It's just a superstition. There's no logic to it. But there must be a time frame, right? I guess. It's probably just the vicinity of the evening before and the day of the match. Huh. I sat back thoughtfully. Does that answer your question? I think it did, because the next thing I knew I had launched myself at him, and he was trapped in his chair as I squirmed up against his body, gripping his face in my hands as I kissed him. His arms pulled me in closer, and I noticed how they strained against the material of his shirt. I was no lightweight, but I bet he could pick me up and throw me across the room like a javelin. I crouched over him like a cat with a mouse, but suddenly I was pulled into his lap. That was more comfortable. Our kisses grew more heated and desperate. Dinner was forgotten. Well, we had almost finished anyway. Declan's hand crept up under my shirt and rested against the small of my back. While my mouth was still occupied with his, my brain stupidly went into overdrive and realized that this was it. It was going to happen, and those idiotic insecurities that normally came with any time two people are first intimate with each other came flooding over me, especially with Declan. The guy was going to have an amazing body. He was surrounded by astounding specimens of masculinity every time he met with his colleagues, and mine could never compare. But then I saw him staring back at me, and I saw that he wanted me. There was an unmistakable hunger in his eyes, and he was eyeing me appreciatively. I didn't really understand it, and it didn't settle my insecurities completely, but I managed to get over that bump in the road. Without speaking, we rose as one and stumbled out of the dining room, through the lounge, and paused as Declan realized he didn't know where the bedroom was. I took the initiative and pulled him with me, still clutching him. We sagged against the bookcase in my room. Declan's hands were starting to pull my shirt up my body, but I pressed against him, inhibiting his actions. This time it had nothing to do with the insecurity of being naked in front of him. I was now desperate, close to the edge, unable to hold on much longer. He gasped as I ground against him, searching for friction. I found it and his gasp turned into a guttural moan as I locked onto him and began getting us off. Simon, he moaned, and I liked hearing my name said that way. I pulled his lower lip between my own and then released it to lick along the side of his neck. I let my mouth rest against the hollow of his throat. Declan threw his head back. His hands came to rest on my arse as he helped me continue to thrust against him. Declan swore to himself, his breathing becoming more hoarse. I raised my head again and wanted to see his face in his most unguarded of moments. He bit his lip and closed his eyes. I kissed him and they flew back open. His breath erupted from him in a hot rush into my mouth and he sagged against me. I bucked against him slowly, letting him ride out his release. As he sighed contentedly and his breathing steadied, I kept eye contact with him and started thrusting again. 
He held me tighter. His eyes never off me until I cried out and fell against him. He continued to hold me, and his hands traveled up my back, rubbing softly. I buried my head in the crook of his neck as the post-orgasmic bliss gave away quickly to, Oh, fuck, what have I done? We didn't speak. The only sound in the room was both of us breathing heavily. We leaned against each other, sweating and disheveled, unwilling to let go, waiting for a second round. Second Quarter Chapter 9 It's past midnight, Declan murmured in the dark. Are you going to turn into a pumpkin now? I asked, giving his horrendous soul patch a slight tug. Ow! he moaned, grabbing the offending fingers and holding them tightly. Hey! I protested. And then I moaned as he began sucking on them slowly. As much as I didn't want to, I withdrew them and smacked him lightly on top of the skull. Hey, pumpkin boy! From the small amount of light coming through the window, I could see him looking offended. What? So it's midnight. Oh, yeah, no more playing. I thought you said it was only the evening before. He chuckled. You're insatiable. I didn't hear you saying no any time. But I feel pretty exhausted and a little bit sore now. And so was I. But just knowing he was here in my bed with me almost got me going again. I kissed him slowly and tenderly, and he responded eagerly. Christ, he moaned. What the fuck are you doing to me? It's reciprocal, believe me. Five hours ago, I had been wary of taking my clothes off before him. Now, I never wanted to put them on again. We lay skin to skin against each other, sticky, sweaty, happy. I never asked you before, he said, but I was hoping I could stay the night. Is that okay? I laughed and nuzzled his shoulder, the hair on his chest tickling my chin. Yeah, I guess so. He looked over his shoulder at the pile of messed up and crumpled clothing next to the bed. I really need to wash those, so I'm somewhat presentable at my parents tomorrow. At least you brought clean socks and jocks, though, I asked. Yeah, but I didn't think you were going to make me mess my jeans, he complained. Dirty pillow talk is so hot. Sorry, couldn't help it. I didn't want to leave the bed, but I scrambled over him. While my arse was up in the air, I received a sounding slap on it. Hey! I cried out. Declan laughed. Where are you going? To put these clothes in the wash? Do you have a dryer? I live in this city, don't I? You can't survive here without one. You seriously couldn't. Melbourne had a long reputation for being a city that experienced all four seasons in one day. You could never rely upon the weather report. He grabbed me around the waist. Maybe I don't want you to leave. I retaliated by digging him in the ribs. Stay in bed, do my laundry. What am I, your maid? He spoke directly into my ear, his warm breath and invitation. You can be whatever you want. Hold that thought. I ground against him and he moaned but I slipped out of his grasp and deftly scooped up all of our clothes in one move while heading out of the bedroom and towards the laundry. Tease? he yelled after me. As I made my way through the lounge, Maggie watched me disapprovingly from her position on the couch. She had been locked out of the bedroom during our shenanigans, and she was not happy. Sorry, baby, I whispered. I gave her a quick rub behind the ear, and her tail twitched dangerously. In the small laundry behind my kitchen, I threw the clothes in the washer, chucked in the powder, and slammed the lid shut as quickly as possible in order to race back to bed. When I turned around, Declan stood behind me. 
In the full light, he was even more fucking hot and beautiful. Declan Tyler, naked in my laundry. Now that's even better than your calendar shot, I said before I could censor myself. You've seen my calendar shot, he grinned, looking slightly bashful. Dude, it was splashed over every newspaper. Why the fuck did they make you wax, though? And now he really did look bashful. Uh, apparently woman like a smoother body. They don't know what they're missing. Please, let's stop talking about the calendar. Why? It's embarrassing. I didn't even want to do it in the first place. He moved closer to me and took my hand, leading me back to the bedroom. Why not? I asked. It was for a good cause. Back in the bedroom, he pulled me onto the bed and lay on his back, using my shoulder as a pillow. I wasn't comfortable doing it, being on display. But it was when I was first starting, and I didn't feel like I could say no. But you can say no now? I'm in the position where I can, yeah. Bet they were disappointed. I make a donation to them every year instead of doing it. I found myself stroking his hair as we lay together looking at the ceiling. I bet you sales have plummeted. He laughed. I remember you saying a while back you didn't think my ego needed to be stroked. I also told you that I tell the truth. So would you do it? What? Pose in a calendar for charity. His hand traveled down and rested upon my knee. No way! His thumb caressed the flesh of my knee. Hypocrite. Nobody would buy a calendar with me in it. Declan rolled over, resting his arms upon my chest. I would. Great, I would sell one copy. He kissed me. No, I'd buy a few. Fuck, I was ready for him again. Shut up, or else I'll make you defy your superstition. But his fingers were traveling down my body, a trail of desire leaving my mouth dry. I thought I said evening, didn't I? My eyes rolled back in my head, and I managed to grunt out, As long as we make it clear. Declan silenced me by arching up and kissing me again. Afterwards we showered and I threw the now clean clothes into the dryer. Declan helped me strip the bed, and we remade it with fresh sheets before falling beneath the covers, dead with exhaustion. Good night, I whispered, but there was no answer from him because he was already asleep. The sun was glaring in my eyes. I rolled over to find Declan's side of the bed empty. I know, it sounds really girly, but I wanted to wake up with him. Although disappointed, I wasn't acting stupid enough to wonder if the previous night's events were all just a dream or a fevered fantasy. I pulled on a pair of trackies and a hoodie and padded quietly out to the lounge. Maggie was sitting in the window, looking out into the garden. I peered through the blinds and saw that Dex's car wasn't in the driveway. Puzzled, I looked around to see if he left a note but there wasn't one. Strangely enough, the table had been cleared and the dishes were stacked neatly in the sink. I sure as hell hadn't done it, so I could only assume he had. I went through the motions of starting a pot of coffee, wondering what it all meant. If he was going to fuck and run, he wouldn't have cleaned up. But he would have left a note if he wasn't. None of it made any sense. Of course, it did five minutes later when I was morosely sipping at a cup of coffee and heard the sound of a car pulling into the driveway. Maggie mewed a warning, and I petted her absent-mindedly as I stood behind her to look out into the garden once more. It was Declan. He jumped out of the cab of the SUV and reached back in to pull out a couple of brown paper bags. I hurried back to the table and sat down again, trying to look nonchalant. I heard him fumbling at the front door with keys, and he stumbled through trying to balance everything. Hey, he said cheerily, catching sight of me. 
Morning. You sleep like the dead, you know that? This was true. He noted my expression and asked, Did you think I had abandoned you? No, I scoffed, but neither of us was fooled. Declan made his way over to me and dumped the bags on the table. I bought breakfast. He leaned down and kissed me. You're not a morning person, are you? I cleared my throat so it wouldn't sound rusty. Not really. Do you want a coffee? Sure, thanks. We moved together throughout the kitchen, me making him a cup of coffee, him finding plates and utensils. It was all bizarrely domestic and easygoing. In fact, Declan was acting right at home, as if he had been doing this with me for months instead of it being a new experience for him. I found this great little cafe just down the road, he said, sounding a bit muffled as he was investigating the cupboards. You probably already know it, the Tin Man? Yeah, it's a good place. Great muffins. I nodded, realizing I didn't really know how he took his coffee. He was on the ball. He swept past me on the way back to the table. White with one, thanks. As I poured the milk and stirred the coffee, Declan pulled open the bags and started placing containers on the table. Wow, you went all out, I said appreciatively, joining him at the table. He had. Turkish bread, omelets, muffins, hash browns, bacon, and mushrooms spread across the table. Being an athlete, he had an appetite to match, but he also had the table manners of a girl who had attended finishing school. Declan grinned, noting I was watching him. They make us attend etiquette classes, in case you're wondering. He was starting to make me feel like trailer trash as he deftly smeared his Turkish bread with butter and nibbled at it daintily. Boy, they're really taking it seriously. He shrugged. There's been too much trouble with other teams. They think if they enforce manners classes and public relations training that things will improve. It can't harm it, can it? I began piling omelet onto the bread and sawing away at it. But you've always stayed pretty much out of all that kind of crap. The partying and that, I mean. He shrugged. It's not my thing. Oh, it was at first, and I got a bit carried away with it but it didn't take me long to see we can act like fucking idiots when we get on the piss in a big group. Anybody can. Yeah, but they think they can get away with it, because most of the time they do. The clubs always manage to cover up about 90% of their indiscretions. I looked at him thoughtfully and swallowed before speaking. So what made you so sensible? He grinned. Because my mum would kill me if I act like a fucktwit. She almost had to. And all the other players don't have mothers? Declan shrugged. I guess some of them don't listen to theirs. I couldn't decide if that was cute or slightly edible. Anyway, I'm not the only one. A lot of them are really good guys. Like Abe Ford? Abe was the captain of the Devils and from what the papers said, he and Deck shared a fine bromance. Abe? Abe's one of the best. Abe? Abe's one of the best. The best, actually. I was already slightly jealous. What time do you have to leave for work? Declan asked. I looked at the clock above the fridge. Shit, in about half an hour. I have to go to Etihad for a team meeting. I can drop you off in the city. That buys me a little more time, I said, reaching for a muffin. I'm going to grab a shower if that's okay. Sure, I stood up, still holding the muffin. Come with me, I'll grab you a towel. He followed me back to the hall, where I opened the linen cupboard and passed him what he needed. Don't you need a shower? he asked. Yeah, but you can go first. He reached out and stroked my arm. Aren't you a greenie? Shouldn't we conserve water and share? That? 
was a pretty good idea, actually. To save time, I stuffed the muffin in with the other towels and followed Declan to the bathroom. So what are your plans for the rest of the day? I asked as we headed toward the city. Declan glanced into the rearview mirror as he changed lanes. Meeting, practice, press conference, dinner with my parents. Wow, that's pretty packed. I'd like to see you tonight, he said regretfully, but I promised my folks I'd see them. You could always come over after, I said, trying not to sound too eager. I don't think I could resist you if I came over tonight, he replied in all seriousness. That bloody superstition. I tried to laugh it off. Yeah, I'm pretty irresistible. His hand rested briefly on my knee between the changing of gears. You are. I stared out the window, hiding my smile. And tomorrow I have the game, he continued. But remember how I told you I was trying to stay on another day or so? I managed to arrange it. I looked back at him. Really? Yep. We had now entered the city and were making our way down Flinders Street. That's great, I said, because I couldn't really think of any other way to express how bloody fantastic I thought it was. We crossed down to Elizabeth Street, and it was only a matter of moments before we were at my building. I'll call you before then, he said, but I'll be seeing you on Saturday. If you're free, of course. I think I should be, I said, my mind too muddled to remember if I had anything planned or not. Richmond was playing away this week, so there wasn't a game to go to. Well, pencil me in, he said with a smirk. I'll ink you in, I told him. I almost had door-to-door -door service as he pulled quickly into the emergency bay just down from my building. As car horns started honking between us, I threw him a quick look. I had a great night, he said. Me too. I can't wait for Saturday. I realized that might have sounded just a little sleazy, so my mouth did the usual trick of letting my foot insert itself. And not just for the sex part, just because I like seeing you. I see you've been working on your compliments, he chuckled. I wanted to kiss him goodbye, and I got the feeling that he wanted to as well, but there was no way we could. I grabbed his hand quickly and squeezed it gently. He smiled and stroked his thumb over the back of my hand. Bye, Simon. I'll call you. Bye, Deck. I got out of the car, and he sped off in an effort to stop the honking of the impatient drivers behind him. I watched his SUV slow down at the traffic lights and then execute a hook turn as he turned past Flinders Street Station and continued in the direction of Etihad Stadium and out of my sight. I could almost have believed that the previous night had been a dream. The workday continued on as normal, except for Roger and Fran being ushered into my office by NYSA. Roger didn't even work in the city so I knew that a special trip had been made on his behalf. What are you doing here? I asked bluntly. Boss needed someone to deliver stuff to Bork Street, and I volunteered, he said without an ounce of shame. So I thought I would take up lunch with my wife and best friend. You hate delivering stuff, I replied. It was true, he always tried to get out of it because he couldn't be bothered signing out the work car and dealing with the paperwork that followed. He shrugged. I also wanted the goss. Fran, his partner in crime, giggled. There is no goss, I said, slamming the manila folder I was holding shut and chucking it on my desk. Liar, they accused in unison. That's cute, I snarled. Come on, your fake bad mood is showing, Roger said good-naturedly. Come to lunch, my shout. His shout? Man, he really wanted to know. Never turn down a free meal, I said reluctantly. 
That's my boy, Roger grinned. He didn't really get his money's worth. I skimped on a few of the details. But that was the Roger Reader's Digest version I was giving. Pretty light on the graphic smut. I was sure that Fran would try to get those gaps filled in for her own special extended mix later on. So, Roger said, mouth slightly agape. It could be getting serious, then. Fran slapped him gently. The man went out especially and bought him breakfast the morning after. It's the sensitive guy way of getting flowers for another guy. I liked her spin on things. Roger huffed to himself. I would have thought that would have been beer. I said sensitive guys, Roger. Sensitive is such a dirty word, I said. It makes him sound wrong. Well, you can be a sensitive guy sometime, Fran said casually. Roger burst out laughing. Simon? Who came home with a second Hawthorne scarf because of him? Fran pointed out, and Roger fell silent. Her ha sounded like one of true vindication. I shifted food around on my plate with a fork and pretended that I wasn't there. So what's next? Fran asked, undoubtedly happy for me. He's arranged a couple of extra days off this week in Melbourne, so I'll see him again this weekend. Cool, Fran said, and she did look very pleased for me. Roger, however, scowled. And after that? I pointed my fork at him. We had a deal. A deal for that day, he pushed. No, I believe the words I used were for now. And how long does that specify? A day? A week? A month? Forever? It just means for now, I said stubbornly, until I decide. You can't have it that way. Says who? Me. Fran's eyes were darting between the two of us like she was at the Australian Open. So, is this what you guys were fighting about? No, we answered at the same time. Wow. You aren't at all transparent. Roger and I glared at each other. I had a bad feeling this issue wasn't going to die between us, and, quite frankly, I was pissed off that he was taking up arms for me over the matter. I was an adult, and, quite frankly, I was pissed off that he was taking up arms for me over the matter. I was an adult. I had made the decision to take this relationship as it came. It wasn't up to Roger to start making judgments on what was right or wrong for me. I threw my fork down on my plate and stood. I've got to get back to work. Simon, Fran said. But I shook my head and laid some money next to my plate to cover my part of the bill. See ya, I said brightly, too brightly, and left the restaurant without looking at either of them. I heard Fran call my name once more, but I continued on back out to the street and made my way back to the office. I hadn't even been able to look Roger in the face. I was so angry that I was scared about what might have happened if I did. Everyone always says they want you to be happy. Then when you become happy, they resent it in some form or another. They nitpick to make you feel uncomfortable and question everything. I wasn't stupid. I knew what I could be committing myself to by continuing to see Declan. But the guy was really growing on me. And that was an understatement. Roger's constant needling of me made me feel like hating him, but I could never hate Roger. I could be mad as hell and hold a mean grudge, though. The truth was he only questioned things I didn't really want to think about at this point in time. I wanted to revel in this newfound happiness before reality managed to crush the spark and grind it into the ground with its usual steamroller antics. Nysa was out at lunch when I made it back, the sign on the door saying somebody would be back in an hour. 
I still had twenty minutes of relative peace if nobody called me. I left the sign on the door, grabbed a Coke from the fridge, and turned on the television in my office. I managed to find a news update, and, as always in our fair country, it was centered on sport. As I had been expecting, Declan's face flashed up on the screen. He was sitting behind his coach, Scott Frazier, with a bank of television and radio microphones before them. The backdrop to their table was the Devil's logo. Declan's face was set in stone as Frazier talked for him. With the full go-ahead from the doctors, we are pleased to announce the return of Declan Tyler to the game this weekend. Even through the television screen, I was almost blinded as the reporter's flashes went off in conjunction with the appearance of a smile on Declan's face. I felt happy for him and wished I could have been there to tell him so. He was getting his dream back. I got out my mobile to text him and offer congratulations, but it sprang to life in my hand as someone was calling me. It was Roger. I grimly pressed reject and had no qualms doing so, for the moment. I navigated the menu to start writing my message when the screen disappeared with Roger trying to call me again. Reject, once again. This time he got the hint. I fired off a quick message to Declan and grinned to myself as I heard the unmistakable sound of a received message being picked up by the microphones at the press conference. Declan remained still. Maybe he was anticipating a slew of such messages. Of course he would be. The office phone rang. I startled slightly and pondered who it could be. It obviously wasn't Declan. He was still talking to the reporters. I couldn't risk picking it up in case it was Roger. We both might say things we would really regret later. Best to let it go to the messenger service but there was the sound of Nice's keys in the door. Can you get that Nice? I yelled. Sure. And I heard her picking up the phone with her usual cheery greeting. Moments later, she had stuck her head in the door. Fran's online, too. I tore my eyes away from the screen, where stock footage of Declan in his pre-injury days was running. I couldn't help but notice the now familiar roll of his hips was taking on a new significance to me. Can you take a message? Luckily for me, rather than jumping to the conclusion that I was fighting with my friends, Nysa noticed the television and rolled her eyes at my inability to stop watching football long enough to speak to Fran. Okay. Thanks. I knew I wasn't fighting with Fran but she would be playing the dutiful wife and trying to sell Roger's better points to me in an effort to make me forgive him. And I couldn't really listen to that right now. On the screen, Declan was running in slow motion, and they had faded back to the press conference. He and Fraser were now standing and making their way back to the change rooms, while the cameras and their flashes ineffectually tried to capture their every move. I switched off the television and suddenly felt very lonely. Half an hour later, a text arrived from Declan. Still can't believe it's finally happening. Funny, I thought the same thing, although for different reasons. It was only a few seconds before another came through. Wish I could see you tonight, but you know the rules. Looking forward to Saturday. I might even watch the Richmond game with you. Guiltily, I thought of Roger. But it wasn't like they were playing Hawthorne this weekend anyway, so it wasn't guaranteed that we'd be watching it together. Even though we almost always watched some football game on the telly with each other every weekend. My mobile buzzed again, impatient with another message. Speak of the devil, and by that I didn't mean Declan. It was from Roger. Are you avoiding me? I thought about it a minute and then sent a tierce reply in the affirmative. He didn't respond. I think he got the message. It didn't make me feel any better, though. I chewed at my thumbnail, stared out the window, and waited for the workday to end.
Chapter 10 I tossed and turned most of Thursday night, thinking of Declan at his parents' house and wondering what they really knew about their son and his private life. I couldn't help but try to imagine what they might think of me if they ever met me, which, if truth be told, seemed to be a moot point anyway. I wasn't sure if it was merely the moment or the whole of the unforeseeable future. When I wasn't thinking of Declan, I was thinking of Roger. I felt justifiably pissed off and also slightly ashamed of how I had reacted to him. Roger and I had never fought for long periods of time, but I had never felt so resentful of him before. There are times when you have to suck it up and let your friends do what they have to do, even if you know it's the wrong course of action to take. Fuck knows I had done it with Roger before. I had said my piece initially and then kept my trap shut until it was time to help him pick up the pieces. That was what I needed for him to do for me right now, but he wouldn't grant me the same favor in return. As I got off my tram at the corner of Collins and Elizabeth Streets, I saw Fran on the opposite side of the road, heading up from Flinders. She must have caught the train rather than the tram, which she only ever did if she was running late. I wanted to run over and catch up with her, but my feet failed to move. I watched her disappear within her building and made my way to my own. Nysa was biting her fingernail and studying an unruly file full of papers when I walked into the office. Hey, she said without looking up. Alice Provotna called. She wants to film you today. I groaned. It's not on the schedule. She won't be able to make it on Monday, so she's coming today. But there's nothing for her to film today, really. Nysa slapped the file shut. Well, she'll get a realistic depiction of the office, then. Nice. Oh, and Roger rang. He wants you to call him back. It sounded urgent. I managed to stop myself from making a dismissive huff and just nodded before walking into my office. The day passed relatively smoothly, although I was a bit troubled by the fact that Roger never called back again and that Fran didn't even try once. I know that I had taken the step of ignoring them in the first place, and it was extremely hypocritical of me to get upset when they started doing the same. But I now felt that as I supposedly had the upper moral hand, I couldn't cave in. Yeah, I know, you don't have to say it. The interview with Alice was a perfunctory one, at least on my end, and I was glad of it. It was a series of questions dealing with how it could take all year for a festival that only took place for a couple of weeks towards the end of the year. Basically, it was me justifying my job. Seeing as I had a performance review with the board every year, I felt I could do it by rote. I knew my answers would be sliced into sound bites and probably used as voiceovers with different bits of footage throughout the doco, so I made sure they were serviceable and tried not to sound too bored. Alice tried not to look too bored as she hovered over her camera and asked the questions. Declan sent me a brief text during lunch, and I wished him luck for the game. Even his text sounded preoccupied and stressed about what might happen that night. He sounded like a man staggering under the weight of expectation, and I wished there was something I could have done for him. But there wasn't anything I could do. By the time of our customary knockoff for Bog Off to the Pub Fridays, I was ready to call it a day. As Nysa hovered in the doorway, I waved her on. I can't make it tonight, I told her. Tell the guys I said sorry. She slumped into the chair opposite me. You're not coming? I can't, sorry. Why not? I started throwing things I didn't even need into my messenger bag so I wouldn't be hooked by her imploring look. I have things to do. Yeah, like coming to the pub, she asserted. You never miss the pub on Friday. Well, I have to today. But why? I told you I have things to do, I said, vaguely. What things? Give it a rest, nice. 
She glowered, her light eyes suddenly seeming dark, which was kind of scary. Are you fighting with Fran? Wrong person, but close. No, why? I saw her on the street during my break. She seemed remarkably vague about you when I said something. Great. Now Nysa thought she was a private dick. I'm not fighting with Fran. Is this about your secret boyfriend? I knew I must have been turning red, because I could feel the heat rising in my treacherous face. Even though this had nothing to do with Declan. Nothing. Well, not directly. I don't have a secret boyfriend, I lied. Unsuccessfully, I'm sure. Uh-huh. Private Dick Nysa saw right through me. I couldn't even use him as an excuse, because Nysa would probably say something to Fran and Roger about it at the pub, and the last thing I needed was them thinking they were being ditched for the boyfriend. Nothing stirs up bad blood between the friends and the partner, like being dumped in a blatant display of favoritism. So I trotted out Old Faithful. Of course, you could do one more ring around of the sponsors. Nysa gathered up her bag. Gotta go if I don't want to miss the tram. At this time of day, there was one every six minutes. Have a good weekend, Nice. The slamming front door was her reply. Great. I was losing friends at a substantial rate, and I had only myself to blame. Rather than breaking out the world's tiniest violin to play an ode to myself, I turned off all the lights in the office and locked the doors behind me. I was just getting off the tram and walking towards my house when a message sounded on my mobile. Opening it, I saw it was from Roger. You're not even coming to the Napier. No balls, Simon. Ouch. I was definitely pushing it too far. I hoped my response would come across as somewhat conciliatory. I just can't handle it tonight. I'll call you tomorrow. There was no reply from him. I kicked off my boots as soon as I got inside and sought sanctuary within my bedroom. Maggie was stretched out upon the bed. I fell upon it next to her and buried my face in her fur. I woke up unexpectedly in the dark. Maggie had, in the meantime, fled for safer ground. I stumbled groggily into the lounge room and turned on the Devils and Bombers game. It was only the pregame banter, so I called Maggie and realized she was on the chair behind me. Once she was fed, I grabbed a beer and collapsed onto the couch. The eagerly awaited return of star midfielder Declan Tyler. My body sprang into action unbidden sitting me up and pushing me forward, as if that distance of two extra inches would allow me to see the television more clearly. The footage switched to Declan in the change room, togged out in devil's orange and green, as he nervously batted a football between both of his hands. Someone spoke to him off camera. He nodded and moved toward another player, and they started handballing between themselves. That is a man who is holding the entire weight of a team's hopes on his shoulders, said one of the commentators. Let's hope it isn't too much for him. His colleague did the faux wince to the camera. If anything, Tyler has proved in the past that he is more than capable of supporting his team. It's his body that's the problem. I don't know. I thought it was an exceptional body. For altruistic reasons, of course. Tyler is probably the most injury-prone player in the past decade of AFL, the first commentator agreed. The footage switched back to Declan. The team was now in a circle, with coach Scott Fraser in the middle. It was time for the pre-game litany of go out there and win. No, do your best. They were the devils. They had to act like such. Blah, blah, blah. It would have perhaps been more inspiring if they weren't so close to the bottom of the ladder. Let's hope he remains injury-free tonight, Commentator 2 said in his overly ingratiating tone. I hoped for Declan's sake he would as well. They rested him at halftime. Declan kicked two glorious goals over the first quarter, but by the start of the second, the strain on his body was starting to become apparent. 
The commentators were very pleased with themselves, having predestined a potential tragedy unfolding on the ground they could talk about endlessly. What was meant to be Declan Tyler's night of triumph has quickly turned into one which we've seen all too often before, the annoying one said, his arch smile threatening to split the screen in two. It was official before the third quarter even began. Declan was out of the game being rested upon the advice of the team doctor. Although he hadn't done any further damage to his knee, it was obvious to everybody that he couldn't play on. We brought him back too soon, the team doctor said on camera. The footage cut back to the two commentators of the game, who shook their heads with seasoned perfection. As the third quarter siren sounded, the cameras cut away to a dejected Declan sitting on the bench staring blankly out onto the ground where his teammates continued to play without him. I just knew that would be the picture all over tomorrow's sports pages in the papers, with some pithy caption designed especially to twist the knife in further, rather than a photo of his body stretched triumphantly as he booted in one of his two goals. I wanted to call him, but I knew I couldn't. And that was when it hit me for the first time. A girlfriend probably would have been able to do so, with no questions asked. But a male, who wasn't an immediate family member? That would just look strange. Mind you, a girlfriend would probably already be at the field, doing the loyal partner thing. The footballer's wife. And I was no posh spice. Devil's advocate always nagged at me, though. If I were Declan, don't laugh. Roger would certainly be calling me at this point of time, and we weren't fucking. But I guess that's always the guilt and secrecy of the gays masquerading as straight. It was too late at night for my thoughts to be this heavy. In the end, the devils lost again. As they walked off the field, the reporters attacked them in waves, most making a beeline for Declan. Stony-faced, he mumbled brief answers that gave very little away. Declan, how do you feel after tonight's game? Crap, of course. Declan, do you think you'll be able to play next week? It's up to the coach. And that was the last bit of footage they showed of him. The Devils seemed to restrict entry to the change rooms because there was a crossover to the Bombers' victory song in their room. And that was where the camera stayed for the rest of the broadcast. If I had to find a bright side at least my parents would be happy. I stayed up a couple of hours after that, just in case Declan called. He didn't. I was woken by the ringing of my mobile at about half past two. Hello? I mumbled, still in that stage between coma and the shot of adrenaline you get when your phone goes off in the early morning and you automatically expect some form of tragic news. Simon, sorry to wake you. It was Declan. I immediately sat up. Hey, Deck. Stupid question, how are you? His voice sounded slightly shaky. Yeah, not so good. I wanted to call you earlier. I wish you had. Damn, I should have done it. I only just got out of the debriefing with the coaches and the doctors. What did they say? He hesitated. What is it? I could now feel the worry starting in me. Do you mind if I come over? No, of course not. Cool. I'll see you soon. I closed my mobile and sat there groggily for a few moments. I stumbled back into the lounge and turned on the heater as it was freezing in there. I wasn't sure if either of us wanted coffee, but it felt good to be going through the motions of making a pot anyway. With the sound of the water hissing through the grounds in the coffee filter and then spitting into the carafe, I sat on the couch and promptly fell back asleep. I woke again at the sound of Declan knocking on the front door and the smell of freshly brewed coffee perking up my senses. Declan still looked just as unhappy as he had on the television. Hi, he said. He sounded like saying one syllable required too much exertion for his body. 
I pulled him into the house and into my arms while simultaneously kicking the door shut with my foot. He didn't shy away from my hug. In fact, he welcomed it. Instinctively, years of living with my mother kicked in. Obviously, if you're upset, you need food. You must be hungry, I told him. I could make something. I also put on coffee if you want coffee. Do you want coffee? He gave a slight laugh. Coffee would be good. It was three in the morning. Coffee might not be good. But, hey, it wasn't exactly like I had Horlicks in the house. We weren't ready for our seniors' cards yet. Declan sat down on the couch, his long legs stretched out straight in front of him, which I realized was in order to take pressure off of his knee. However, I was also concerned by the fact his hands remained jammed deep into his pockets in a defensive position. That must have been a long meeting, I said amiably as I prepared our drinks. Yeah, they wanted to go over every possible scenario, he replied glumly. I handed him his coffee. Do you want a cushion or something to elevate your knee? He shook his head and took a grateful gulp from the mug. I'm wearing a compression bandage, thanks. Is it uncomfortable? I sat beside him. No, you get used to it pretty quickly. Feels weirder when it's off, once you get used to it. Bet you won't be saying that once you get it off. He gave me a small, tired smile. Probably not. So what did they talk to you about for so long? I wasn't sure if I should be prying, but I hoped he felt like he could tell me to shut up if he wanted me to. Declan wrapped both hands around his mug, using it for warmth. Just plans, plan A, plan B, all the way through plan Z, part 4. All the possible ways to fix me and all the possible contingencies should they fail. Sounds fucking clinical. I couldn't help but say. You got that right. He sighed. It is. They were sitting there talking to each other rather than me. As if I didn't have a say in it. I bet you didn't put up with that. He bit his lip and looked even more defeated. To tell you the truth, I did. I was so fucking miserable by that point, I didn't care one way or another. That did it. I put down my mug and swung myself over to his side of the couch. Scoot. He leaned forward and I squeezed in behind him, my legs uncomfortably splayed on either side of his. He leaned back into me and I wrapped my arms around him. So what's plan A then? I murmured into his ear. Declan's hands rested over mine. Intensive physio. I'll probably be off for another couple of weeks before they decide to try me out again. I kissed the back of his neck. Don't let this get you down too much. I know that's easy for me to say that, but getting depressed will make it worse. It is easy to say. He agreed, but he didn't sound mad. He leaned his cheek against mine, using the crook of my neck as a pillow. I wish there was something I could do for you, I said, feeling as helpful as a calculator in an English exam. You are, he murmured. It was a big concession to make, and I didn't ruin the moment by trying to get further clarification. Even though my legs were aching, I closed my eyes and found sleep wanting to take me as Declan's body warmth seeped into my own. I was vaguely aware of hearing a slight snore come from him before I probably added to it. I jerked awake with a massive leg cramp that had me leaping over Declan and almost causing him to fall to the floor. He mumbled something incomprehensible as I jumped around in the middle of the lounge room, hissing a litany of fuck, fuck, fuckity, fuck, fuck, fuck. Declan shakily got to his feet and approached me. Left or right? Fuck, 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 right, fuck, fuck, fuck. He couldn't help grinning as he grabbed my hip with one hand to keep me in one spot and then ran his other down my calf. I leaned on his shoulder, trying to resist the urge to start jumping around again as pain shot up and down my leg. 
He began rubbing my calf gently, and I think it was probably the psychological effect of his ministrations more than anything else that made me calm down as I started to feel my muscles relax. You trying to beat me in the bad leg stakes? Declan laughed, his second hand now traveling down my leg to begin working in unison with the other. Yes, my night cramp is jealous of your million-dollar injury, I said, embarrassed I had made such a spectacle of myself. Way to go, drama queen. Feeling better? he asked, looking up at me. I nodded. Thanks. I helped him back to his feet. I just realized, he said slowly, I haven't done this tonight yet. We kissed, long and deep and hungry. But there was no denying we were too tired to take it any further. Better late than never, I murmured. And I realized I really needed to pee. I ran to the bathroom without another word. When I finished and came back out, Declan was in my bedroom and undressing. I hung back for a moment and couldn't help but perv as his clothes fell away until he stood in only his boxers and began turning down the bed. I walked around. I walked around to jump in beside him. You have too many clothes on, he complained. I let him pull my t-shirt over my head, and he kissed my shoulder. His hands tugged at my trackies until they were caught around my feet, and I gracelessly kicked them out of the side of the bed. That's better, he said with a smile. My body tried to suggest I was ready for action, but sleep was more insistent for both of us. I don't even remember how the bedside light got turned off. The sun was warm on my face, and Declan was even warmer curled up beside me. We stayed in bed the whole morning, sometimes with coffee, sometimes playing around, and the rest of the time napping from our exertions. At one point, while Declan was asleep, I ran out onto my front lawn, knowing that the paper would have been delivered. I kicked the offending object until it was concealed underneath a bush, where its articles on Declan's short return to the field would not be seen by him. The rest of the day stretched before us beautifully and the night promised even more. I stretched blissfully when I woke again around midday and watched Declan as he slept. The lines of stress on his face from only hours before seemed to disappear during the downtime. I ran my thumb gently over his lower lip and his eyes opened. Sorry, I said, not having meant to wake him. It's okay, he said. He looked over my shoulder at the alarm clock. Shit. We've still got the whole afternoon. He grabbed me quickly before I could defend myself and rolled over onto me, grinding me down into the mattress. As much as I would love to keep you here all day, I think I have to prove I like you for more than sex. I shook my head and laughed. I'm not a girl. Come on. Let's go and grab some lunch, and then I'll watch the Richmond game with you. I wondered if it was such a good idea, as undoubtedly his injury would be brought up yet again to be dissected by the commentators during the lull in today's game. Wow, you must like me. He looked down at me seriously. I do. I kissed him. Just so you know, the feeling's mutual. He moaned as I continued kissing him. Don't start again or else we'll never leave. More kisses. Would that be so bad? He pushed me against the pillow. What would Richmond say? I pushed him back. You're right. Get off me. Declan now seemed to be practicing passive resistance as he sagged against me and became dead weight. No, I've changed my mind now. Bastard? I struggled against him, but he was too heavy for me to budge him. Which, you know, it's not that bad a thing to have Declan Tyler naked and on top of you. But it does start to make breathing slightly difficult after a while. He took pity on me and rolled off. 
shower, then a late lunch and watch Richmond get slaughtered again? You never know. It could be Richmond's day. After all, it seemed to be mine. We had just showered and were getting ready to go out when both our mobiles rang within seconds of each other. Scott, Declan said unhappily. He had been hoping to get through the day without a call from his coach. Roger, I said, almost as unhappily. I was not ready for the talk that we needed to have, especially now. I left Declan in the bedroom to have privacy while I took mine into the study and closed the door so we wouldn't be heard in the background of each other's calls. You picked up, Roger said, sounding surprised. Yeah, I meant to call you before this. Oh. Silence. Apparently now that we were talking, we had nothing to say. Look, I'm sorry, Roger said finally. It's okay, I mumbled. Not really, it's not, he replied. Just, as your friend, I get to be concerned for you, okay? I made some kind of noise of agreement. How about if I come over, bring some beer, and watch the game with you? Oh, fuck. There was no way this situation would end well. He could sense the hesitation in me. What the fuck, Simon? Are you really still that mad at me? No, I said quickly. It's just... Declan's here. Oh. Funny how that one little word, one syllable, two letters, could mean a thousand different things. Look, he's just really upset because of what went down yesterday. So today probably isn't a good day to do the meet the friend thing? Yep. Fuck, he was pissed now. The tables had turned. I'm not sure if you saw what happened in the game last night, Raj. He's not in a great state. Maybe I was exaggerating a little, but with things still unsorted between me and Roger, and with him being free and easy about his opinion of my new relationship, I couldn't guarantee a thermonuclear-free day if the three of us got together. Roger? Yeah, fine, that's cool, if that's what you want. And just like that, my needle swung back into the red zone. Hey, it's not like when you and Fran first got together, you didn't disappear for the first month or so, and I never gave you any shit for it. I had him there, and he knew it, but he wasn't going to let it go. Like I said, Simon, fine. Fine, I'll speak to you soon. And I hung up on him. It wasn't a good thing to do, but with the way things were heading in our conversation, one of us was going to do it at the end. Might as well be me. I childishly turned my mobile off so that if Roger tried to call me back, which I doubted he would, he wouldn't be able to get me. And if he rang the landline, there was always the answering machine. I opened the door to the study and listened to ascertain whether Declan was still on his call. It was dead quiet in the house, so I walked back toward the bedroom. Declan was sitting on the bed, all vestiges of the carefree aura he had all morning wiped away. He was back in his defensive position, staring at the floor. Hey, what is it? I asked, sitting beside him. He sighed heavily. You're going to kill me. I doubt that. Why, what have you done? I have to leave for Hobart this afternoon. Okay, not a killable offense, but one which would make my day a whole lot less pleasant. You're kidding. I wish I was. I'd try to wrestle my way out of it, but they've hired a special jet that flies at low altitude so there won't be any further pressure on my knee. That's when it finally hit me that I was dealing with a totally different world. A world in which no expense was spared to protect a million-dollar investment, which is what my boyfriend was. I had joked with Declan, calling him the million-dollar baby, but the truth was he was more. He earned about one and a half million annually just from his salary from the club. I had no idea how much his endorsements and sponsorships would be worth, but they would be even more than that. He was important enough that special planes were now being hired to ferry him home with as little inconvenience as possible. 
I tried not to hyperventilate audibly and to laugh it off. You would think they would rather keep you safe in Melbourne instead of shuffling you back and forth. Believe me, I would prefer it. I kissed him with a hint of desperation I didn't really want to show. He looked at me, and although I wanted to look away, I couldn't. I'm sorry, Simon. Dak, it's not your fault. But I promised you. I think there are larger issues here than a thwarted, dirty weekend. I regretted saying that, because he looked disappointed that I had reduced it to that, when it meant so much more to me. Now it was my turn to apologize. I'm sorry, that was stupid. See, you are upset. Of course I am, I admitted, deciding that honesty was the best policy. After all, look at the problems caused by concealment last time we were together. But not at you, just upset because we see each other intermittently, when normally any other couple would be in each other's pockets getting to know each other for the first month at least. My conversation with Roger couldn't help rearing its ugly head. But this is our situation. We can't feel shitty about it. We just have to enjoy when we see each other. I'm enjoying seeing you, Declan said. If it wasn't for this fucking jet, I would have told him to piss off. I nodded. So when do you have to go? He winced. Now, he said regretfully. Fucking typical. I nodded. To soothe the pain, he kissed me, and for a few seconds it almost worked. But as he pulled away, the feeling of shittiness returned. I watched him zip up his bag, and he flung it over his shoulder. I could tell he wanted a quick getaway, and in essence I agreed with him, because there was no use in prolonging what we were both unhappy about. At the front door, he reached for me. I'll call you when I get home. I nodded. Fly safe. You know what they say, he said, opening the door. You're more likely to die in the car on the way to the airport. Wow, they say couples start to look like each other. At that moment, he sounded like me. That was the end of conversation between us for now. We kissed, and it felt like the last time for a long time. Then he was gone obscured by the tinted windows of his hire car. He pulled out of the driveway, and I was left standing on the veranda. The morning had started out so promising. Now I had only the inevitable defeat of Richmond to look forward to for the afternoon. Chapter 11 The Unthinkable Happened in the third quarter, Richmond came from 31 points down to muster an unbelievable rally. And with the game in overtime, they were only three points behind. New recruit Valid Alhanin managed to intercede the ball and drive it down toward the goals with the entire Richmond fan base on his side, trying to harness control over the ball with the power of thought and will it into a six-pointer. Alhanin gave a mighty kick and it soared perfectly between the two center posts. I gave such a mighty scream, Maggie fled for the sanctuary of the bedroom. I believe I shrieked gratitude to every god and goddess I could think of. Alhanin's name became instantly sacred to me, as it probably did to every other Richmond fan nationwide. Richmond had just won their first game of the season. I wished Roger or Declan had been there. It felt a bit lonely not being able to share it with anyone. On a rare but venerable high, I decided to take the bull by the horns. I jumped in my car and drove to Roger and Fran's house, tooting my horn triumphantly whenever I saw somebody with a Richmond sticker on their bumper. They, of course, hooted in reply. I wondered if this was an omen that things might be turning around. I could only hope. Declan would return to form, Roger and I would patch things up, Richmond would win the grand final. Next season, I was no fool to believe it was possible this year. And I would win the lottery so there would be no embarrassment between Declan and I when it came to paying for dinner. 
My dreams were quickly dashed when Roger opened the door and glared at me. What do you want? Ouch. I came to talk to you. He looked out beyond me, perhaps surprised I was alone. Where's your boyfriend? Huh. That was an entirely new side to him. I counted to three in my head before answering so this wouldn't get any worse. Probably somewhere over the Bass Strait by now. What happened to your date? Are you going to let me in? We're not your second best, you know, he said childishly. I decided to call his bluff. Okay. I turned my back and stomped back toward my car. Hold it. That certainly wasn't Roger's voice. I turned to see Fran whacking Roger over the head, and he howled in righteous indignation. Let him in. Roger rubbed the back of his head. Get in here, you dickhead. Ask him nicely. Whack. Simon, would you like to come inside? Roger asked, a forced tone to his voice. Why, thanks, Roger, that would be nice, I replied as I climbed back up the porch steps. As he moved away from the door to let me through, and I pushed between him and Fran in the narrow hallway, I was given an extra special greeting in the form of a slap upside my head from his lovely wife. Ow! I cried, now reflecting Roger's gesture from earlier as I rubbed the offended area. Fran glared at me. That's for ignoring me the other day on Elizabeth Street. I didn't see you until the last minute, I protested, and then I was stuck there trying to decide what to do. Her unchanged expression told me I was digging my grave even deeper. I gave you plenty of time to come after me. It didn't seem that long, I said sheepishly, and I received another whack for it. You hurt my feelings. Fran said, and her tone of voice made me feel what could have been the guiltiest I ever had in my life. I'm sorry, I said in all honesty. I was now rewarded with a hug. Hey, my feelings were hurt too, Roger said. Because you hurt mine in the first place, I reminded him, pulling away from Fran. Well, he said defensively, you hurt mine again after that. Oh, for fuck's sake, Fran muttered. Just hug and make up like normal people. Pushed into it, we did so, although normal people was also pushing it. Just letting you know I'm still upset, Roger pointed out, his elbow digging into my ribs as we embraced awkwardly. Same here, I replied rubbing at my side unhappily and accidentally stepping on his foot. We pulled apart, and the three of us now stood in the cramped hallway, all looking uneasily at one another. So, how about a beer? Roger suggested, falling back on an old faithful for backup. I nodded gratefully. Fran clapped her hands together. Finally, something we can all agree on. He looked crushed on the news, Fran said, reaching for another handful of chips. We were on the back porch, despite the cold, staring out into the yard, which was desperately in need of a mow. Fran and Roger usually liked to wait until one of their more industrious relatives decided to do it for them. The picture on the front page of the sun was even worse, Roger pointed out. Extreme close-up, looking like he was about to cry and that new name they've given him. What new name? I asked quickly, feeling dread gnawing at my guts in anticipation. You haven't seen the papers? Fran asked. I hid my newspapers, I admitted. Fran and Roger exchanged glances. He was miserable enough, I said defensively. Well, he's probably seen them now, Fran grimaced. Show me. She sighed. It was clear she didn't want to, but she knew she would be pressured into it eventually. She disappeared into the house and was back just as quickly, her arms full of the morning's papers. 
The age was kinder, as per usual, but the herald son loved it. The age was nicer, with just a picture of Declan looking devastated. The herald son had the more emotive picture. Roger was right. Declan looked like he was about to cry as he sat alone on the bench, away from his other team members. The headline crowed, Here we go again, the temporary devil. Fuck. It wasn't the most coherent response I could have given, but it certainly summed up my feelings enough. The Ages account was straightforward, giving the facts with a few statements sprinkled in from the coach and doctor. The Herald's son was given to hyperbole, lamenting about Declan's performance in comparison to his salary, how the fans were disappointed in him, and turning against him even more now that they had received another slap in the face, and how Declan might also quite possibly have contributed to the problems in East Timer through his downright suckiness. I tossed the tabloid aside. What can you expect from a paper that publishes Andrew Bolt's columns? Not much, Roger said, and he clinked his bottle against mine. Fran smiled at us proudly, as if this simple act had resolved all the grievances between us. And she was probably right. It didn't take much. When do you think you'll see Declan again? she asked. I shrugged. It's all up in the air. It depends on what they're making him do in Tassie. It sucks, Fran said passionately. I know, I said, my tone completely opposite to hers. It was too tiring to feel that much at the moment. No, it really sucks, Fran repeated with emphasis. If that was me, all I would want is Roger there to make me feel better. I bet you that's what Declan wants. Roger? I asked, to deflect having to think about it. Luckily, I was out of reach of her slapping hand. You, you idiot. Oh, don't owe me. You're pushing her, Roger mumbled, passing me another beer. And you know what happens when you push her. I had never pushed Fran, although I had seen Roger do it plenty of times. The results weren't pretty. I had to head her off at the pass. Fran, we've only been seeing each other about a month, and of that month we've seen each other maybe four days. I don't think I'm the beginning and end of his world just yet. At the start of a relationship, where every emotion is turned up to eleven, I doubt that, Fran countered. And what, you're trying to tell me you don't speak practically every day? I know you're long distance, but I bet you're finding ways to overcome it. What are you saying, Fran? I said derisively. That I should jump on the plane and go to Hobart? She folded her arms over her chest and looked considerably pleased with herself. Finally, he gets it. Roger snorted, and I turned to him. Is she serious? You know her. I did, and she was way past serious. I sputtered almost incoherently as I tried to make her see sense. Friend, that's crazy. Why? There are lots of whys. Name some. Oh, great, a quiz. I looked at Roger again. He stared at the long grass at the bottom of the steps, like it was growing before him. He wasn't going to be any help. Fine, work. Make it a two-nighter. Fly out today, fly back Monday morning. Maggie, you know we'll feed her, Simon. This was getting harder. The cost of the ticket. I know you always have money stashed away. You're a good saver. It's like your one responsible quality. This was true. Fuck it, she did know me too well. That's for emergencies. This is one. It fucking well isn't. Fran glared at me. It would prove to Declan that you really care about him. He probably needs that right now. I could prove that with a phone call. Guys are such arseholes, she muttered. Roger and I were both stunned. Fran, Roger protested. She jumped to her feet and towered over me. 
It was pretty impressive and intimidating. You know what, Simon? There are two reasons you don't want to do it. You're lazy and you're chicken shit. And with that barb, she thundered off into the house, slamming the door behind her for good measure. In the eye of the storm, Roger and I compared wounds. Lazy and chicken shit? I practically whimpered. Well, she had the lazy part right, Roger said. And the chicken shit, we heard Fran yell from inside. Does she have a bionic ear or something? I asked. Shit, mate, you know she's psychic. I put my beer down and headed into the house. Fran was only just a couple of feet inside the door. She didn't look at all apologetic for her behavior. Why am I chicken shit? So you're accepting the lazy part. Just answer me, Fran. You know why you're chicken shit. Because if you do this, you'll be showing him a part of yourself you hate showing. That you care. You do it enough to us sometimes. That day when Roger came in with the Hawthorne scarf, I almost thought he was lying and that he'd bought it himself. We know you love us, but you like to pretend you're all aloof and unreachable. That's what makes you chicken shit. Getting on a plane will show Declan how you feel, and you'd hate to be that transparent. I don't know how I feel yet, I said, still bleeding from the wound caused by the sword she had stabbed me through the stomach with. Don't lie. Her tone indicated it was a warning. We can all see it. Even Nysa knows you're up to something, although she hasn't quite figured it out yet. Why are you so scared of showing that you like someone? I didn't know how to answer without sounding like I was throwing a pity party. But that's the thing when you grow up feeling different to everyone else. And I know that when you're a teenager, everybody feels different and alien to the other people around them. But there seems to be an added dimension when you're queer. It's because for that period of time, you're more isolated than anybody else. And you truly think you are the only one of your kind, so you create fantastic barriers and defense strategies for yourself to survive. And when you get older and realize that you can take them down, it's an internal and eternal struggle to do so. Fear is the best demotivator in the world. So all I could do was stare at her. Fran returned my stare, her eyes showing a sadness that made me feel even worse. Jesus, Simon, she said finally. You can't go on like this. There was still that part of me battling madly against everything she was saying, this logical Vulcan inside me that was coming up with a thousand reasons why this was impossible. But Fran's sad face, combined with knowing Declan was unhappy, pushed me over the edge. Get me your phone, I instructed her, even though my mobile was in my pocket. If I had to pay out for a short-notice ticket, she could at least pay for the phone call. She hugged me, almost crushing my ribs in the process. I love you, Simon. And as her reward, I mumbled, I love you too. It made her cry. Jesus. I'm so happy, she sobbed. This is a beautiful moment. Would you like a tissue? I asked. Don't ruin it, she warned. The door opened and Roger stepped in to see this strange little tableau. What the hell is going on? And that is how I found myself on a six o'clock flight to Hobart. I barely had enough time to rush home, beg for Maggie's forgiveness, throw some clothes together in a bag, and run back out into my front yard, where Fran and Roger sat waiting in their car. They'd followed me back home so they could drive me to the airport. Fran was overflowing with excitement, imagining the gay romantic comedy she was writing in her head. Roger was amused by the fact that I was actually doing this crazy thing, and I was sure he would be bringing it up for years to come, the day Simon went wildly insane for love. On the way to the airport, it dawned on me. I don't know his address. 
That put a damper on Fran's plans. What? I repeated myself. How can you not know his address, Simon? She practically shrieked. Um, because he lives in another state, and I've never been to his house because of that very reason? She drummed her fingernails on the steering wheel, thinking furiously. Right, call him. And say what? That you want his address, stupid. For what reason? To send him flowers? No, Roger and I said together. Fucking men, Fran fumed. Just do it. Too scared to raise her ire any further, I opened my mobile and called Declan. Hi, he said warmly as he picked up. I was just about to call you. What's your address? I blurted out. Fran and Roger groaned at my finesse. What was that noise? Declan asked. Trolls, I replied casually. Have you been drinking? Just a little bit. You're not driving? No, Fran is. She only had one beer. Oh, where are you going? I'm asking the questions. I was getting a little panicked. What's your address? He gave it to me, and I scribbled it down. Can I at least ask why? I'm sending you flowers. Wow, you are drunk. What? You don't like flowers? I could hear Roger snigger behind me. Fine, it doesn't have to be flowers. They have those things online where you can send cartons of beer or boxes of freckles or caramel buds. Would you rather have beer and caramel buds? I'd like beer and caramel buds, Roger murmured. I ignored him. Really? Declan asked, sounding slightly dubious. If I were you, I wouldn't be using my credit card so freely while I was under the influence. Fine, I'll choose it. And you'll probably get something really crap. Simon, are you okay? It was a question I should have been asking him. But if I spoke to him for much longer, I would give the game away. Fran had already drummed me into this, and it was meant to be a surprise. She was my romantic counselor, apparently. I'm fine. See you. I hung up on him and turned my mobile off so he couldn't call back. You could have handled that a bit better, Fran said. I was about to crack. That happened a long time ago, Roger muttered as he stared out the window. I had to wait an hour for a cab from the Hobart airport. I wasn't going to risk attempting public transport. It was in the taxi, with the buzz of the beer finally wearing off, that I started having doubts about what I was doing. Hobart was a small town, with roughly 200,000 people, in comparison to Melbourne's 4 million. Declan would be even more recognizable here than back home. And here I was, a guy, arriving on his front doorstep. If there was a doorman, should I cover myself up by claiming to be Declan's cousin? Or would that be even more suspicious? The beer buzz was now heading into Paranoiaville. The apartment complex Declan had given me the address for was in Battery Point, which seemed to be a rather pretty, perhaps blatantly touristy, maritime village. You could tell back in the convict era it was probably a hardened seaport. But now it was gussied up and yuppified, and more likely to sell patchouli oil and vegetable-based soaps than seafood. I tried not to be too judgmental about it all as I stared up at the fancy seven-story building before me and entered the lobby. There wasn't any doorman, but it seemed that after a certain time of night the interior doors were locked. I found myself in a small alcove before the main lobby, with a wall and all of the apartments listed with a buzzer next to each. There went the surprise. I pressed Declan's number and waited. A fuzzy-sounded Declan answered. Simon? What the hell? Uh, surprise? I said, just as confused as him. How do you... Wave to the camera, he instructed me wryly. I turned to see the small squat box attached to the wall, following my every move. I did as he said and gave a small wave. 
A buzzer sounded, the interior door swung open, and I had access to the lobby. I scratched at my wrist unhappily as I rode the elevator to Declan's floor. This was a mistake, a huge mistake. I was still contemplating heading back downstairs and getting a ride to the airport, even as my feet took me to Declan's door. I knocked with a heavy heart, and the door swung open to reveal Declan with a huge smile upon his face. He pulled me in and crushed me against his chest as he kissed me. What the hell are you doing here? He asked me again, breathily. Like I said, I was still trying to catch my own breath. Surprise! I take it you're not mad, then? I asked groggily as we lay in bed. Fuck no, he laughed. It's the best surprise I've ever had. Now starting to feel the cold, I pulled the duna up over us. Fran and Beer helped me decide. When I finally meet Fran, I'm going to give her the biggest kiss she's ever had in her life. Roger and I might be unhappy about that. Fine. Does she like wine? She's Italian, are you kidding? He rolled over onto his side so he could look at me properly. Seriously, I feel so much better. I hated leaving you today. I want to kidnap you and keep you here for a week rather than two days. It's not kidnapping if the victim wants to be kept, I yawned. I guess not. But when I say a week, I really mean a month. Is that all? Don't get cocky. I pressed against him. Bad pun. Deck? Yeah, he murmured. I was worried about coming here. Half asleep, in the dark. As usual, it was easier to be more forthright. Why? Because this is your territory, and it's a much smaller town. I'm happy you're here. But it could be a problem. Didn't you hear what I said? I did, but Simon, no buts. Not right now. Okay. I didn't say anything about his bad pun. It seemed as if Declan had his concerns as well, but he was pushing them away. It was easier to exist in our little bubble, as if the world around us didn't exist. It felt safer, but it was all an illusion. Which, I guess, is why we liked being with each other so much. It was like we could go on perfectly together if the rest of the world just didn't get involved. Simon? Yeah? I'm going to sound like a fucking idiot for saying this. Then don't say it. I laughed. Just, you and me, that's all there is, right? I struggled up onto my elbows to look down on him in the dark. What? Don't get insulted. I'm too confused to be insulted right now. What are you asking? You're not seeing anyone else, right? Okay, I was slightly insulted now. I find it hard enough to get one partner, let alone juggling more than one. Don't get pissy. I just want to make sure we're... Were you seeing anyone else? I asked, scared of his answer. He must have heard the tinge of panic in my tone as he sat up. No. Okay, so it's just us. That's sorted. Hey, Deck, just leave it. No, I didn't mean to insult you, Simon. Just... What? He drew his knees up to his chest and picked uncomfortably at the bandage. What, Deck? I've been a bit paranoid about it since, well, the last guy I went out with. He cheated on you. Well, yeah. He cheated on you? I said incredulously. Yeah, it happened, Simon. But to you? Will you stop saying that? I'm sorry, I'm just shocked as hell that somebody would cheat on you. I don't get you sometimes. You seem so unfazed by me, unlike the rest of the public. And then there are times when you say things like that. Declan thumped his knee in frustration, and I grabbed his hand so he couldn't do it again. As if I'm special. Simon, I'm just like any other guy. 
And sometimes that means you get cheated on, and that fucks you up. I slipped my arm around his waist. I'm sorry, but you are special. People are always going to see you differently. And although it doesn't really matter to me that you're Declan Tyler, god of football, he laughed weakly. Sometimes I will be amazed if someone does something against you. And not just because you're Declan Tyler, god of football, but because you're Declan Tyler, guy I like. He kissed me. Good answer. I can be surprising sometimes. Here, babe, coffee. My eyes sprang open. Did I just hear what I thought I heard? I wasn't sure. I rolled around and found a mug in my face. I sat up and Declan handed it down. He then climbed in beside me, holding his own. I sipped at my coffee in silence, wondering if I should say something about what had just been said. There was an awkward air hanging between us, and Declan drummed his fingers against the mug. So, I began. Too soon, right? he asked. Relieved, I laughed. I didn't imagine it. You thought, you called me babe. I laughed. Babe! Okay, you don't like terms of endearment. I took his mug off him and set both of them next to the bed. He looked at me quizzically as I pulled him over to me and kissed him. Oh, babe, 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 I teased, covering his face with kisses. Okay, I get it. I won't say it anymore. Don't you dare stop, I warned him. Just not in front of anybody else. I have a reputation to consider. You. Yes, me. Sure thing, he said, grinning. Babe. Freshly showered and caffeined up, we moved into the kitchen. In the daylight, and not as distracted by Declan's charms, I now got to see exactly what kind of apartment I was in. I felt like I was in a modern home layout. Deck had opened the blinds, and I was greeted by a picture-postcard view of the harbor and Mount Wellington rising up just behind it. Like the view? It sure beats my view of Mr. Grimaldson's veggie garden, I said wryly, watching the boats bob upon the waves below me. Mr. Grimaldson might argue with that, Deck replied, filling the coffee machine. I could stare out there forever. You do look slightly hypnotized. This isn't the penthouse, is it? I asked. Declan scoffed at me. There's no penthouse in this complex. It sure seemed like a penthouse. But I was only comparing it to my own weatherboard shack in North Brunswick. Declan's lounge room was tastefully and sparsely furnished. A faux vintage coffee table sat upon a large dark rug. Two expensive leather couches sat at opposite ends to each other, facing a large entertainment unit. But there was something vital missing. Where's your telly? I asked. He moved beside me and picked up a remote control from the coffee table. The entertainment unit slid open to reveal a huge plasma television that was practically half the size of my lounge room wall at home. Holy fuck! I breathed. There may have been angels singing hallelujah as well. I'm bringing my DVDs here. You're easily pleased, Declan murmured, nuzzling my neck. Do you have surround sound? I asked, still distracted. He laughed. It felt soothing against my skin. Yes, actually I had a subwoofer inserted into the bottom of the couches. You should feel the Death Star blowing up in Star Wars. Puzzled, I grabbed his head and gently turned it so I could look him in the eye. I thought I was meant to be the geek. That's even geekier than anything I've ever said in my life. Declan looked pleased with himself. I guess I like surprising you every now and again. The coffee machine began hissing, letting us know that the coffee was ready. I gave him a quick kiss and jogged over to start pouring. You know, 
The fastest I've ever seen you move is when you're going after coffee, Declan remarked. At least I'm consistent that way, I said, pulling the milk out of the fridge. His fridge was well stocked. You must have a maid hidden somewhere, I murmured. What was that? Declan asked from the lounge. Nothing, I called back as I shut the fridge and turned my attention back to the coffee. We both froze as a knock came at the door. Deck, open up! A loud, deep voice reverberated through the wood. I looked at Declan, sure that I had turned pale. Declan, however, looked as relaxed as he had moments before. I think it's time you meet some of my friends, he said casually. Chapter 12 Meet his friends? Was he joking? Shouldn't I be acting like someone in a bedroom farce? Hiding under the bed or shimmying down a drain pipe outside the window? I doubted I'd be able to shimmy down a drain pipe. I would be more likely to hang on grimly for a few seconds before losing my grip and plunging to my certain death seven stories below. Deck? I said feebly. Hey, he said, crossing over to me. It'll be fine, trust me. Of course I trusted him. But I needed to be given a debriefing first, in which it would be outlined what I could and couldn't say, how to act, what to do. Simon, Declan said, taking me by the arm. It's Abe, he's cool. And of course, I knew who Abe must be. Abraham, Abe Ford, of the inseparable team of Ford and Tyler. Friends on and off the field. But Declan sure hadn't told me he was part of the in-the-know list. Or was he? Why couldn't he just fucking tell me? He kissed me again, and he was so cool about it that I had to assume Abe knew. I took a deep breath as Declan left me and jogged to the door to open it. The instantly recognizable form of Abe Ford walked through, looking like he owned the place, or at least was comfortable enough here to treat it like it was a home away from home. He slapped palms with Declan, and even though I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, I was still amused by the hyper-masculine camaraderie between them. I bet you smelled the coffee from downstairs, Deck said. We were too lazy to make our own, Abe grinned. We? Hey, Lisa, Declan said, easily kissing the woman who followed Abe into the apartment. She gave his arm a quick rub, and my guts turned to rubber. Morning, Deck, she said, casually shortening his name, which up until this point in time I had stupidly assumed I was the only one who did. By now, Abe had turned around to see me standing like a stunned mullet in the kitchen using the coffee machine as camouflage, hoping that my black clothing would blend chameleon-like against its plastic. He pointed at me and looked back at Declan. Who is this? Lisa's eyes widened, but there was a glossiness to them that showed she was both surprised and delighted for some unknown reason. I wondered whether to introduce myself or let Declan do it and therefore give me some clue about the role I was meant to act out. Declan beat me to it. This is Simon. Nice and nondescript. Noncommittal. Brief. Thanks, Deck. But this condensed introduction seemed to signify a lot more to the people now unexpectedly sharing the kitchen with me. Simon! Abe said, crossing behind the counter to grab my hand and shake it furiously. I assumed it was, but it's good to meet you. He'd barely released me before I was getting my very own kiss from Lisa. We've heard so much about you, she said, smiling as she pulled back to have a proper look at me. Uh, hi, I muttered, wondering what the hell was going on. Believe me, he usually talks a lot more than this, Declan said wryly. 
Relax, Simon, Abe said, throwing open the cupboard doors as he searched within them. No Bicky's deck? What kind of host are you? We know deck's dirty little secret. Her tone of voice proved that she didn't think it was either dirty or little at all. These are my friends, Declan shrugged, sounding both apologetic and happy about it. Why don't you run downstairs, Abe, and get some biscuits from our flat? Me? he asked. You're the athlete, mate, not me. Count it as part of your training. He put on a good show of being annoyed by it, but he wasn't fooling anyone. Be back in a minute. Lisa called after him. As the door shut, she turned her attention back to me. You said he was cute, Deck, she said approvingly, but he's really cute. She was either a flatterer or a pathological liar. My ego wanted to believe the former. Told you, Declan agreed. And you two look very good together, she continued. Desperate to deflect attention, I asked her, How do you take your coffee? Oh, and modest, she teased. No wonder you like him. White with one, thanks. She was very friendly from the get-go, wasn't she? You couldn't help but like her. Lisa was casual, smart, and able to put you at ease within moments of meeting her. She reminded me a lot of Fran. Which made me think that if they ever met each other, they would probably collide, or take over the world together. What about Abe? I asked. What about him? I stared at her, and Lisa laughed. Black with one. I'll be right back, Declan said, and he disappeared into the bedroom. I watched him go, wondering if I was wearing that beseeching, don't leave me all alone with her expression. She might have been friendly and casual, but I didn't want to be pressured into giving the first encounter tell you my life story speech just yet. She sidled around the counter and leaned into me confidentially. Deck must really like you. I handed her a coffee. What makes you say that? Because he wanted to introduce you to us so quickly. You've been going out, what, a month or so? About that, I agreed reluctantly, not sure where this was headed. Believe me, he normally takes a few months, even longer, if he introduces us at all. She must have read the expression on my face. Oh, don't worry. It's not like he's a male slut or anything. He's practically a celibate hermit compared to the other footballers. I finally found my tongue. It's your use of the word practically that worries me, especially in the context of other footballers' sex lives. Lisa snorted into her coffee. Point taken. But what I'm trying to tell you is he really likes you. I sized her up. Now that's starting to sound like a warning. She shrugged. Maybe it is. Do you like him? This conversation was really going into uncomfortable territory for me. Of course I do. Really like him? You're sounding like an American high schooler. It's not like he's given me his letterman's jacket. Yeah, but I know Declan. I don't know you. I know he's serious. And I don't have to justify myself to you. Okay, probably not the best reaction to give one of Declan's best friends within minutes of meeting them, but I felt cornered. And when you're cornered, you go on the defensive, if not the attack. She set her mug on the kitchen bench. Maybe not, but I've seen other guys latch onto Declan for their own agendas and he's gotten badly burned for it. It's not going to happen again. I don't have an agenda, I said honestly. She relaxed slightly. You know what? Deck told me that although you hide a lot and laugh things off, your face is an open book, and he's right, you can't hide anything. You would think I shouldn't like her after this interrogation, but I still did. At least she was honest, and I always respect that. Does this mean you'll give him the friend approval? 
For me, yes. A will be another thing entirely. I groaned. Fantastic. Relax, he's not dense. He'll be able to see how much you like Declan, even if you try to deny it. Dec knows you're interrogating me, doesn't he? I asked her. Lisa grinned. Of course he does. I held up a finger. Just excuse me a moment. I heard her giggling into her coffee as I fled from the kitchen to find my wayward boy, partner, whatever. Whatever word doesn't sound naff. Declan was lying on the bed, his hands intertwined on his stomach, staring up at the ceiling. Bastard! I hissed, jumping on top of him. He looked me over appreciatively. You don't seem too worse for wear. She must like you. I grabbed him by the wrists and pulled his arms up over his head. Like I said, bastard! He tried to reach up to kiss me, but I held him down. He squirmed beneath me. Hmm, this is nice. Nice. It turned out his captivity was just a ruse. Before I knew it, I was flying through the air, deck was out from under me, and in seconds had me trapped beneath him. Get off me, say please. You have guests in the next room, I reminded him. One little word. Declan, wrong word. I sighed heavily. Please. I was rewarded with a slow, long kiss. I arched up beneath him, and he pulled my arms behind his back. It wasn't that comfortable, to tell you the truth. I teased him by slowly thrusting my lower body against his, and he moaned into my mouth which was when I took advantage of his temporary distraction by throwing him off me and jumping to my feet. He fell against the bedside table. Fuck my knee! He cried, hugging it to his chest. Games were forgotten immediately. I threw myself down beside him. Oh, Deck, fuck, I'm so sorry. Immediately, my back was against the floor, and Declan was on top of me. Gotcha. Motherfucker! I wheezed, out of breath, as Declan was slowly squeezing the air out of my body while he used his own to restrain me. You can't use your injury. Who said? It's not fair. Aww, he teased. I sagged against the floor, all energy expended. Fine, I said with an air of martyrdom. Do to me what you will. That's a tempting thought, he said mockingly, but there are guests in the next room. Then get off me. Distracting with the kissing again. He was a master of that. He stroked the side of my cheek with his thumb. I guess we better get back out there. I nodded, although I kind of was happy where I lay. He helped me up to my feet, and we made our way back to the kitchen. Lisa grinned at us as we entered. We did look a little mussed up. But we also hadn't been gone long enough to be accused of doing the deed, so at least there wasn't that particular embarrassment. Did he punish you, Deck? She asked innocently. I think we punished each other enough. He said deadpan. Is Abe still not back yet? He arrived only a couple of minutes later. I couldn't find any biscuits, so I ran down to the milk bar. Lisa rolled her eyes. They're in the tin. That's marked biscuits. They squabbled good-naturedly between themselves as Declan made fresh coffees for everybody. And when we were all seated together was when the true interrogation began. So, you work for a film festival? Abe asked. I nodded as I took a bite of the granita. The triple F. You like it? I love it. Of course, I complain about it all the time, but it's a great job. It must be a big responsibility, Lisa said. Well, it's really only me and my assistant who plan and run everything. That's why it takes a whole year for us to arrange it. 
Are you like most people who work in the industry? Abe asked. Do you have a script hidden under your bed? About three, actually, all unfinished. Why? Lisa asked. I laughed derisively. Because they're pretty shit? I admitted. Sometimes I think I'm a better critic or film festival organizer than one of the creative types. I guess somebody has to do it. I doubt they're shit, Declan said softly. You haven't read them. I'd like to, he persisted. Abe snorted behind his hand. What? Declan asked dangerously. Dude, you are so gone. Abe, baby, Lisa said, laying her hand upon his arm. Don't forget Deck has as much on you as you do, or will, on him. Declan nodded satisfyingly, and Abe was suitably cowed. I could feel Deck's knee pressing against mine, and I smiled. And then I felt the pressure of his hand resting upon my thigh. I almost jumped through the ceiling. But when the moment was right, I slipped my right hand down to close over his. I doubted either Abe or Lisa could miss it, but they politely refrained from teasing us about it. I just hoped that when Fran and Roger were given the same opportunity, they would be as polite. After coffee, Lisa and Abe made plans to have lunch with us. As soon as the door was shut behind them, Deck and I were both running back to the bedroom, peeling off our clothes. We had enough time to fool around, which we did, have a nap, which we did, and shower, which we did, before going down to Lisa and Abe's apartment. Declan told me in the lift that it was purely by coincidence that they had ended up buying in the same complex but that it was good to have his best friend living only a few flights down. I couldn't help think that as much as I loved Roger and Fran, I was glad there was at least a suburb between us. They were close enough, but far enough at the same time. I also wondered if it was true, as rumor had it, I was an antisocial bastard. So, where shall we go for lunch? Abe asked, rubbing his hands together in anticipation of the meal. Go? I repeated stupidly. We aren't eating here. The three of them laughed, as if I had said the stupidest thing ever said by a member of the human race. About the only thing either of us can make is toast, Lisa told me. Yeah, we even have to rely upon deck for our coffee, Abe agreed. As you saw, Declan reminded me. Abe and Lisa began having a heated discussion about what they wanted for lunch. Declan sensed my hesitation and pulled me aside. Hey, what's up? he asked. Are you sure you want to go out? I asked hesitantly. In public? He studied me for a moment and then said, That's what you're worried about. If people look at us, all they'll see are a group of friends out for a Sunday lunch, nothing more. I wasn't sure if it was that simple, or maybe I had just become too paranoid on his behalf. But when I thought about it, from the average person's perspective, if they saw us all out, they would be too blinded by the sight of Declan Tyler and Abe Ford to pay much attention to either Lisa or myself. Okay, I nodded if you're sure. Declan smiled at me. Sure, I'm sure. They sure sounded like famous last words to me. You've been quiet ever since lunch. Declan told me as we lay together in bed after a simple dinner of toast. No, I haven't, I lied, burying my head further in the crook of his shoulder. Well, you weren't your normal sarcastic self, he pushed. I remained silent. Lunch had been fine, but I couldn't help admitting to myself that I had been left with a somewhat bittersweet feeling, perhaps slightly more bitter than sweet. We had walked the short distance from their apartment complex to the Salamanca Place markets, 
and after wandering around the stalls for a while, where I bought a very touristy resin statue of a thylacine for Fran and Roger, we decided upon a local cafe for lunch. Abe and Lisa were great company, and over the course of the afternoon I found myself growing to like them even more. Lisa especially took me into her confidence, I guess because she sensed a kindred spirit in someone who knew what it was like to go out with a man who was regarded as a god by the public at large. I could tell there were little nuggets of wisdom she wanted to impart, and to tell you the truth, I wanted to hear them, but they couldn't really be discussed with the men in question at the same table. I guess it would wait for some day in the future when we got a moment to ourselves. Like when we went shopping for dresses for the Brownlow ceremony, right? Anyway, Deck was right. I wasn't entirely myself. I was in hyper-vigilant mode, making sure I kept a respectable distance from him so that no outsider would guess that anything untoward was between us. I was on the lookout for people with cameras, especially as we had some fans approach the table from time to time asking for autographs. Both Deck and Abe politely declined requests for photos, as it was their day off, but invited them to the next training sessions, which were open to the public, and they could get their photos taken then. Those etiquette classes were paying off. But I never felt fully relaxed. I was putting on a show. And I think my discomfort hung in the air between us all. By the time we got back and Abe and Lisa said their goodbyes, and hoped they would see me again soon, I felt drained. Deck and I watched a movie on his giant screen and fooled around a little on the couch. He made dinner. Well, toast. We weren't particularly hungry. And we went to bed disgustingly early because I had to be on a flight at five in the morning. Simon, Declan asked again. I rolled over on my side to look at him. I'm fine. Don't lie, he said, an edge to his voice now, which he tried to alleviate by adding, Please. I played with the small tuft of hair that served as his right sideburn. It was just lunch. What about it? Did you not like Abe and Lisa? No, I said quickly, to stop his fear on that point. I like them a lot, and it'll be great to see them again. I think I fucked up at lunch. You weren't yourself, but you didn't fuck up. You all probably think I'm an idiot. I will if you keep thinking like that. Why were you so okay about going out in public, when you're the one that needs everything to be kept so private? Declan sighed. There's a difference between going out in public and going out in public. Funny how that one word emphasized summed up everything. You have to stop worrying so much, Declan said. We can still go out. I mean, shit, Abe goes out one-on-one -on -one with other guys all the time, and he never has his sexuality questioned. If we go out with a guilty air, that's what'll make people suspect. And I don't want to make us scared so that we can never leave the house together. That's not what I want for us. But we have to be careful. We were careful, Declan assured me. Maybe I'm just feeling guilty because I'm the one doing the bad thing. Declan suddenly sat up, and I found myself face down on the pillow. Shit, Simon. I sat up. What? Don't ever fucking say that again. What? I asked, truly confused. The bad thing, he spat. I hadn't even realized what I'd said and how it could be construed. You know that's not what I meant. Maybe on a subconscious level you did. That hurt, so I stupidly struck back. Hey, I'm not the one in the closet. Even in the dark, I could see his face fall. It was the worst thing I could have said, and I told him so immediately. I'm sorry, that was stupid. He shook his head sadly. 
Hey, it has to come up sooner or later. I know you have to be because of the industry you're in. I understand it on every logical level, believe me. Well, I don't want you to start thinking shit like us being a bad thing because of that, he said sadly, staring at the duna that was shoved up between us. I don't, I said honestly. Hey, look at me. When he didn't, I took him by the chin and made him. Deck, I don't think we're a bad thing. I'm in this because I really like you and I want us to go further. I think we've got something, don't you? Yeah, he said just as truthfully. I do. So we're going to have some issues now and again, but we'll get through them. And this is just the first one. Probably the first of many, I said cheerily. He could only laugh at that. I gently pushed him back down upon the mattress and draped my arm over his chest. He wrapped his arm around my shoulder and placed his free hand upon my arm, stroking it gently. I could get used to you being here. I would rather have you in Melbourne. Well, that's true. I'd rather be in Melbourne. Guess it's going to be like this for a while. I think you're worth it, I said, glad we were in the dark so he couldn't see me. Only think, he teased. I know you are. I wished I could be as sure about my worth to him as he was. To me, it seemed as if the scales were tipped more heavily in my favor as to who was winning out more. Are you sure I didn't fuck up? I asked. I'm sure, he said, sounding sleepy. And I'll tell Abe and Lisa, even though I don't think it's a problem. They really liked you. I still felt troubled and stayed awake far longer than he did. When the alarm went off at four, I dressed silently in the dark. Declan tried to rise, but I kissed him and pushed him back down. I'm calling a taxi, I told him. You have those appointments in a few hours. Get some more sleep. I'm driving you, he protested but I shut him up in the best way possible with my mouth on his. You know I'm right, I said. He groaned. I don't want you to go. I don't want to go, but hey, real life calls. Please, let me drive you. Get some sleep, babe. That new magic word between us seemed to placate him. Fine. Call me when you get to work so I know you got back safe. Yes, Mom. Shut the fuck up. He laughed tiredly. And that was how I left Declan. Falling back asleep in the bed, I wished I could have stayed in with him. I picked up my bags, closed the door behind me, and called for a taxi as I walked to the lift. I was glad Fran had forced me into doing this. But once again, I didn't feel all that happy at the end of it. I wondered if I would have been better off staying in Melbourne over the weekend. But then I reminded myself of all those moments with Declan, in which our relationship seemed to solidify and become even stronger. And I realized I shouldn't wish it away. But I still locked myself in the tiny tin toilet, while miles above the bass strait on the flight home, and tried not to cry. Chapter 13 I must have been exhausted, because after catching the shuttle from the airport into the city and walking to the office, I promptly fell asleep in my chair while staring out the window. I hadn't even switched the lights on. Nysa came in to switch on the light, emitting a small scream when she saw me sitting there, which jolted me awake. You scared me, she cried, and you kind of looked dead. I felt kind of dead. Why are you in here so early? I wanted to get here first, I yawned. Then why were you asleep? Her eyes narrowed. Are you checking up on me? 
It's not review time, Nysa. I got here early and I was tired. Nysa frowned. You're getting weirder and weirder lately. Do you want coffee? I love you. I smiled at her. Funny how you never show that when it is review time. I don't get to make the budget, you know that. I yelled after her. Otherwise, you'd be making double. Triple, she yelled back. I'm worth it. I chuckled and did the old yawn and stretch. My phone rang, and I yelled to Nysa that I would get it. You didn't call me, came that accusatory voice. I fell asleep as soon as I got in here, I said. Declan didn't sound impressed. I was flicking through all the news channels trying to find whether your plane had crashed. Bullshit. He laughed. Okay, I'm ashamed to say I just got up. Well, you'd better get a move on. Your first appointment's at ten. Wasn't it you calling me mum this morning? Call me later, I told him. I will, and hey. Yeah? In case I didn't say it enough, thank you for coming over here. Seriously. Any time. Don't say that. I'll hold you to it. I was smiling to myself as I hung up the phone. Nysa placed a mug before me, examining my unusually happy expression with suspicion. Okay, who were you talking to? Nobody. You're looking like it must have been somebody. Wrong number. She gave an exasperated sigh. Screw triple. I should be getting quadruple. I took a sip of coffee and gave a long, contented groan. With this coffee? Yes, you should. It didn't take that long for Roger to call me. You had lunch with Abe Ford? I instinctively sat upright in my chair as my spine turned to icy steel. How did you know that? The net, he replied. Could it have been anything else? My spine was now trying to work its way out through my throat. No mean feat. Where exactly? Did you really? He asked again. Roger, where? I repeated, ignoring the wheedling in his voice. My spine had now worked its way out of my throat and found the nearest bridge to jump off, and my heart was planning to follow. The Mercury Online, he sighed. The Tasmanian newspaper. This was not good. I quickly brought up their sight. I couldn't see any lurid photos splashed on the main page of us enjoying yuppie pub fare, so I barked at Roger. Which section? Scene about town. Ugh, the society column. The haven of the rich and the bored. I clicked upon its link. What are you doing reading that? Fran told me. What was she doing reading it? To see if you were mentioned. I shook my head, slightly miffed with my friends, and at the loading speed of the web page. When it finally came, I could let loose a small breath of relief. There was no picture, just a two-line blurb. Salamanca Place, Devils Declan Tyler and Abe Ford, dining with Ford's girlfriend, Lisa Jacobs, and unknown friend. So, nothing too salacious. In fact, it could even be as an assumption I was Lisa's friend. But still, it was the first time I was mentioned in proximity to Declan in the press. I wondered how he felt about that, seeing as I was close to hyperventilating. Still, unknown friend? Could I feel slightly miffed about that as well? Simon, are you there? Yeah. Well, tell me. What? What was Abe Ford like? And it was like we were fourteen years old again, discussing the private lives of the football gods of the time, wondering what they ate, what they drank, where they went, and what movies they might like. For once, I was able to satisfy Roger's fantasies and give him the details he had always wished to know in the past about one of the players in the present. He took them all in hungrily, even down to whether Abe Ford had a lemon or a lime in his corona. Pretty soon, though, it turned back to the old argument. 
So Declan introduced you to his friends, but we still haven't met the guy. You insulted him at a party and offered to fight him, I reminded him. Yes, Roger admitted shamefacedly, but we still haven't formally met. I decided to throw him a lifeline. Well, next time he's in town, I'll have you and Fran over for dinner. Declan had already suggested it when I told him Roger was desperate to make up for his less-than-stellar performance at the party. It's only fair, he said. My friend's got to judge you. Yours have to return the favor now. No, Roger replied grandly. We'll have you. I couldn't believe my good fortune. Okay, that's even better. I won't have to cook. And neither will I, Roger laughed. I couldn't help but join in. Fran would kill you if she heard you say that. Just don't tell her. You know she'll know anyway, but you owe me. No, you owe me. I still can't believe you had lunch with Declan Tyler and Abe Ford on Sunday. I know they're gods on the field, Roger, but when you meet them, you realize they're just people. Yeah, when you meet them. What's the use of having a friend who's dating a superstar of the game when you don't get any fringe benefits? You sound like you want to date him, I pointed out. Very funny. He doesn't even play for your team. I paused, literally and figuratively. Once again, funny. That doesn't mean I don't appreciate his talent. You're sounding gayer than anybody else I know at the moment. Fuck off, unknown friend. I hope that didn't start to stick as a nickname. Hello, my unknown friend. So much for that. Declan obviously sounded okay, better than me at least. You saw it? I gulped. No, I'm psychic, he replied tinnily. It was a bad connection. How did you see it? The friend network. He understood immediately. Ah, yes, Roger and Fran. Are you okay? Declan sounded confused. Yeah, why wouldn't I be? It's not very discreet, is it? It didn't say you were my boyfriend. I nodded and realized he couldn't see me. Are you okay with it? He asked. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. You don't sound it, Simon. I guess I'm just being jumpy for you. I thought we agreed you'd try to stop that. I know, I'm fine. He didn't sound so sure, but he let it drop. How did your appointment go? I'm starting more intensive physio. They want to try to avoid surgery until the end of the season. What, so you don't miss any more games? A bitter note crept into Declan's voice. I could hardly miss any more games, could I? I know, so it's better this way, right? The one good thing is I'll have to come to Melbourne for the surgery. And recover here, I asked hopefully. He laughed finally. You'll probably have to fight my mum for that honor, though. Like that was ever going to happen. Still, at least I might get to see him a little more. I couldn't believe I was wishing surgery upon Declan so he'd be trapped in the same city as me. I sucked as a partner. The sound of somebody clearing their throat came from the doorway. I looked up to see Fran, standing there with a cheeky look on her face. I wondered how long she'd been eavesdropping. Are you free for lunch? she asked. Fran? Declan asked from the other side of the country. You guessed it, I agreed. Tell her I hope I'll see her in a couple of weeks. I relayed the message back to her and had to laugh when she gave a totally self-conscious little giggle. Declan had no idea of the effect he had on people, even people like Fran who didn't know one end of the football from another. I think that meant cool, I told him. I better get going, and so should you. I'll speak to you soon. Bye, Deck. Maybe a bit more formal than I would have liked after the weekend we had just spent, but we had an audience. I hung up, and Fran leaned in and punched me on the shoulder. Smitten bloody kitten. 
So, are you happy that I made you go? Bran looked particularly smug as she took her last bite of pizza and patted her mouth with her napkin. I screwed mine up and threw it at her. Just admit it. I took a sip of my Coke and made a face. Fine, I'm happy you made me go. And definitely thanks. Her face did not slightly dreamy expression. Really? Feeling slightly impish, I added. He said he was going to give you the biggest kiss you've ever had in your life if he sees me. There was that star struck giggle again. You would think Fran was suddenly crushing on my boyfriend the way she was going. Jealous he wasn't getting the patch. Oh, I know. He wouldn't shut up about Abe Holden. Abe Ford. Ford. Whatever. I knew it was some kind of car. I laughed, wondering what Abe would make of the casual dismissal of his name. What? Ran at him, looking at me suspiciously. to one of your best friends. She looked at me smugly, as if she could read something in my face I wasn't aware of myself. I hate that. She shrugged casually and poured herself another water. I wonder if this came from a river in Egypt. You would know. I ignored her. I have to go to this bloody barbecue this weekend. Will it be that bad? Declan asked. As usual, we were not together physically. We were connected only by signals that bounced off towers and satellites. I lay in bed with Maggie. Deck was in his own bed, which I could now picture, seeing as how I had actually been in it. If we were in a movie, they would have shown us on a split screen to give the illusion of togetherness. But in real life, he couldn't feel any further away. I'm considering throwing myself under a tram to get out of it. Not a train. No, I don't want to kill myself. Just maim myself slightly. Well, I don't want you killed or even maimed. Just suck it up and go. What, to see my brother's latest squeeze pretending to be the last in the long line of squeezes? Hoping to be the Annette Benning to his Warren Beatty? And the rest of my family ignoring the fact that I'm queer so they can keep pretending one day I'll bring home a pretty girl. I thought you said your mother was starting to come around to the idea that eventually you'd be bringing home somebody with a penis. I choked back my laughter. Okay, Mom, maybe. But Dad and Tim? Never. Well, Tim only for the controversy. There was the big fat elephant in the room we were avoiding. The fact that I did have a squeeze, and there was no way, given his profession, that he would ever be coming to a Murray family barbecue. Maybe you can take Roger and Fran along to help save your sanity, Declan suggested. I've suggested them to enough Murray events, I shuddered. 
This one I'll have to suffer on my own. So you're the gay one. I almost choked on my beer. Tim laughed, Dad stared at his feet, and Mum hovered over the table while looking suitably confused and harried at the same time. Yeah, changed my name by deed poll and everything, I told her. Huh? She didn't exactly get it. Her name was Gabby Spencer, and I think deep down she really meant well. She knew it was politically correct to show the fag that she was really down and all with him, as long as he didn't kiss another fag, hold his hand, or breathe in front of her. My brother, of course, was besotted with her. For now. Sausages? My mother asked breezily. I had to cough behind my napkin to stop from bursting into hysterical laughter. Tim wasn't so subtle. So what do you do? Gabby asked me, leaning in as if we were best friends about to disclose confidences to one another. Do you mean sexually? I whispered back. Oh, gross, Tim said. What's gross? Dad asked of Tim, not having heard me. Simon's about to. The weather report's on, dear, Mum told Dad to avert a crisis. Dad's eyes lit up and he disappeared into the lounge to see the tail end of the nightly news. Tim and I snickered together at this old habit you could set a watch by, a brief moment of camaraderie between us that would soon disappear. Tim murmured something into Gabby's ear, and that brief exchange ended up being the only direct conversation we had the whole night. Once the food was devoured, Dad went in to watch the news channel. Tim and Gabby were lost in their own little world, which was verging on the inappropriate, at least for the dinner table. And of course, nobody was helping Mum clear up, so I had to take up the slack. Mum's lips pursed unhappily as she scrubbed away at the grill. The atmosphere in the room would have made a new ageist run for some cleansing crystals, but I had to stick it out. What's wrong, Mum? Nothing, Simon. She lied through gaunt, grimaced lips. She was never good at lying. It was just that Dad and Tim were too oblivious to anyone's feelings but their own to ever pick up on it. I know something's bothering you. I snuck a quick peek out the kitchen door to make sure Tim and Gabby were going at it in the dining room and Dad in the lounge. The enemy camps were still in their respective positions. Tim was copping a feel under Gabby's cardi. Just leave it. I shrugged. Okay. And counted to five in my head. Mum was just like Roger. Although she wanted to have stuff wheedled out of her, she would snap far quicker if you feigned nonchalance. It's just that you sat there a few weeks ago. In the kitchen? Don't start. In the dining room. She fumed. And you told me that you weren't seeing anyone. This again? Was she trying for some Mother of the Year award? Had she been brainwashed by an Aussie chapter of P-Flag? I wasn't. I said feebly. Are you now? she asked. I couldn't answer her. It would just lead to more questions. So now another woman was giving me that look, which suggested she could read far more on my face than I would ever say out loud. She and Fran could start up a support group, and then maybe they could let me in on their little secrets that they shared about me. And if only I knew them, I would be able to sort out my own life once and for all. I would just like you to talk to me. That caused a long, smoldering ember within me to suddenly light up. Like you did to me when I first came out. She turned her attention back to the grill. I had to take time to digest it all. Six years? I asked incredulously. Well, I'm sorry I'm not perfect. Here it was, the guilt trip to make me feel bad, because everybody else had caused me to feel like I was less than them. And it worked, because I did feel bad. 
but I had to continue standing up for myself because nobody else in the family was going to take up my cause. I'm sorry, but I'm not perfect either. Your brother talks to me. I thought of Tim groping his girlfriend at the dinner table. That must make you so happy. Yes, it does. At least he's telling me who he's seeing, what he does at work and on the weekends, and what he wants to do in the future. I have no idea what's going on in your life, because none of you have shown any interest lately, so I don't bother. It sounded harsher than I meant it, and I was horribly rewarded with the sound of a sob escaping from her. Here was one person in my family finally talking to me in a normal way, and I was tearing strips off her for it. You're so hard to talk to, she whispered. I wish I could. So do I, I said truthfully. Why is Mum crying? Fucking Tim. I threw the tea towel at him from where he lounged in the doorway. Get out of here. Calm down, arsehole, he yelled. I just came in to get beer. I yanked the fridge door open and shoved two cans at him. Here. I need one for Dad, too. I practically threw the third at him. Yet. Thankfully, he did so. You should be nicer to him, Mum sniffed. I should be a lot of things, I fumed. Maybe he should be nicer to me. I saw Fran at the plaza today, Mum said suddenly, ignoring my last comment. Fran? What did she have to do with all this? Oh, was all I said, wondering if Fran had recently taken out life insurance. I asked her if you were seeing someone, and she fudged her way around it, but I could tell she was covering up for you. I sighed. It's complicated. Everything with you always is, Mum said tiredly. Even when you were a kid, nothing was ever simple. I wanted to rail against her for turning it all back to her and making it somehow why she should be pitied because obviously I was so hard to raise. But here was someone in my family trying to talk to me about my private life for the first time in years, and I felt a sudden rush of affection for her. Maybe it had taken her a while to come around naturally, or maybe she had finally realized that this wasn't a phase or a choice I had made to continually make her life difficult. For the first time, it felt like she was on my side, He's in the closet, I said, and I have to respect his privacy. Oh, Mum said, giving up on the grill and letting it fall like a doomed ocean liner beneath the water in the sink. She turned her attentions to the kettle and switched it on. I thought maybe you were too embarrassed to bring him over here. No, I lied for her sake, while trying to imagine Declan here. It would be hard enough if he wasn't Declan Tyler to put up with my brother's pointed digs and my father's silences. But his celebrity would bring a whole new, unwelcome angle to it all. Like I said, it's for his privacy. That's a hard way to live, she said, not knowing how astute her comment was. I said nothing, and I think for once Mum sensed that she should let the subject drop. Maybe we can talk some other time, she suggested. And it suddenly didn't seem so bad to think about that happening. Sure, some other time. It's good that your mum is starting to show some interest, Declan said. It gives me hope that maybe my mum will be fine if I tell her outright, rather than keeping her guessing. I couldn't help but notice the if, not when, but I repressed it. I had called Deck as soon as I had gotten home. Abe and Lisa were over, but he'd excused himself to take the call in his bedroom. You never know, I replied. Do you ever think about telling her? There was a long pause. All the time, he said sadly. Trying to sound as light-hearted as possible, I said, well, mine sounds practically ready to adopt you, and she doesn't even know who you are yet. This made him laugh. 
It's always good to have a fallback position. By the way, Abe and Lisa say hello. Say hello back. I will. I suppose you have to get back to them. I suppose so. So, no chance of you flying down here for the rest of the weekend. I laughed, but it was nice to hear the longing in his voice. Not enough frequent flyer points. Just as well I'll be up next weekend, then. It's the only thing helping me hold on, I said as melodramatically as possible. Bastard, he chuckled. Oh, also, all the guys are coming over here tomorrow night, so it's probably best neither of us call. That took the wind out of my sails a bit. Although the logical side of me understood the necessity of laying it all out on the table to avoid any awkward scenarios. Uh, okay. He hesitated. You're not upset, are you? Fuck no, I said hurriedly. I'll speak to you on Monday. Okay, have a good night's sleep, babe. You too, Deck, I said, unable to return the term of endearment. I was lucky Fran wasn't around to conk me with another bread roll. As I tried to fall asleep, I could hear my mother saying, That's a hard way to live. Shut up, Mum, I murmured, and finally slept. Chapter 14 Saturday night? Roger asked. That's the plan, if it's okay with you guys. He's back in town this weekend for the game. How did I get roped into cooking? Fran demanded. Your husband, I told her. Thanks, you dauber, Roger groaned. Gee, she never would have guessed it, I pointed out. I tried to make peace with Fran. I'll come over and help you, of course. Thanks, Simon, that would be nice. But I'll also make sure Roger does his fair share as well. I chuckled, and Roger threw a cushion at me. We had left the porch to come in and seek sanctuary at the fire. It was a typical winter Melbourne day. The Antarctic winds were in full force as they tore through your skin and bones to reside in your marrow. I wonder what I should make. Fran mused. Whatever's easy and good, I told her. You do make the best pasta, Roger agreed. Pasta? Fran wrinkled her nose. I can't just make bog ordinary pasta for Declan. Sure you can, I patted her hand gently. He needs to be introduced to how good your pasta is. But I should be cracking out the Jamie Oliver or Bill Granger's. Who wants that when they can have a Francesca date in original? She sighed. Fine. But at some other time I have to try something new. Okay. Bloody pasta, she muttered to herself. Maybe lasagna. I grinned. It seemed this night was going to be okay after all. The rain never let up that weekend. Declan flew in on Friday morning for a game that night. And once again, he was told he couldn't play at the last minute. He spoke to me briefly on the phone, but was short and snappy and very undeclan like He called me again two minutes later to apologize, but had to get off the phone straight away to attend a press conference. I hoped after the game he might turn up on my doorstep, but he texted me in the wake of the Devils losing another match to say he was tired and was going to crash at his parents, but would see me at dinner the next night. So I was starting to get some nerves about dinner, but when I went around to help Fran prepare the food, she managed to put me at ease by just being herself. She had decided to go with lasagna and had even made her own sheets, cranking them out by hand. You didn't have to go to so much trouble. I told her. It's no trouble at all, she smiled. Make Roger go out and pick some basil. I'd send you, but you'd come back with grass. I'm not that bad, I protested. I know what basil smells like, so I'd be able to find it just through that. After pulling up all my plants by the roots, on this one I'm still going to trust Roger, she laughed. 
I'd go with you on anything else, hon. I shook my head, and when Roger next ambled through the kitchen, he was quickly dispatched to cut basil. Fran and I worked industriously over the next couple of hours, making garlic loaves from scratch and struggling with the blender to create chili, cashew, and parmesan dip for munchies before dinner. Roger managed to avoid most culinary activities, but was very good at getting us drinks. By the time we had everything prepared, I was pleasantly sloshed, and Fran acted as surly bartender with a heart of gold, suspending my drink privileges at least until Declan arrived. Drunk is not going to look good on you when he turns up, she said wisely. A quick shower and a change of clothes helped sober me up, and the elation of alcohol turned back into the frayed nerves I had been feeling beforehand. I hid in Roger and Fran's spare bedroom for a while, until Fran knocked at the door. Are you okay? Yeah, fine, yeah. She frowned. You sure sound it. Are you that scared we're going to fuck it up? I glared at her. Please. That sounds more like you. It's always nerve-wracking to introduce the friends, you know that. She sat next to me on the bed. I hardly know. You're always trying to get out of it for as long as possible. Usually until they're out of the picture and there's no point anymore. It's not because of you guys. Is it because of them? I sighed. Partly. But mostly because of me. What about you? Then it struck her. Oh, that again. What again? Showing anyone your feelings about them. We've seen you cry at Disney films or RSPCA commercials. But if there's an actual human involved, you may as well be a robot. I'm not that bad. Okay, slight exaggeration, but pretty damned close. We sat in silence for a moment, and Fran suddenly nudged me. Is it Roger? I didn't want to admit it. He's been acting a bit funny lately, only a bit. He's jealous, Fran admitted. I turned to look at her properly, shock obviously evident on my face. Oh, come on, Fran said, exasperated. He's never really had to put up with you being loopy over someone before. He's always been the alpha male in your life, and all of a sudden Declan Tyler has made you change your mind about everything. You make it sound like I've become a mindless drone. No, just that you've become part of a couple. Although you probably still think that's all about being a mindless drone. When all it means is that someone is now extremely important to you. Someone equal to your friends, if not on a different level altogether. I've always hated that distinction being made between how much you care for people. But you do fall victim to that mentality. I've always known that you two are more important to each other than I am to you, so why can't he accept that? She took my hand. Not more important, just different. It's like there are two separate ranking systems. You're number one on the other system. It's not about Sophie's bloody choice. I leaned over and whispered into her ear. I'd choose you. Fran laughed and pushed me away. You are such a liar. I grabbed her hand back and kissed her knuckles. Thank you. She shook her head, smiling. Just go easy on Roger. You can both be stubborn shits, but this is just as new for him as it is for you. Why isn't it for you? Fran looked at me as if the answer wasn't already obvious. Because I'm a woman. We're smarter about these things. Rather than try to defend my sex, I just accepted it as truth. She pulled me up, and we made our way back to the kitchen. When there was a knock at the door, Fran pushed me out of the kitchen. You answer it. It'll give you time to make out a little before bringing him in. I could hear Roger snort behind me as I made some sort of protestation. Finding myself now alone in the hallway, 
I covered the short distance to the front door and pulled it open. Declan was dressed in black jeans and a dark purple shirt that managed to cling in exactly the right places. I wondered if my tongue was hanging out like a character in a Looney Tunes cartoon. Hey, he said, moving in to kiss me. He tried to hug me at the same time, but it was awkward as his hands were full with beer and other things I couldn't exactly make out in the dark. I tried to compensate by grabbing him by the hips and pressing him against me. The beer bottles clanged together with enough noise to alert the neighborhood to our presence, but we ignored it. How are your folks? I asked politely as I closed the door behind him. He looked a bit surprised that I asked, but nodded. Good. They were glad I was staying with them. I usually tend to sleep around. I burst into laughter and he looked mortified. Not in that way, doofus. I meant around other friends' houses. I pushed him against the hallway wall and penned him in with my body. I hope not other friends like me. He went to kiss me, but I teasingly ducked my head so it blocked him. Not like you. But I always like it when I stay at your house the best. I looked up. Yeah, my sleepovers rock. Before he could answer, I kissed him again. The beer bottles slipped out of his grip and we fumbled between us so they wouldn't fall. We'd better get these inside, he murmured. We composed ourselves and entered the lion's den. Fran and Roger tried to look like they weren't waiting for us to enter, but they didn't pull it off in the slightest. As I entered the kitchen, they practically ran up to me to be the first in line to meet Declan Tyler, trademark pending. Declan seemed to be wearing his best face-the-scrum expression. Not surprising, seeing their first meeting had been less than auspicious. Fran, Roger, this is... Declan, Declan Tyler, Roger said, grabbing Declan's hand and pumping it furiously. Hi, Roger, Declan said, amused. Roger, Roger Dayton. Roger replied not hearing his name already being mentioned and feeling he had to introduce himself. Fran pushed him aside and managed a handshake, although she found it difficult to pull her husband's paw out of Declan's. Hi, Declan. I know we've already met, but it's nice to see you again. I could see Declan falling prey to her charms immediately. You too, Fran. Whatever you're making, it smells delicious. Fran giggled. Simon helped, a little bit. Hey, I protested. She ignored me, of course. Now, Simon mentioned something about you owing me a kiss. Declan laughed, Roger perked up, and I groaned inwardly. My boyfriend scratched at the back of his head bemusedly. I guess I did say that. Fran was starting to look a little bit like Miss Piggy eyeing Kermit. Then she laughed and pulled back. The sentiment's enough. I see you brought beer. That'll do. I swear, for almost a second, Deck looked disappointed. So much for trying to avoid the footballer slut image, but I was amused. He handed over the beer to Roger, who also looked relieved, although you could almost believe he was slightly disappointed that his wife hadn't been kissed by Declan Tyler as well. I knew you'd have coffee, Declan said, but I also brought you a special Tasmanian blend to try. And he fished out a large silver bag that I had seen him buy at Salamanca, but had thought nothing of it at the time, especially seeing as Abe's addiction for caffeine was almost as bad as mine. That's really lovely of you, Fran said, touched. Roger was more pleased with the beer, of course. I could see him itching to ask Declan a million questions about the AFL, but he was really trying to be on his best behavior and treat Deck as the normal human being he was meant to be. Once the dip had been consumed, Roger became more like his usual self. He started to ask everything he wanted to know, and Declan humored him. Fran was up to her old tricks of making sure everything was running smoothly. She pulled me out into the hallway and asked how I thought it was all going. Fine, don't you think so? 
She held up a finger as she cocked her head and then yelled into the kitchen, Roger, don't ask that. You are such a multitasker, I said admiringly. I know, she grinned. And for the record, yes, it's going well. You two are disgustingly cute together. I gave her a quick kiss. Gross, but thank you. No sooner had we stepped back in, Bran managed to get Roger away from the table by claiming they needed to grab more firewood, and Declan and I were left alone for the first time since he walked in the door. Okay, is it unbearable? I asked. Declan took a swig of his beer. Roger? No, I've met worse. I bet you once this night is over, he'll get past the glamour of it all and see me as just another schmo. Man, I hope so, I said. He gave my hand a brief squeeze. You'll see. Fran's probably reading him the riot act right now. I like them both. They're like a crazier Abe and Lisa. I laughed. You got that right. I thought of my friends with great affection and how easy it could be to get used to this. As Declan stood to clear some of the debris on the table, I came up behind him and hugged him close. His hands closed over mine, and he leaned back to take my kiss. I cheekily arched a finger and teased his nipple through the fabric of his shirt, and he breathed heavily into my mouth. God, not here. I let him go, and he sat down quickly, his face red. You are such a bastard, he said shakily. I bent down and kissed him again. You are staying over tonight, yeah? I think you're definitely going to have to put out, yes. Perfect night, I sighed, and I fetched us fresh beers from the fridge. I had just sat back down opposite Declan when Fran and Roger reappeared. The lack of firewood in their hands proved that their excursion was the ruse I expected. Declan self-consciously adjusted the front of his shirt slightly, and I grinned to myself as I imagined him stripping out of it later. No firewood? I asked innocently. We've run out, Fran said smoothly. I should have realized, but I think it's time for the lasagna. Roger took his seat at the foot of the table again, while Fran busied herself with the oven. Fran does the best lasagna, I told Declan. Not as good as my mom's, Fran said self-depreciatingly placing the gourmet extravaganza in question on the table before us as artwork. I don't know, I said. They're pretty much on par. Yeah, Roger said, taking a swig of his beer. Maybe you'll try it one day, Declan. Everybody froze uncomfortably for a second or so. Declan broke it by smiling and saying quietly, I hope so. But for now, I can't imagine anything tasting better than this. Fran rested her hand upon his arm briefly, and as she walked away, she shot a glare at Roger, only I noticed. Roger was too busy peeling the label off his beer bottle, a nervous habit that he had never seemed to grow out of. It also made me feel slightly wary something wasn't quite right with him. We started serving ourselves, and a huge bowl of garlic bread was passed around. Fran and I had decided the no-garlic rule only existed for the first two weeks of a relationship. So now I was home free, and I made sure I loaded up my plate with the offending foodstuff. Oh, this is good, Declan said appreciatively after only the first bite. I told you, I said while Fran looked pleased with herself. So, what are your intentions with Simon? Roger asked, out of the blue. The question obviously took Declan by surprise, as he started coughing. Roger! Fran exclaimed. I stared my best friend down, trying to decipher his intentions. But his face might as well have been carved from stone, and as such, it was unreadable. I can assure you, Declan said smoothly, or just as smoothly as he could when a mouthful of food had gone down the wrong way, that my intentions with Simon are completely honorable. 
He was trying to be casual and a little bit fun. But judging by Roger's sudden change in body language, it wasn't going to go down well. Like that mouthful of food. Sure, Roger said. But you're not out, right? Declan shook his head and laid down his fork, drawing his own battle line. Only to a few people, but publicly out? You'd already know if I was. Roger nodded. Well, Simon is. I know. Roger? I said calmly, although my voice scraped like unsheathed steel. No, Declan said gently. He wants to ask some questions. Let him get them out. Fran didn't look as amiable. She looked as if she was going to slash her husband's throat with a spatula. A dull one, crusted with melted cheese, to inflict as much pain as possible. So what does that mean? Roger continued. What does what mean? I asked dangerously. Well, it seems like Simon is sacrificing a hell of a lot, Roger said, still speaking to Declan rather than to all of us. What about you? I know he is, Declan agreed. Do you really? Roger asked. He now finished his beer and was pouring himself a glass of wine. Strangely enough, he started pouring everybody else a glass as well. I know it's hard for him, Declan began. I interrupted him, mad as hell and upset he was being made to justify himself. It's a decision I made. I'm not going into this blindly, Roger. And it's not something my own friends haven't pointed out to me, Declan said. Now I turned on him. What? Abe and Lisa said, I thought they liked me. They do. But they talked to you about this. Of course they did. What, Roger and Fran have never said anything about this? I fell silent, as he was right, and felt the gentle pressure of Fran's hand upon my shoulder. Strange that she should be the one trying to comfort me in this emotional shitstorm. Shouldn't it be Declan? See? Declan asked. What you're asking him to do is squeeze back into the closet with you, Roger said, and he shouldn't have to do it, not when it took him so much to come out himself. He shouldn't have to go back. Rog, shut up, I warned him. I'm your friend, so I get to say this, he shot back. We want to see you happy. And this situation is only going to get harder and harder. I mean, how long can you go on like this? We're taking it as it comes, I said, sounding unconvincing to everyone in the room. Declan? Roger asked, obviously trying to see if he could get more out of him. How long can it go on like this? You going to give a big speech on your retirement day, or just let it leak out gradually after that? You're only 27. You could still play professionally for at least another six or seven years. Does Simon get to wait around for that long, hiding in the shadows, pretending he doesn't exist to the outside world? This was all starting to sound a bit melodramatic for my taste, but Declan was staring down at his plate. No, he said softly. Maybe not. But that's my fucking decision, I said and I think it's worth it. Declan looked up at me and smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. This was meant to be a nice dinner, Fran murmured. Yeah, thanks, Roger, I said bitterly. You've really made a good impression. Hey, Declan said. He's trying to be a good friend. Don't defend him. Someone has to. He's going to be copying it from Fran when we leave. Fran said nothing, but her mutinous eyes declared Roger was living on borrowed time. What about the Brownlow? Roger asked. It seemed like the stupidest thing he could have brought up at this point in time, and Fran and I stared at each other in confusion. When I looked at Declan, however, I could see he knew what Roger was getting at. It's coming up in a few weeks, Roger prodded him. Declan nodded. Do you have a date? Declan sighed and folded his arms defensively against his chest. Yes, I do. 
I should have expected it, because I knew I would never be going to it. Yet hearing that affirmation hurt, especially because we hadn't had the opportunity to discuss it between ourselves, for him to explain it all and let me in on his plans. Who? I asked, trying to keep my tone light. My sister's friend, Jess, the same girl I took the year I won. Does she know you're gay? I asked. Declan nodded. We have an understanding. She's a friend. She likes to help out every now and again when I need a date for a function. Wow, that closet's getting a little full, Roger murmured. Shut the fuck up, Fran hissed at him. You've said enough. My chest felt tight from trying not to explode. I didn't know whether I just wanted to yell at everyone or go off somewhere and either scream or cry until this tightness went away. I wondered if this was what it felt like to have a heart attack. I was surprised I was still breathing normally. I managed to somehow get to my feet and stammer out, Yeah, look, I think I'm going to go. Simon, Fran said desperately. Roger stood up to follow me and I glared at him. Don't. All it took was that one word to stop him in his tracks. I gave Fran a quick kiss. Thanks. I'll call you tomorrow, she said. The last thing I wanted to do was speak to anybody, but I nodded. I didn't want her to think I was going to ignore her again like last time. Last time. This was becoming a bit too frequent and repetitive for my liking. As I stumbled out into the hallway, I heard Declan make his apologies to Fran. He even said goodbye to Roger, although it was a terse one. I was fumbling with my car keys, trying to open up the door when he came up behind me. Hey, he said tenderly. I'm sorry, I said. What for? Just Abe and Lisa. This has nothing to do with Abe and Lisa. But they were so nice to me, and my friends attack you. Fran was perfectly lovely. Roger, well, he was trying to defend you. I can't be pissed off with him for that, although I can be pissed off in a lot of other ways. Stop sounding like you're on his side. He took my keys from me and unlocked the door himself. I'm on your side, he said, passing the keys back. Well, I'm on yours, so I can be pissed off for you. Good thing we're on each other's sides, then, he mused, because it'll be hell if we start in on each other, too. Damn, he looked pretty in the moonlight. Okay, technically it was the fluorescent glow from a street light, but he still looked pretty. We have to be, I told him. Can I still come over? I wanted to kiss him out on the street under the light, but I knew I couldn't. Like you had to ask? After that in there, I thought it was best. See you back at home. I felt his hand briefly on my hip, but it was gone just as quick. I got into my car and looked up to see Fran standing on the front porch. She gave a small wave, and I gave her one back. Then I savagely threw the car into reverse and got the hell out of Dodge. Declan wasn't far behind me. I was only getting out of my car when he pulled into my driveway. I'm calling for pizza, I told him. Strangely enough, I'm starving. He grinned. Me too. It must be because of that huge lack of food we got to eat. Maggie was surly when I got in the door. I fed her, ordered pizza, and let Declan fetch me a beer. We didn't speak much. It wasn't until the pizza arrived and we were finally getting food into our bellies that we started to talk. This is in no way as good as Fran's lasagna, I told him. I have to agree, but it's warm and I'm hungry, so pass me another slice. My phone rang, and I could tell from the caller ID it was either Fran or Roger. I let the answering machine get it and turned it down so I wouldn't have to listen. 
You're going to have to talk to him sometime. Not tonight. Probably not for a while. Just don't freeze Fran out. She doesn't deserve to get caught in the middle. I won't, I replied. But she'll be in the middle anyway. I put my plate down, suddenly not hungry anymore. Hey, Declan said simply, and he put his plate down as well. He pulled me over to him, and I sank into his warmth. His arms came around me, and as much as every inner demon within me was screaming to resist, I let myself go limp and closed my eyes, taking comfort in him and feeling soothed. I felt my anger fade away in those moments I lay there, while the soft and steady thump of his heart close to my ear calmed me out of my natural skittishness. Was this what love was like? The mere thought of the word made me want to yak like a cat with a hairball, but even though I could now put a word to it, I still couldn't say it. I didn't know what I thought I would lose, but everything around us seemed, or felt, precarious, and I didn't want to tip the balance any further when we seemed to have found a moment of calm in the eye of the storm. The real talk, of course, happened under the cover of darkness in the bedroom. She's pretty, I said. I could sense Declan wanting to say, who, and pretending he didn't know straight away what I was referring to. But he just sighed and said, yes. She looks good on you, I pressed further. He gave a short laugh. Jess isn't a suit. I remember her vaguely from all the photos of you in the papers when you won the Brownlow. I guess anyone couldn't help but miss it. Why does she do it? Because she's my friend. There isn't anything more than that? He hesitated before replying. I wonder how Roger knew. I sat up finally, sensing we wouldn't be sleeping for a while. Knew what? He made that comment about how crowded the closet was. It dawned on me. She's gay? He motioned for me to lie back down again. Yeah. I slid back down, and we recommenced cuddling. So it's a relationship of convenience. It's not a relationship. We just help each other out. But doesn't that make her family think that you're a couple? It's amazing what people won't ask when you act deliberately vague about it all. I just thought they hadn't crossed the right people. I seemed surrounded by those who wanted to know everything about you in excruciating detail as soon as they were formally introduced. But it's been two years since you won the Brownlow. Jess gets the feeling we're considered to be an on-again, off-again couple. It helps that I live in another state. I dug my chin into his shoulder. So you're on again for the Brownlow. You can't go there alone. That would be a hell of a way to stand out. I thought of the blue carpet ceremony, which had been introduced in the past decade, a crass offshoot stolen from American award shows, where the footballers and their girlfriends had to parade like cattle. The girls would have to name drop their designers, and the boys would be stumped when it came to remembering where they hired their suits. Turning up without a girl would be tantamount to career suicide and endless speculation. Yeah, it sure would. In a better world, I'd be taking you. I laughed. And I'd be taking advantage of the free booze. Declan lifted my chin so I could see how his eyes were pleading his case for him. You're not pissed off. At the world, maybe, I admitted. But not you. He kissed me, and his hands began wandering south. I threw back my head and moaned softly as his mouth traveled down to the hollow of my neck. Deck? He looked up. Yeah? These favors you and Jess have, how far do they go? Huh? Like in a few years, you're not going to be harvesting your sperm for her children, are you? Simon, he said tiredly. You're really going to have to learn to be quiet when someone is trying to seduce you. 
My body agreed, because in a few seconds Jess and her possible future spawn were the last thing on my mind. Chapter 15 I was thinking. I heard Declan murmur through some fuzzy part of my brain. And I was sleeping, I groaned. I felt my head shoved down into the pillow, and I struggled out from under his hand. Okay, okay, I'm awake. Now. Satisfied, Declan rolled over, half onto my chest, which he tapped with his finger. Ow! I said pettily. Baby, he said, and it wasn't a term of endearment. I yawned and tried to give him my full attention. What were you thinking? He looked a bit apprehensive, which I didn't like at all. It usually means bad things are coming your way. I was considering buying some real estate. Huh. Okay, I certainly wasn't expecting that revelation. You already own an apartment. Yeah, in Hobart. I was thinking of buying something here. My own mortgage was crippling me. I couldn't even comprehend how someone could get, or even want, to. How can you afford it? Declan suddenly was extremely interested in a button on the Duna cover, as he said softly, Well, I've already paid off that apartment. I tended to forget he was Mr. Moneybags. Okay. Look, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. Are you sure you're a professional footy player? Simon, he said, in all seriousness. Sorry, continue. So I've always been good with my money. Please don't tell me you have investments in stocks. I can't go out with someone who has that. A little smirk tugged at the corner of his lips. I have investments in stocks. I began pummeling him with the pillow. That's it. We have to break up. He defended himself easily by grabbing the pillow and whacking me soundly. My brother-in-law is an accountant. They know how to do these things. Okay, I said. But why here? Because I don't have an anywhere here. I split my time in Melbourne between here, my folks' house, my friends' houses, and hotel rooms paid for by the club. I have enough money that I could get a mortgage and buy a second place. I mean, I'm going to need one when my contract ends. But that's a while away. Only one more season. It was a three-year contract. So you want to come back and play in Melbourne? He nodded. It's always been my plan. But will the devils let you go? After the amount of money they paid for me and the little return they got for it, he said, sounding for a moment like one of the many whiners who wrote into the papers or called talkback radio to rant about his injuries. I think they'll be glad to get rid of me, especially as they'll be able to tell the press it was a mutual understanding. I leaned my forehead against his. After the op, they'll be singing a different tune. They always do. Then it will be about how they saw you through the hard times, and it was all worth it. He gave me a sweet kiss. Thanks, but I still want to come home. I imagined Declan here permanently, and it was a nice prospect. We wouldn't be continually split and doing a part-time, long-distance relationship. I pushed away Roger's nagging voice with all his doubts from the night before. Any other reason? He smiled ruefully. I have to admit, you have a bit to do with it. How? Well, if I have my own place, people will expect me to be there. No more keeping up the pretense of staying with friends or having to fulfill expectations of being on tap at a big, fancy hotel. It means we would see each other more often. But there would still be pretense involved. I couldn't say that, though. Sounds good to me. Where would you buy? Somewhere you'd hate, he grinned. The Docklands. I did groan slightly. The Docklands were even worse than where he was currently living in Hobart. Once again, 
he would be buying into a waterfront that had been yuppified out of its previously sleazy state, into a prepared, secure community with no charm. Oh, come on, Declan protested. We can't all be bohemians like you in North Brunswick, which, you know, is becoming more gentrified every year. I guess you need the security, I admitted grudgingly. He scoffed at this. I'm not being mobbed on the streets. No, but I could imagine why the Docklands would be more appealing to you. Nice views, too. You liked my view in Tassie. It was the view inside that sold me more. He shook his head. Nuff, nuff. I laughed, but conceded defeat. Hey, if it means I'll see you more, I'm not complaining. He whacked me again with the pillow. Come on, it's too nice a day to stay inside. Let's go out. Out? Out into the fresh air and sunlight and... Outside? We'll go for a run on the beach. Perfect cover. A run? He was thinking of making me exercise? He laughed at the horror obviously etched on my face. Surely you must have something you could wear. I didn't think I looked the part of jogging companion. True, I had tracky dax, but those combined with my cons and a faded no-blood-for-oil long sleeve from a protest during my uni days didn't exactly sell me as someone who would be out running with Declan Tyler. You'll do, he said, trying not to laugh. I left him to finish dressing as he continued to towel his hair dry. I fed Maggie, and on my way out of the kitchen, was reminded of the light flashing on the base of the phone. Roger's message. Or it could be Fran. I sighed dramatically and pressed the button just to listen to it. Hey, Simon, it's me, said the life of the party himself. I just wanted to ring and apologize for what I said. You know I meant well, although Fran says that isn't an excuse. Can you call me back? Oh, and if Declan is there, I'm sorry, mate. I hope you don't hold it against me. You have to call him back, Declan said, coming up behind me. No, I don't. I pushed the delete button a little more firmly than I intended. It's not that simple. It would be if you called him now. Leaving it will make it worse. Later, I told him. We're going for a run. I almost shuddered. I couldn't believe I could say that so casually and still live. Declan shook his head sadly. You are such a stubborn shit. He sounded like Fran when he said that. She sure didn't kiss me like he did, though. Declan looked the part, at least. His trackies were form-fitting and tucked neatly into his $400 sneakers. He wore a singlet under his lightweight long sleeve, ready to be discarded once he worked up a sweat. A baseball cap was pulled low on his brow, and large wrap-around sunglasses were in place to hopefully obscure his features. Together, we were one of these things is not like the other. We drove a little further down from St. Kilda Beach, where there would be fewer people, and the sand wouldn't be a minefield of discarded syringes. Declan grinned at me easily before he started stretching to loosen up. I stood still, wrapping my arms around myself to try and ward off the chill winds, watching him perform some arcane sacrificial rite. You have to loosen up first, he instructed me, or else you'll feel it later. There were so many places one could go with that comment, but I asked, you're not seriously expecting me to run, are you? I thought that was the point, he said amiably. I thought I would just be finding a cafe and read the paper while you got your jollies pounding the sand, I replied. Then you thought wrong, he said sternly. Declan had suddenly gone from boyfriend to the P.E. instructor from hell in all of twenty seconds. Cowed, I began imitating his stretches. My muscles began protesting almost immediately. He swung his leg easily over a park bench so he could bend over and flex his toes. 
I struggled to do the same move and almost fell over. You're just acting up, he scoffed. Unfortunately, I wasn't, but I wasn't sure I wanted to admit to it and shatter his fantasies. Declan clapped his hands together. Let's go. I could hear the blood pounding louder in my ears than the actual crash of the waves against the sand. I thought of strokes and heart attacks of the medics being summoned to the beach and being mentioned in the papers as and friend again, with a photo of Declan looking concerned but distant. Immediately I was panting and wishing for a shark to suddenly grow legs and waddle out of the surf and eat me and put me out of my misery. In fact, I would have willingly thrown myself into its mouth. Declan jogged easily, not even having broken a sweat at this stage his long, lean legs propelling him forward with seemingly no effort. I had to yank at the waistband of my trackies as they kept threatening to slide down and trip me over. The sand, damp with the tide, kicked up divots as I ran. Declan's feet skipped over the surface, Jesus walking on the water. Time to pick up the pace, he called over his shoulder. Pick up the pace? I was already at full speed. He sprinted away, his firm arse acting as a beacon to lure me further. I stopped, bending back with my hands on my hips, trying to catch my breath back. Declan quickly blurred into a vague shape in the distance while I hacked my lungs up. Once I could breathe again, stars still shimmering in my vision, I began walking, so that if he returned he could see that I hadn't given up completely. A few other joggers passed me by in both directions, and I was embarrassed by an elderly couple who had to walk around me as I was slowing them down. Their extremely fat golden retriever still breathed far easier than I did. After some time, a jogger in the distance revealed himself to be Declan. He was sweating a bit now as he ran back toward me. I smiled at him sheepishly. To show off, he continued to run backwards in circles around me as I walked. Didn't have to worry about this undercover thing too much, did we? He asked. I turned around and you were nowhere to be seen. All part of my master plan, I said innocently. He shook his head. Why don't you just go and get coffee and I'll meet you back there. I'm just going to run a bit further. Sure. Anything to get me out of the exercise regime. Declan started sprinting off again, and this time it was my turn to shake my head at the thousand and one things that could have been done with this time. I headed towards the cafe across from the car park. After ordering two lattes to go, I headed back to the beach, a little way down from the main thoroughfare of people, and parked my butt on the sand with a dune as my backrest. The natural athlete that was Declan Tyler trademark pending, didn't waste any time in covering the ground that had taken me a good while to cross. Instead of plonking himself down next to me, he took a few moments to stretch once more. You're so fucking professional, I teased. When are they hiring you to do a workout DVD? Piss off, he ragged back, stripping off the long sleeve and throwing it in my face. You have the stamina of a chronic invalid with emphysema, and you don't even smoke. You should be ashamed of yourself. As he finally sat beside me, I asked in a low murmur, Would you rather have a jock boyfriend who could run with you? He took his coffee and shook his head. If it's not you, no. I tried not to be distracted by his golden shoulders. Even when relaxing, they were bunched with toned muscle that I could never hope to achieve. These were the same arms that held me when I slept, I marveled. Would you rather I become a jock? Declan laughed. Then you wouldn't be Simon. That was a scary thought. Would you rather have an arty wanker boyfriend? It was now apparently Declan's turn to play the game. No. I said honestly. I like the differences between us. We watched the waves, and their wake inched closer toward us as we sat in comfortable silence. 
I could tell he wanted to put his arm around me as we watched the ocean, sitting there like any normal couple. I wanted to put my arms around him as well and let my head rest in his lap. The few people that passed us paid little, if any, attention to our presence. Maybe we were too paranoid, but Declan's celebrity helped foster that. Mind you, we were sitting on the beach in a typical Melbourne winter day. It wasn't like we were sitting al fresco at a cafe on Brunswick Street, where all the sensible people would be. As it always was with us, our time together ended too quickly. Before we even realized it, it was time to drive back to my place and for Declan to shower and pack before heading out to the airport. Call Roger, Declan said as he kissed me goodbye. You call him, I said childishly. He shook his head and kissed me again. Speak to you soon. The house seemed empty without him. I turned on the stereo, loud, to fill the leftover space. I didn't call Roger back, of course, although he tried three times that afternoon. I did answer when Fran's mobile number displayed up on caller ID, but it was Roger's voice through the earpiece, so I hung up immediately. A few minutes afterwards, I received a text from her saying she hadn't put him up to it and would I please call her at work tomorrow. I had an early night after checking in with Declan, who had arrived home safely and was preparing to go out to dinner with Abe and Lisa. Wish you were here, he said breezily, and I found myself feeling terribly lonely. So I was determined that I wouldn't be stupid and shut Fran out again, just because Roger was being a dick. She sounded surprised when I called her at exactly a minute past nine. I haven't even had coffee yet she said ruefully. Have you? Yep, and it's wonderful. Bastard, you must have gotten in early. I did. And then the awkward pause. I turned slowly in my chair to watch the crowds still streaming out of Flinders Street Station below me. It was always surprising how many people seemed to be late for work every day. Of course, I was making a gross generalization. Maybe they didn't all start at nine but I was sure a fair few of them were late. Simon? Sorry, just distracted. What did you say? Just, I'm not sure if I should bring up Saturday night, or whether we should just pretend that nothing happened. I don't think we can pretend nothing happened. Meet me for lunch? It was a busy day for me, but I had to agree so she wouldn't think I was pissed with her. Great. Fran? Yeah? You're not going to try and bring Raj, are you? In some misguided attempt to set things right. She took a deep breath. Han, I'm not stupid. I shouldn't have doubted her. It was dim-witted of me. Okay, see you at one. You're lucky I didn't turn up with a camera crew, I said easily before I sat with Fran. She grimaced. Alice Provatna again? Yeah, I've got meetings all day. She thinks they'll be interesting. Our definitions of that word are not one and the same. And she seemed to think this was a business lunch. Thank God you put her off. How did you convince her? I told her you were my mistress, I teased. Hopefully not on camera, just in case any of my family ever get to see it. What, you don't think we'd make a great couple? She raised an eyebrow. My family would agree. Well, knowing your husband, hey, she warned. I put up my hands in surrender. Sorry, I had to get in one cheap shot. Fran shrugged and picked up the menu, even though I knew she had already chosen what she wanted before even arriving at the restaurant. I'll give you one. All the rest will be earned, though. Let me just say, though, Simon, he is really upset. Boo fucking who? She glared over the top of the menu. I said only one cheap shot. The waiter took our orders, and I could no longer hide behind my menu shield. It was time to come out swinging. 
So, he's bloody upset. It can't all be about him. He attacked us. I know, but he knows he's screwed up, and now he wants to fix it. And I want to lick my wounds for a little while. Get Declan to do it. Maybe it'll speed up the process. I glared at her. It's a joke, Simon. We used to be able to do that. I took a sip of my water, something to distract me so I didn't blurt out a friendship-ending insult. Well, I'm not feeling very funny at the moment. You have to forgive him sometime. I know, Fran. We've been friends for over sixteen years. This isn't the end of it. But I just need some time at the moment. I just can't pretend everything's hunky-dory just because he's feeling guilty and wants it stopped. She nodded. It's just he's my husband, so I have to defend him. Damn it. Her bright eyes were getting to me as she sincerely was trying not to cry. I know, Fran. But how you're feeling at the moment? That's what I feel about Deck. I have to defend him because of what Roger said. She reached over and took my hand. I get it. How is Deck? He's fine. Defending Roger as much as you are, surprisingly enough. That's why I like him. Fran gave a delicate sniff, trying to compose herself. He's very fair-minded. Maybe too much, I agreed. I'm still trying to find his faults. He has them. Fran laughed softly. We all do. I guess he did try to torture me yesterday with a run on the beach. Fran began to choke. I pushed a glass of water toward her, and she hurriedly took a gulp. You. Run. Beach. It didn't last very long. I bet. Still, I wish somebody had had a camera. She said in awe, as if I'd told her I'd spotted a Tasmanian tiger loping along with Declan. I grinned at her and suddenly felt the empty space at the table that was Roger. Even when he wasn't here, he was still between us. No matter what happens, or as long as it takes, let's not let it affect us, Fran. She frowned. You're scaring me with a sentence like that. I sighed. Maybe I'm being melodramatic, but I don't want us to fight. Fran twisted her napkin into a little stress ball and smoothed it back out to begin all over again. We won't, but sooner or later, if things aren't resolved, we probably will. On that ominous note, our food arrived. For the rest of our lunch hour together, the subject of Roger was studiously avoided. However, it was the first thing Declan brought up when he called me later that night. No, I haven't spoken to Roger, but I did speak to Fran. I guess that's something, at least. She doesn't want us to fight, but she thinks that the longer things go like this between Roger and I, the more our friendship will eventually get pulled into it as well. She's right, Declan said, refusing to sugarcoat it. I sighed. I know, but I'm just so pissed off at him at the moment that I can't even look at him. I'm scared I'll just punch him out. Declan laughed. You? Hey, I protested. I can be pretty scrappy when I want to be. I just hope you punch better than you jog. Yeah, well, the next time you see me, just try me. Now you're getting kinky on me, he teased. Would you like me to be? I'm surprisingly good at tying knots. It was the only way I got any peace when Tim was about eight. I would be too scared you would have a perverse fit and leave me for hours while you go catch a movie. Sounds like you're heading into fantasy territory, not me. He ignored that. Seriously, Simon, call him. Back to that subject. In a couple of days, give me time to cool down. Desperate to change the subject, I went for the mundane to replace it. So what did you do today? He sounded a bit hesitant. I, uh, had physio, a team meeting, and then I went to get measured for a suit. Oh? Yeah, for the Brownlow. 
Oh. Realizing I was quickly heading into a territory of jealous, which I didn't want to stray, I tried to sound light as I asked, What color? What color? Yeah, the suit, what color? Normal, traditional black. You know, you could try something different. He laughed. Trying something different gets you noticed more. That's what I try to avoid, remember? I remembered the premiere night of the Triple F last year, when I had worn an emerald green suit, purchased from an op shop on Sydney Road. There was a reason why Jess was going to the Brownlow instead of me. Damn, I let the silence go on for too long. Hey, Simon? Yeah? We didn't really talk about it before I left, about the Brownlow. What else is there to know? I thought we covered it all. I just wanted to say, the whole damn thing has been crushing me. For the past couple of weeks I've been discussing plans with Jess, and I wanted to tell you. But to tell you the truth, I was scared to. Why? Because it wasn't the way it should be. His voice pained me. It was low and passionate and heartfelt. And I hated that we could only be so open with each other when we were so far apart physically. I know, Deck. I should be making these plans with you, trying to talk you out of whatever crazy thing you would be trying to wear. What do you think I would try to wear? I asked, interested in spite of myself. Probably something bright purple, or one of those old-fashioned coats that make you look like a vampire from one of those Anne Rice books before she found religion. Hmm, purple. Or a Victorian coat. A man knew me, it seemed. I wouldn't do that to you at the Brownlow, I teased him. Maybe at the premiere night of the Triple F. He laughed. That's probably normal dress at that event. Sadly, he was correct. I knew you would say you would understand, he continued. But I know it still hurts. It does, a little bit, I admitted. But like you say, I understand. I guess I thought if I didn't talk about it, then I wouldn't have to confront it with you. Yeah, that always works. Anyway, I'm sorry about it. Don't be. Just talk to me from now on, I told him. I promise. And, hey, thanks for setting up that segue. How about you do the same with Roger? He asked, not at all subtly. Good night, Deck. Night, babe. Damn, he did the babe thing again, beating me to the punch. It would have sounded daft if I had repeated it back to him, so I just had to let it be. For now. The next few days were filled with continual pleas from Fran and Declan to give in and speak to Roger. I, of course, let those pleas fall on selectively deaf ears. Until Roger turned up at the office. It was close to five. Nysa had already left because of a dental appointment. I had locked up and was coming out of the lift when I ran right into the friend I was currently kind of feuding with. Hi, Roger said, kind of dopily. Yeah, hi, I replied, just as dopily. I, uh, came in to pick up Fran, but I thought I'd try to catch you as well. That irked me. How nice to be your afterthought. I started walking through the lobby doors and out into the street beyond. Hey, Roger protested, not that far behind me. In case you've forgotten, I have been trying to talk to you. And in case you've forgotten, I've been ignoring you. And how long is that going to go on for? I don't know, as long as I feel like it. We had reached the intersection of Swanston and Collins, where I normally caught my tram. The streets were already packed with people rushing to get home. Where are you going? Roger asked as I stopped to wait for the pedestrian light to cross over the tram tracks. Home? I said I would give you a lift, and I'd rather catch the tram. To tell you the truth, I was feeling a little perverse pleasure in tormenting him. It was payback for how I felt on Saturday night, dishing it back to him. 
He looked genuinely hurt that I was refusing after days and many overtures to try and deal with the problem. Fucking Declan Tyler, he fumed. We'd never used a fight like this until he came along. He isn't the problem, I said pointedly. Oh, and I am? That's what I was implying. The pedestrian crossing started beeping, and we all swarmed over towards the island in the center of the traffic. There was no sign of my tram yet, but I hoped it wouldn't be too long. You can hate me right now, Roger said, but there's a part of you that knows I'm telling the truth, and you don't want me bringing it up because it means you'll have to think about it some more, and that will destroy this little Disney fantasy you've currently got in your head. Fuck him. I knew it wasn't a fantasy life. I was the one goddamn living it. All I could do was stare at him coldly. Got nothing to say? He asked. Thankfully, I could see my tram at the next stop, slowly making its way toward ours. Thanks for your support, I said. Not the best comeback ever, but there was enough venom in my tone to press the point. He leaned in to me so he wouldn't be overheard by the other waiting passengers. Good luck watching your boyfriend preen with his beard on TV next week. Wow, that was remarkably bitchy for a straight man. I didn't say anything, and Roger stood there staring sadly at me for a moment before walking away. I can't say I thought there was an air of finality about this confrontation. But as I got onto the tram and watched him through the window as he made his way to Fran's building, I certainly felt like things would never be the same between us again. But I'm melodramatic that way. Later that night, when Declan rang, I let it go to the answering machine. Despite him telling me that we should talk, I didn't think I could share how empty I felt right then. In the morning, when he called again, I would fob him off and say that I was tired after work and slept like the dead and be evasive about answering questions about Roger. I was a hypocrite, and all I wanted to do was rip Van Winkle my way out of this whole mess, which I had just made worse. Chapter 16 and suddenly, September was upon us. Only the most important month in the AFL calendar. The Brownlow ceremony takes place the same week as the grand final, and the two teams competing in the final usually don't attend because the coaches want them concentrating on the game at hand rather than falling prey to one of the biggest booze-ups of the year. This meant that Declan was freed up, as the Devils were near the bottom of the ladder, they were effectively out of the semifinals, and he could spend more time in Melbourne preparing for the ceremony and finalizing the details of the surgery he would have just before Christmas. Having him around was more of a solve for me, since Roger and I hadn't spoken since our confrontation on Swanston Street. Declan was disappointed that our estrangement was being taken this far, but he knew he couldn't budge me to do anything about the issue. Likewise. Fran was experiencing much the same thing on her end with Roger. And as she had foreseen in our lunch together just after that disastrous Saturday night, it was beginning to affect our relationship. Although we pretended otherwise, we just happened to become more and more busy at our respective workplaces, and our lunches became less frequent. You know, you don't look so good, Declan said one day. What? I asked, distracted by a packet of coffee beans that refused to open. You look all pinched, as if you just sucked a lemon. Gee, thanks. You've got to go and see your friends. And you have got to sit there, shut up, and look pretty. Don't be an arsehole. He threw the newspaper at me, and it went way off its mark, crashing uselessly to the floor. You better not go back on the field with a throw that wide. I noticed his weapon of choice was the real estate section, with glaring red circles marked around listings of apartments with prices that were more than five times that of my own home. 
Good way to try and change the subject, Declan grumped. I finally managed to get some beans into the grinder and hit the button to pulverize them into oblivion. What was that? Sorry, can't hear you over this. He resorted to giving me the finger. Really mature, I scoffed as he scrambled out of his chair to grab the newspaper again. He gave me a look which more than let me know who he thought the mature one out of the two of us was. Work was becoming really busy, so I wasn't exactly lying to Fran when I used it as an excuse to fob her off yet again. It was only a month until the Triple F began. Nysa and I were scrambling with last-minute details to grab sponsors, finalize dates and screenings, and deal with the change of one of the venues. Somehow, I didn't mind it as much, because I knew that most nights I was coming home to Declan. I was becoming domesticated. Normally, that might have made me balk at the thought, but scarily enough, it just gave me a Cheshire Cat grin. The Brownlow threatened to deflate my mood, but I tried not to give in to it. Only a few nights before the actual ceremony, Declan came over and told me something I wasn't expecting to hear. Just thinks the two of you should meet. I sank onto the couch. I think I would have been less shocked if he said the Pope was coming for dinner. What? Why? He shrugged laconically. Maybe she wants to prove her gay status to you so you don't feel like she's trying to steal your man. She didn't say that, I spluttered. Not in so many words, but it was what she implied. Although she did chuck a fit when I told her you thought she wanted to harvest my swimmers. I whacked him on the shoulder. He couldn't keep it up for much longer and burst out laughing. He clutched his shoulder, wincing slightly. You have a mean right hook when you want to. Yeah, ask Tim sometime. Why did I keep saying these things? It wasn't deliberate, but it hung in the air like a dying firework between us. So you'll meet her. Why does she want to meet up? Because she's my friend, and she just wants to clear the air between the two of you. There's no air to clear. Well, it will make her feel better. I opened my mouth to say something then thought better of it and quickly shut it. Declan, of course, didn't miss it. What? Nothing. Bull, what were you about to say? Just... I sighed. Did she meet with your other partner when she went to the Brownlow with you before? No, Declan admitted. But then she didn't have to. Why? Declan colored slightly because he was already going to be at the ceremony. I'm pretty sure my mouth dropped open. He was a footy player? Yes. What, do you think I'm the only queer in all the AFL? Statistically, of course he wouldn't be. But it was also hard to imagine that there could be more, to reconcile against the stereotype we had all been conditioned to believe. And certainly the presence of gay players wasn't exactly advertised, much less acknowledged. Don't ask me who it is, Declan said. He's extremely closeted, and he would hate other people to know. Is that why you broke up? Declan nodded and looked away. Is he also the one who cheated on you? He sighed. Yes. Righteous indignation on his behalf burned through me. That's not very closeted of him, is it? Well, it's easy to fuck around on the sly, Declan said bitterly. It's much harder to try and have a relationship. Why did you stick around? I don't really like thinking about it. You can talk to me. You should talk to me. I don't like thinking about it because it reminds me of what I put up with at the time. Declan said, finally looking at me, and I didn't like seeing the pain reflected in his eyes. It doesn't make me think very highly of myself. He paused and dropped my hand. Or what you might think of me. Hey, I said, grabbing his hand back, and with my free hand rubbing the back of his neck. I think very highly of you. Yeah? Yeah. 
We all do stuff we're not proud of when we're with other people. I think at the time I didn't know I could have anything better. Boy, had I been there. You think I haven't done that as well? Everybody does. That's what human beings do in the fucked up name of love. I thought I loved him. Looking back, I know it wasn't. I burrowed in closer to him. He didn't deserve your love. That moment would have been the perfect time for either of us to say those words to each other. I could tell he was thinking it as well, but the moment passed, and a new, nagging thought came into my mind. Deck, can I ask you something? Of course. It may make me sound like a dickhead. His gentle snort made me laugh. That's never stopped you before. Yeah, I admitted but I don't like looking like a dickhead in front of you. Really? Then you should stop being one. Fuck off and stop bringing up Fran and Roger. I didn't even mention them. I know what you were getting at. He pulled me down so my head rested in his lap, now a therapist couch. Come on, tell me what's troubling you. Where to start? Besides the fact he had reminded me, although I didn't need reminding, of the Fran and Roger-shaped hole in my existence. Why me? I thought we'd already covered that, Declan asked, confused. No, not in relation to Jess. What, then? What do you see in me? He sighed. This is an old argument, and I hate repeating it. Well, you keep spilling little secrets every now and again, and they throw me for a loop. When I think about the guys you've had and what you can have, I have to wonder, what is it about me? Declan groaned and shook his fist in the air before taking a deep breath. You seemed interesting. Different to everybody else I knew. Plus, you had a mouth on you. You weren't shy about saying what was on your mind. You mean I was a mouthy bastard? Not exactly the basis for mutual attraction I'd hoped to hear. Yeah, but I like that about you. I told you before, I'm not used to getting that kind of honesty from people most of the time, especially strangers. Usually it's only my family, Abe and Lisa. I guess I can kind of understand that. Declan grinned and stroked the side of my cheek. Plus, you're hot. My face grew warm. I was embarrassed, because I really couldn't believe that. He pulled me up so that we were face to face. His breath was warm against my neck as he sucked lightly on it. You look even hotter when you're mortified. I made some strangled noise of disbelief, and he pulled away to look me straight in the eye. Hey, I find you irresistible and sexy, so shut up and believe it. I didn't want to play the self-esteem card again, so I let it slide. His hand rested upon my hips, and his right thumb coaxed its way under my shirt to stroke the skin beneath. And the more I got to know you, the more I liked. So if you're making me do this, you have to tell me, what is it about me? Uh, where to start? I leaned my forehead against his. You were totally different than what I expected. And that was good. You defied my own prejudices. He laughed. You sound like such a wanker. I am a wanker, remember? I paused. Plus, you are hot. Dickhead. I think you must have really nice parents, I said, out of the blue. It was a surprising statement, even to me, and I was the one who said it. He gave me a strange look. What makes you say that? I shrugged. Because you're such a good guy. Face it, Deck. You're in a sport where if you're good, you get treated like a god. And there are a lot of guys that let it get to them, and they believe it. Your parents must keep you really grounded. Thanks, he said. I guess they do. Wow, another awkward silence. Because I suddenly realized that I would really like to meet his parents 
and see who had brought Declan into the world and made him the person that he was. And I think he would have liked them to meet me. But it wasn't possible, blah, blah, blah. So, I said, desperate to break the silence. Jess, huh? When? When turned out to be the actual night of the Brownlow. Do you want to know what one definition of bizarre might be? Driving to your closeted boyfriend's pretend girlfriend's house to watch them prepare for a faux date. This was a time when I really needed my friends to help me. I tried calling Franz Mobile, but it was switched off. They were probably at a movie. Or maybe they had found a new best friend already. Nothing would surprise me anymore. I wanted to speak to Roger so badly. But seeing as this whole Brownlow controversy was the reason why we weren't talking anymore to begin with, I didn't expect to find a sympathetic ear in him. That only left Nysa. And she didn't even know for certain I was dating somebody, so there would be too many landmines to navigate before she would be able to focus on the problem at hand. So that found me on a stranger's doorstep, still wondering whether I should just turn around, go home, and hide under the bed. Unfortunately, the decision was made for me. Somebody must have heard my car in the driveway and was opening the door as I stood there equivocating. The woman who answered the door was my age, relatively short, with blonde bobbed hair that suggested she should be posing against Art Deco furniture and doing the Charleston with a long cigarette holder dangling from her artfully drawn lips. Simon? That's the name on my birth certificate, I said perkily. She opened the door to allow me in. I think you need a drink. That would be great and it was perhaps the finest introduction I had ever been part of in my life. She ushered me into the lounge. Oh, I'm Jess, by the way. I took her hand. I kind of figured. No need to say I had googled her the day before, and had felt my gut drop at the pictures of her with Declan over the years. They made a lovely couple. And a few pictures had captured them looking at each other, with a familiarity which probably argued a long-term relationship to those not in the know. Dex still getting ready. Oh, shit, compliment time. You look great, by the way. And she did. She was practically sewn into a dark green dress that accentuated all her curves. She looked sexy, but not slutty. That probably couldn't be said for some of the girls attending tonight. Thanks, Jess said, sounding pleased. I find it fun, kind of like playing dress-up, but only for one night. I'm much more comfortable in a hippie skirt or jeans. Damn it, she was nice. So the irrational part of me couldn't blame her for what we were being subjected to, even though I really, really wanted to. I have to admit, I would hate getting all tucked up. I know she replied with a twinkle in her eye. I've seen the photos of the way you dress when I googled your arse. Why would you google me? She pulled a vodka bottle out of the freezer to see who it was that Declan couldn't shut up about. I froze in place, not knowing how to reply. Jess giggled mischievously as she started preparing glasses with the garnish. Why don't you go check up on him while I finish these, third door down the hall? I fled before I could get any more embarrassed. As I opened the door to the spare room, I found Declan struggling with a bow tie. He smiled when he caught sight of me in the mirror. I thought I heard you. What do you think of Jess? I like her, I admitted. He laughed. Did it hurt to say that? Shut up. You need help? He immediately surrendered. Yes, I hate these damn things. How do you know how to do them? Just one of my many unexpected talents. I moved over to him and started expertly folding the material until I had one perfect bow tie against his neck. Just as I straightened it, he kissed me and I willingly let myself be caught up in it. 
I had one fleeting thought of how cruel it was to see him looking so good when he would be going on someone else's arm, but I let it be washed away. It should be you, Declan whispered, reading my mind. I don't think I could outrun a whole auditorium of footy players if I went as your date, I said. You'd have to leave me behind in order to save yourself. He shook his head. You are so noble. You're lucky I am, because you look so fucking good tonight that I want to tackle you and tear you right out of that tux. He groaned, Don't start. I don't need another reason not to go. I bet you dominate the first few rounds of voting. That'll be all I'll dominate, he grumbled. Then you concentrate on the free drinks, I replied, remembering that his latest spate of injuries had happened in the fourth round. It was going to be a long night for him. Good idea. Look for the silver lining, Deck said, giving me a tired smile. Let's get back out to Jess. I nodded and followed him back to the lounge. Jess had poured the drinks and handed them to us. We toasted together to the eventual winner of the night and drank hurriedly. The chauffeur just rang, Jess said easily, the word rolling out of her like she was used to dealing with one every day. He'll be here in about twenty minutes. Time for another round, I say. I agreed, perhaps a bit too quickly. I caught Declan looking at me and said, Don't worry, officer, it will be my last until I get home. Jess grinned. Good to see one footy player takes the drink responsibly sponsorship of the game seriously. Hey, Declan warned, an empty threat. So what are you doing tonight, Simon? Jess asked as she started pouring various spirits into the shaker. Well, I'll check you guys out on the blue carpet special, and then I should probably do some paperwork I neglected over the weekend. I have a full ticket to the Triple F, you know, she said. You do? I asked, surprised. Yeah, I had one last year as well. I was impressed. A regular? I feel bad I didn't recognize you. We have so few. She laughed and began shaking the mix. I didn't go to any of the premieres, just the regular screenings, with my partner, Robin. This, of course, piqued my interest. So Robin didn't want to see you all glammed up tonight? Declan gave a warning cough, and Jess threw a tea towel at him. Sorry, I said. I shouldn't have asked. Don't listen to him, Jess said, pouring the drinks. Robin's gone out drinking with her friends. She always gets upset this time of year because she has this irrational fear Declan and I will get really drunk, accidental penetration will occur, and his magical penis will instantly cure me of my lesbian ways. Even I wasn't that paranoid, was I? Wow, are you sure she's a lesbian if she thinks you can be cured by Dick? Declan gave another warning cough. Dick, stop doing that. Jess cried, handing me one of the glasses and giving Deck one with a complimentary side-order look of shut the fuck up. Robin obviously just isn't as capable of coping as Simon is. I think he just hides it better, Declan said. He is in the room, I reminded him. You just hide it better, Simon? Jess asked, sipping gingerly at her drink. Emboldened by the alcohol, I nodded. Probably. So, are you jealous? Jealous isn't the right word. It's not that strong a feeling. What is the feeling, then? Declan asked. I felt like I was on the witness stand. Bittersweet disappointment. Jess clinked my glass with her own. Can't tell you're an arts grad. We laughed, and it seemed to settle the mild tension in the air. By the way, Jess said confidentially, leaning into me a little, I don't see Deck as a potential sperm donor, despite his obvious genetic pedigree. It was now my turn to look at Deck. He refused to meet my eyes, looking instead into his glass. Don't kill him, Jess giggled. He's too much like a brother to me. 
You are dead, I warned him. He would be the perfect sample, though, Jess mused. I mean, he's good-looking, athletic, smart, and has all those nice-guy characteristics. If he was a woman, well, I don't know, Simon, maybe you would have competition from me. If he was a woman, you could have him, I said. Declan was coloring visibly over his drink, but was mercifully saved by the honking of a car horn from outside. Jess ran to the window and peered out. Shit, that's the car. He's early. We all downed our drinks and congregated by the door. Are you all right to drive home? Declan asked me. I nodded. Scout's honor. He frowned, looked me over, and obviously decided I passed muster. Okay, drive safe. He leaned in and kissed me. Aw, Jess said mockingly. That's so cute. Shut up. Declan winced as he pulled away from me. Don't worry, I'll take care of him, Jess declared as she opened the door and threw her keys into her bag. I followed them out, shutting the door behind me. As I turned back to say goodbye, they were already walking down the porch steps, arm in arm, like the king and queen of the school ball heading into their limo. Picture fucking perfect. As the chauffeur opened the back door of the car for them, Jess turned back and waved. I gave a half-hearted one back. Declan then turned and gave a subtle two-fingered salute. I nodded and watched the chauffeur jump back into the front and the car glide away. I sat on the steps for a few minutes before the cold drove me back into my car and I headed home. With Maggie on my lap and a beer in my hands, I tortured myself by watching the blue carpet special before the ceremony itself. I knew that I didn't have anything to worry about with Jess, now I'd met her. But I could still haunt myself with what-ifs as I watched my boyfriend take a date other than myself out for the night. And I'd get to watch it all on high-definition television with running commentary from the vacuous himbo and bimbo combination they hired every year to do the pre-show fashion spiel. I let the parade of the who's who of footballers and their girlfriends and wives unfold before me. I couldn't help but grin with a sense of affection as Abe and Lisa appeared on camera. Abe looked suave and confident in his black priest-collar tux while Lisa matched him in a gown that wouldn't have looked out of place at a Hollywood premiere in the 1940s. They stood out among the previous interviewees, who had made some stunningly bad choices, including someone from the Dockers, who had obviously been trying to bring the parachute pant back into vogue. Roger popped into my head again as I remembered the very first time we had gone down to the Crown Complex to be part of the crowd watching the entrance to the ceremony. We were only sixteen, and had snuck into the city by telling our parents that we were staying over at each other's houses. Surprisingly enough, despite being surrounded by about six cameras stationed to catch all the action on the carpet, we never once wound up as part of the broadcast. Our parents, watching at home, were totally oblivious to our being there. I wanted to pick up the phone and call him, as I'd been wanting to every day for the past fortnight like I had only scant hours before, but this still wasn't the right time. And suddenly there he was, Declan Tyler on screen, with the perfect girlfriend Jess. Are you disappointed coming here knowing there was no way you would be in the running for the medal? The himbo was asking, rather insensitively as I turned up the volume. Declan took a second to compose himself by licking his lips slightly a move I now recognize instantly as being one of either nervousness or restraint from saying what he really felt. No, not at all. It's a night to come here with all the guys, putting aside rivalries, and celebrating the mateship in the sport instead. Wow, what a perfect soundbite. Who do you think will be in the running next year? Himbo asked. Who knows? Declan replied as the camera swayed over his right side to take in Jess. She stood there, arm in arm with him, 
looking every inch the supportive girlfriend. I hope to be playing enough to be in contention, that's for sure. And what do you think, Jess? Bimbo asked. Do you think you'll be able to do it? Of course, Jess said smoothly. I have every faith in him. Next year we'll see Deck on the field, and with his usual form. Man, they could have even fooled me, and I was the one who had Declan in my bed every time he was in town. And what are you wearing tonight, Jess? Bimbo asked. Jess flared out her gown slightly, so that it shimmered on camera. A local designer, Heather Marlson. And you, Declan? Himbo asked, in a tone that suggested Declan, like any real man, would probably have no idea. Which, of course, Jess helped perpetuate by stepping in. He would probably tell you it's just a tux, but it is by the same designer. Declan gave a self-depreciating shrug of the shoulders, and all four on the carpet laughed as if they were at the end of a Scooby-Doo episode. Maggie suddenly gave a little sneer from my lap and I rubbed her ear proudly. Good girl. I sat through the whole three-hour ceremony with more gusto than past years, mainly because I perked up every time Declan appeared on screen. He dominated the voting in the first three rounds, with most of the votes for each. Of course, everybody knew that wouldn't last. The fourth round was when he got injured and after that his name didn't show up on the scoreboard again. Abe made quite a good showing, being the highest-ranked devil player, but he wasn't in serious contention for the medal either. If you've never seen a Brownlow ceremony, it can be like watching paint dry, even if you're the most passionate football fan in existence. Players are awarded points per game and per round by the umpires, based upon their decision of who has been the best and fairest of the game. Take into account that there are eight games per round, with 16 teams and 22 rounds per season. That's a lot of counting you have to sit through. It's kind of like listening to a really long bingo game. But I watched until the credits rolled and got to see Declan one last time as he helped Jess out of her seat and they walked over to Abe and Lisa. I felt one last little stab of jealousy. Hey, they're meant to be my friends now as well. I shook it off. That's that, then, I said to Maggie. She opened her eyes and looked up at me languidly, probably thinking for the millionth time that her human was completely stupid. Time for bed. She followed me into the bedroom, knowing she would be able to sucker me into giving her one of the kitty treats kept on the bedside table. Of course, I acquiesced and could hear her crunching in the dark as I drifted off to sleep. I was woken abruptly by somebody climbing into bed with me. Groggily, I flailed out on the verge of panic until I heard a familiar voice say my name. It was Declan. Fuck, you scared me. I leaned over and switched on the banker's lamp. He was sitting on what had become his side of my bed still struggling to pull off the white shirt that had come with his tux. I had no idea how he'd managed to get his pants off without me hearing him. Sorry, he slurred. I had given him a key ages ago, but he had never had cause to use it like this, at this hour of the morning. I wasn't used to someone letting themselves into my house when I was asleep. My heart was still pounding furiously. I could hear its thud in my ears. Let me help you with that, I said, and I managed to deftly pull off the shirt and the singlet beneath it in one move. You're good at that, he said rakishly. Wow, you really got into the free booze, huh? I asked, amused, as I had never really seen him this plastered before. It was there, he said, his eyes at half-mast, and I was thirsty. He fell back into bed with a heavy sigh and tried to cover himself with a duna. It twisted around his legs, and I had to get them sorted. I thought you were going to crash at Jess's tonight. Turn off the light, he moaned. It's too bright. 
I did so, and as I settled back upon my pillow, he rolled over to use me as one. His breath reeked, and I knew he would feel the pains of a major hangover in the morning. How did you get here? I asked. Robin drove me, he murmured. Only too glad to be rid of me. She hates me. Who could hate you? I teased. I felt Maggie jump up on the bed and snuggle between our feet. Robin, because of my magical lesbian curing dick. I laughed so hard his head almost rolled off my chest. I don't think it's done too good a job of curing Jess so far. Only because we haven't done it. All I could do was laugh again. You've got tickets on yourself. It cured you, didn't it? Well, I'm not a lesbian, so I guess it must have. There you go, he said, sounding very satisfied with himself. I wish I could be recording this, I told him. You would be so embarrassed in the morning if you heard it. As long as I'm here in the morning, he yawned. This was where I wanted to be all night. So that's why I came here. There was a deliciously gooey feeling in my belly, damn it. I'm flattered. I love you, he whispered. I was stunned, unable to breathe or think. Did you hear me? He asked, suddenly sounding not quite so drunk. I couldn't say anything. All I could think was that this wasn't the time, as I had told Fran what seemed like years ago now. First declarations of love should not be spoken lightly, and definitely not while drunk. I wondered how I could say all that without hurting his feelings when I realized he'd fallen asleep. I lay there for ages, his breath warm against my chest, thinking that I had fucked up again. Chapter 17 It was impossible to rouse Declan in the morning. He moaned incoherently as I brought in a glass of water and some painkillers and told him I was leaving for work. He pulled the pillow over his head, and I could only laugh and leave them beside him. But I still felt guilty as I remembered his last words to me before falling asleep. I tried to think about something else, anything else, on the tram ride to work. But it was continually nagging at me, in the back of my mind. I had no idea how it was going to come up, and how Declan was going to react to my lack of response once his hangover wore off. He and Jess had made the newspapers, of course. Their shining, smiling mugs leered at me from the paper of the guy sitting across from me. It was nice to see, however, that Lisa was voted one of the best dressed of the night. The morning passed pretty uneventfully as I waited for Declan to call, but my direct line never rang. However, Nysa passed through a call that made me sweat with dread. Simon, Jasper Brunswick on line one. I almost fell off my chair. Nice to take a message. He says it's urgent. Jasper Brunswick. Urgent. Oh, this couldn't be good. Isn't that the same jerk who used to work here before I did? Nysa asked, her voice extraordinarily loud through the speaker. One and the same, I said through gritted teeth. He's not trying to get a job here again, is he? He'd think it was beneath him now, I told her. Good, Nysa said, satisfied her job wasn't in danger. So shall I put him through? I groaned. Fine. There was a slight squawk through the speaker as Nysa changed lines. Putting you through now. Her usually charming tone to clients and sponsors was not to be heard. She obviously still saw Jasper as a potential threat. I picked up the handset. Simon Murray. Simon Jasper Brunswick. So Nysa told me, what can I do for you? I asked, trying to affect a casual tone, although I was intrigued despite myself. 
Well, Simon, it's more what I can do for you. His voice was somehow even oilier over the phone than it had been in person. Is this about a piece on the festival again? Because I'm pretty sure your editor has already lined up an interview. No, Simon. In fact, this is a much more personal matter. My skin crawled. He surely wasn't bringing that up again, was he? I should have given Nysa a time frame in which to come in and save me. Oh? Yes. As I'm sure you're aware, my column... I was pretty sure that I told him I never read his column, and that was the truth. But of course, Jasper was never one to allow the truth to get in the way of his own agenda. Uh Uh-huh. No need to sound snobby, Simon. I told you, I'm calling as a friend. I winced. Actually, you never said that, and really, we're not friends. He sighed. Fine. As an ex-colleague, then. I'm more comfortable with that. I'd be nicer to me if I were you. Stop dicking around and just tell me what you want. He hesitated. Jasper. My column likes to tell secrets. Yeah, I thought that was the point of a gossip column. It's much more than a gossip column, Simon. What? Was he trying to say that it was actually biting social commentary? I let it slide. Okay, but what's that got to do with this call? I could hear his pause for obvious dramatic effect. One thing I've never stooped to doing is to out people. That's their own decision to make. And I've had quite a few people tell me recently that you're off the scene. A small rivulet of sweat suddenly ran down my neck and through my shoulder blades. I was never on the scene, I pointed out as calmly as I could. So you say, but these people say that the guy you're seeing, well, He's definitely not in any way out, and it could be quite detrimental for him to be so. Feeling like a character in a noir movie, and just as desperate, I asked hoarsely, Is that a threat? So you're not denying it? Fuck. If I were in a noir movie, I would have been dead before the second act. I was so green at this. You haven't given me a name to deny. Good, regain some ground there. I don't think I have to. I can hear it in your voice. Jasper sounded smug. I have to say, you're a dark horse, Simon. I didn't think you would be able to pull someone like that. As usual, the gossip you're talking about is unsubstantiated and full of crap, I said. Not the finest comeback imaginable. Don't get so defensive. I told you, I don't out anybody. Then why are you calling? To let you know that no secret ever remains that way. You're not as careful as you think you are. He paused so he could get me with his next comment. And to get confirmation. Just to let you know, if it does come out, you're fair game to me. I'll publish everything I can get on you and your footballer. Thanks for the call, I said snidely. Just trying to be a friend, Jasper said, sounding hurt. And damned if I couldn't tell if he was being honest or not anymore. Thanks, friend. I hung up the phone. Now I was off the call and could let the facade drop. I actually shivered. My body felt overheated and my shirt was sticking to my back. I wanted to call Deck, but paranoia had settled in, and I was entertaining the idea that Jasper had tapped my phone to confirm who my next call would be to. This could not be happening, and it was my fault because I knew Jasper Brunswick. He could find entry into our lives because of me. I was suddenly scared of what Deck might think. Nysa stuck her head inside the door. Did he want his old job back? I looked up at her. Nice, I'm not feeling well. Will you be okay if I go home? Nysa looked at me with concern. You're sweating. It must be a fever. 
I lied. I can handle things, she said. You're my trooper, nice. I felt her eyes upon me as I grabbed my bag and coat and hurried out the door. Declan looked almost as sick as I felt, but his panic had the unfortunate effects of a hangover mixed with it. Well, I asked him, anxious to get an answer. What I really wanted him to tell me was, yes, I was paranoid and everything was going to be fine. I don't know, he said finally. What? What? 